Are you ready to rock, Gene? I have burned out the day, and I'm ready to burn out the night. Let's do this. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to another Friday edition of Heavy Metallurgy, number 83 to be exact. And this has been one that's been in the works for a long time. We've got the um, Supreme panel for this discussion because I think Alan and... I can admit, I'm pretty sure Alan can as well. We are students of Blue Oyster Cult. Um, the two guys coming up, I know one of them in particular, Mr. Zoller, is a, a lifelong fan, loves this band. Aaron likes them a lot as well. So we're in good hands tonight. But um, before we jump into that, we've got a little bookkeeping to do. Um, got a contest announcement with um, Mr. Let's Talk Metal. But first of all, let's talk about some shirts that are up and available for order if you ordered a shirt a week or two ago they all went out today uh sorry i'm not super johnny on the spot printing them every single day and getting packages out but they went all went out today clean cue um are you wearing one alan i mean gene can you show us uh there it is the necromantical streams artwork done by justin bowling fr bowling from uh vestamon's blood box youtube channel check it out we're going to get him on the show here very soon link is in the description for the shirt and our last one in streaming there is no law please don't go any lower we don't we haven't released the uh the thong yet so we'll we'll have uh alan uh, model that when it's available this is a family friendly uh, stream so yeah we're keeping it above the belt literally yeah, absolutely and um if you want to support the channel further, there's shirts, of course, and then uh, Super Chats are up and running if anybody feels so inclined. Not necessary, but it all goes to good things. Brand new computer system here. The Metallurgy mothership up north, the mother, the, the northern mothership is uh, stepping up its game a little bit, and we're going to get Alan on the same page as well, hopefully, here in the coming months. But, um, yeah, that's it for that. Um, Alan, what have you got going on over at your channel? Uh, yes, uh, for last week's episode, I did a little holiday giveaway where I told folks that if they left a comment on the video by 8 o'clock tonight, they'd be entered to get some VCLT material from me and that I'd announce the winners here tonight. So Marty, going to need just a little help from you with this. Okay. We had 40-some uh, people, almost four dozen people enter, which is kind of cool. And to select winners, I've got all the names listed on a sheet of paper here. I need you to choose two random numbers between number one and number 40. Okay. Just pick two numbers. Uh, 12. 12. 36. And 36. All right. Let's see. Who have we got here? Number 12 is Seagull Poet. Uh, he posts uh, comments a lot of times. So Seagull Poet, congratulations. You're going to get one VCLT package. And number 36 is... Rick uh, Contreras from the Dreadful Winners. <laughs> uh, that's so, Rick. <laughs> Rick is very lucky. Rick wins more of these contests than you can uh, keep track of. But uh, Rick and Siegel, I will leave a uh, message for you all, a reply and a comment so that you know how to contact me. You'll be able to send me your mailing address discreetly. And then sometime early next week, I'll send each of you an envelope packed with some CDs, some stickers, some flyers, just some fun VCLT kind of stuff that you can enjoy to help stuff your stockings with. Thanks to everybody who left a comment and participated. It was a fun little thing. Uh, it was really interesting reading everybody's comments from it, for sure. Right on. And uh, one more piece of homework, or homework, uh, house cleaning, before we introduce our guests. Um, there is now a official, well, there's a Heavy Metal Urgy channel Instagram. Please go find it on the Instagram and like it. And there's also an email address in case somebody would like to contact us. And that is heavy metal urgy channel at gmail.com. One word. Um, not super tough. Oh, one last thing. He just popped up. Uh, Jeff over at metal madness 66 has had a very busy couple weeks. He just interviewed uh, Craig Lo Cicero from forbidden. And um, today, as a matter of fact, a very um, deep revealing uh, awesome interview with Don Anderson from Agaloc. They went on for a number of hours and covered a lot of great uh, topics. Super awesome. Please go over to the Metal Channel, uh, Metal Madness 66 channel and watch his content. He's been uh, killing it lately with some very, very, very cool interviews and, of course, deep dives. But um, Yes, he's got a uh, deep dive on The Cure coming up pretty soon, too. I've seen advertised already, so that should be really cool as well. Yes. 
Yep. And uh, while we're shouting out a few folks, yep. uh, one longtime commenter who's started doing a few videos more often, I wanted to oh. shout out uh, Black Leather Eyes. Uh, he's had some like playlist type videos posted in the past, but over the past few weeks, he started actually appearing on camera and showing some records. Seems like a very nice guy, has a very cool collection of stuff. He's commented on lots of videos and streams in the past. So uh, it's really cool to see him get in front of the camera and post videos more frequently. A lot of neat stuff. So if folks are looking for another channel to check out this holiday season, maybe you've got some time off. Maybe you need a reason to escape from relatives and go hide in the back room and watch something different. Uh, go check out the Black Leather Eyes channel. Uh, seems like it'll be a very interesting one that I think fans of uh, our content would probably appreciate the videos he's been putting up as well. Another one too, uh, a longtime commenter and watcher of the show, um, Depeche Commode. Uh, his mm -hmm. name is Chris. He just started a channel as well. He's doing a lot of live streams. It's going to be interesting to see what he does in the future as well. But anyway. Yes, he used to post under the name Yacht. Yacht Rock Guy. Yep. Yacht Rock Guy. So yeah, if folks are wondering where Yacht Rock Guy went, uh, just changed his uh, screen name was all. Right on. We're going to have a very right. long evening tonight. So we might as well just we uh, cut the mustard here and get into introducing. Are you good? How, how are you feeling, Mark? Are you feeling good about this? How do you, how do you feel? <laughs> How are you tonight? I'm doing quite well. Thank you, Alan. How are you tonight? I got to be honest, Marty. I don't feel so good. You have an itchy beard? No, no. I've got a fever. <laughs> okay. You have a fever? And the only prescription. Yeah. Is more cowbell. More cowbell. Yes, yes, absolutely. Let's and I got to I gotta say, after a week long of uh, Blue Oyster Cult, I may never listen to them again. But uh, without having said that, let's uh, introduce first up. Returning to the show once again is our friend Aaron, the Metal Theologian. Hello. Welcome back, sir. Hey, it's an honor to be here, man. Thanks for having me back. Oh, the honor is uh, we love having you, man. It's awesome. The honor and, is yours. You're here with Eric Bloom in person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and second time on the stream, very psyched to have him back, my dear friend, S. Craig Zoller. Welcome back, sir. Always, always a pleasure to stare into your loving eyes. <laughs> Uh, thank it's you so much. Oddly really romantic. Good. You know, obviously, uh, I'm I'm real excited to talk about Blue Oyster Cult, and I had a great time the, the last time uh, I was on when, when we we went at length about uh, Blind Guardian. Though, though that will be a short at length compared to the <laughs> at length of talking about uh, my favorite band of all time, Blue Oyster Cult. Well, let's um let's start off a little bit with you know our can uh diving into the boc pool and um we'll start with you craig uh get you bigger here um so uh one of my closest friends is uh jeff harriet i i call him jefe and we became friends as junior high debate partners this is the guy with whom i write uh all the music for uh my movies the soul songs the synth stuff all of all of the classical stuff and um also, my partner in our in the epic epic metal band Realm Builder, which is our follow up to our far less successful progressive thrash outfit Wombat, and uh, he came home. He was he's one year ahead of me uh, in in uh, in in high school, and he came home from college one break, and I don't know how he uh, how he got on uh, got onto this, but he played me. Uh, some cuts from extraterrestrial uh, live the live album and uh, so this would have been probably 1990 possibly 91 and I knew their hits from the radio though yeah. probably I thought Godzilla um, when I was a kid thought it was a kiss I, I thought it was a kiss song though um, later I got into kiss and, and would know would know the difference but sort of feels like one and he uh, he played me this tune, uh, which is one of my favorite songs of all time, and uh, and I think has the greatest guitar solo ever recorded. Like that has been my answer for thirty something years uh, as to what is the greatest guitar solo of all time, and it's it's Buck solo in uh, Veterans of the Psychic War on that live album. And then from there, I just ex I started exploring and really through um, end of high school, early college getting the albums and this was before the internet days. So sometimes an album would come up and I would just have no idea what it was and just see blue oyster cult on it. Like imagine us, what, what is this thing, you know, and mirrors, what, what is, what is this thing? So that was really how I got into them. And, um, uh, to, 
to, to turn an extremely long, but maybe not terribly interesting to other humans history into kind of a short one. Uh, my favorite band when I was a little kid was Pink Floyd. They got me into music. They're still one of my five favorite bands of all times. When I got into uh, when I got into metal, Iron Maiden became my favorite band, and that was sort of through high school and a little and a little bit after. And then at some point, it changed to Blue Oyster Cult, and it's been that now for uh, you know get, getting on probably about thirty years, 20, 25, 25 plus years as as my favorite band, and I've seen them. 26 times live, and this is the first time I've ever worn this shirt, which you will see says on tour forever. And then note the dates, 1972 to 2012. I can't, I can't say this for certain. It was the 25th time I saw them, and it was all five guys reunited. And when I found out that, <clears throat> when I found out that they were all going to play together, I, uh, I basically lost it. And this was right after Hurricane Sandy had hit uh, New York, and um, it was just kind of just sort of an emotional time, and I just couldn't believe I was going to see them all together. Uh, and I'll talk at length about all of the different guys. But uh, if there are any recordings of that show, and I don't know if that was the last time all five members played together because Alan Lanier uh, sadly passed away uh, not that long after that. But uh, it was one of the last, if not the last time, all five guys played together. Uh, but if there are any recordings of that show and you hear a dude yelling insanely, Albert, between every song <laughs> and yelling for Albert the entire time, that was me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that was, that was uh, you, know, as, 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 you know, I used to have the link to this on my website, as I noted, this is the most important uh, moment in American history uh, of, the last, of the last 30 years. And uh, tremendously emotional for me. I saw them one other time after that with Hefe, uh, and it was an Alan Lanier tribute show that also had Joe Bouchard and Albert Bouchard uh, playing with Eric Bloom and, and, and Buck Dharma. So those were, I felt that those were really good landing places. And I'll get into uh, certainly uh, the value of seeing them 26 times live uh, and, uh, you know, just different permutations of the band, but they, they are my favorite. I, you know, whenever I revisit their albums, which is often I find new stuff and new layers to uncover musically, uh, just, you know, in terms of atmosphere, lyrically, though, though, though a lot of the lyrics, I, you know, I, I, I don't understand, um, but take as like an interesting kind of poetry that enhances the, the, the listening experience. But I do not know the full Imagino story. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that that's how I got into them. To say, you know, I've, I've seen them. In California, I've seen them in Ohio. I've seen them in Florida, where I saw them for the first time with Steppenwolf or John K. Steppenwolf. I don't know if there was a difference at that point. And you know, a, a million times in New York as well. So uh, they're they're my favorite band, and I have a uh, uh, and I have a, a, a ton to say about them. So oh, and one one thing, a brief aside. This will be my only kind of plug moment. Uh, this is my new comic book, Organisms from an Ancient Cosmos, Ooh, coming cool. out this week. My pre-order um, will be coming soon, then. <laughs> uh, yes, I wrote it, I drew it, I, I ink lettered the whole thing. I'm doing a signing at Anyone Comics in Brooklyn. So any people who are local, who uh, want this thing, or actually just want to chat about Blue Oyster Cult, are welcome to come. So that's it. Please, uh, please take us forward. All right. Aaron, how about you? What was your descent into the BOC lexicon? Man, I really came at it from a different angle. I mean, obviously, I kind of always knew who they were, but probably the most time I ever spent with Blue Oyster Cult, actually, I didn't think of this until just now, but um, I took a drama class in school. And for one of the things, we had to do like a little one-act play. And I picked one where it was like for three people in the class, right? I picked one where we were like some like religious fundamentalists, like freaking out about records. And there were Blue Oyster Cult records mentioned by name. So I borrowed a copy of A Fire of Unknown Origin from a friend so I could use it as a prop on this play, you know. So then, like, so I sort of knew about him, right? But it never really sunk in. Then years later, um, I was really, I really wanted some UFO records. I had had them before, but I let them go. And I really wanted them in. I couldn't find any. I was living in San Francisco, too. And no one had any, like, of the five big UFO records. So I was going through my shit and I was like, what, what's the closest thing to that? Because that's what I wanted to hear. And the closest thing I could think of was the first three Blue Oyster Cult records I still had, right? 
And they didn't really scratch the UFO itch at all, right? But during this like period, I kind of kept coming back to them. And I sort of went, hmm. And I started to really appreciate what was going on. I just started going around telling people that the biggest problem with those records is the production job because it sounds muted and muffled like a lot of those 70s records kind of do. Like Sin After Sin is like that too. You know, it's a sort of infamous one in my mind. But uh, yeah, so then that was kind of it for a long time because the whole like radio hit thing put me off. But um, I came around eventually on Fire of Unknown Origin because a friend of mine put me onto that one. So I liked the first three and then that one. And then, I don't know, eventually I started venturing out into some of the other ones. And, like, I remember Spectres at first I didn't like at all, but Agents of Fortune I got into. And I sort of realized that Don't Fear the Reaper is actually a really great song if you can put out of your mind for a minute that, you know, you've heard it 10,000 times. And it just sort of escalated. And as probably anyone who knows, who's seen any of my videos, I went on a pretty big kick then finally about, probably about a year ago now, and it, like, really sort of sank in and, like kind of been no turning back so i really came to him kind of late you know and i probably spent a lot less time on things like the history and that sort of thing than i would have if i'd gotten into when i was younger but i don't know maybe i listened to him a little more closely or something i sort of formed different opinions on him because i have a different perspective based on that i guess we'll find out All right. yeah in deep purple i could tell the story that goes way back but with this one no i gotta improvise and make a bullshit to fill that <laughs> how about you alan Deep Purple was there for me as well. Just like that, that actually was earlier in, in, in a band that got me into metal. I, I, yeah, I got into Deep Purple when I was 12. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think I got into them around them and, and they the, ar around then as well, like really young, Machine Head. And uh, the self titled, I could, I could do a show talking about that amazing Rod Evans fronted self titled. That thing is absolutely gorgeous. Machine Head is the classic, everyone says. But I think that the self-titled is the other classic, every bit as good as that, and just a different band and a different sound. Oh, I got to side within rock over Machine Head. But, but I don't want to like, hijack the whole thing here. Not, yeah, let's not have a Deep Purple, uh, Deep Purple Battle Royale on Bush. Don't make me listen to all the Deep Purple shit, please. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Alan. Okay, uh, let me get a sip of my uh, Cully Stout beer here. <laughs> Turns oh, out trying to drink through a fake beard uh, does not work well whatsoever. So you're just, you're just not dedicated enough to the bit or to the beard, I guess. You uh, don't I'm, have the I'm, luxurious real Kenny Rogers thing going that I do. <laughs> I'm more dedicated to the beer, which uh, is actually uh, from a I-85 brewery over here in South Carolina, and it's listed as a Hell's Rock beer. I have no idea what that means, but it's pretty good. So uh, there we are. All right, for me, yeah, Blue Oyster Cult. I don't have. A long history with this band at all this uh somebody mentioned it was frost celtic frost he mentioned in the chat a few minutes ago for him this was a covid band this was someone you know he finally sat down and started working through their catalog during the pandemic and i did the exact same thing i have of course you know heard bits and pieces here and there over the years and i had never avoided them they were just one of those bands on the list that you never quite got around to paying much attention to but early in the pandemic um some of their albums had shown up at one of the local stores really cheap. I was still trying to stop in there once every couple of weeks. And whenever I stopped in, I tried to buy a pile of something because obviously business was pretty lean there for several months for those places. Mm -hmm. As is like, if there is anything in here I remotely want, I will buy it just to help them out. And yeah, they had like uh, maybe the first four or five albums on CD for like six bucks each. And so I was like, sure. I've got more time at home. I've got more time to play stuff. I will pay six bucks and figure out which of these are good and which of these are bad another time. And uh, yeah, you know, comments from you, Craig, that you'd left in different videos also kind of pointed me towards, you know, checking out some albums like, okay, I'm, some of these are showing up. Let's make sure we get those picked up that Craig mentioned that I should check out. And so, yeah, gradually I filled in a good chunk of their discography. And then when Craig asked us several weeks ago about saving tonight to go through Blue Oyster Cult. That was a good chance to go through and figure out what I hadn't listened to. And so I spent the last few weeks kind of, you know, filling in the gaps with the albums that I never got around to checking out. So, yeah, I don't have a long personal history. There's not going to be tales of listening to these albums, you know, back in my formative years. And none of these albums have been on my shelf for more than, uh, you know, two and a half, three years at most at this point. But it's been interesting checking out the catalog, and uh, I won't have as much to say as Aaron or Craig about them, but uh, I'll throw in my two cents wherever it might matter. 
All right. Uh, for me, other than Northern Michigan Rock Radio, which um, played Burning for You, Don't Fear the Reaper, Godzilla, um, a lot. That was my only real connection with BOC until I started writing for Maniacs. And I met a lot of awesome people during, during that time. But Zoller and Jeff Wagner have been friends ever since. And both of those guys... Uh, Wagner made me a Man of War mixtape and a Manila Road mixtape over a period of time. Zoller made me a BOC mixtape and a Wishbone Ash mixtape, which I also liked quite a bit. Um, so that got me into thinking, wow, this band, because if you're going in at uh, BOC as from their hits, man, every single album that those hits are on, it's the rest of the album sounds nothing like the hits. They sound nothing like the fucking hits. It, it's weird. It's a weird, there's a lot of weird things about this band. And um, I started picking up records at record shows cheap. Every time Zoller would come and visit or I'd go out there and he would be like, oh, we'd be in a record store. And he's like, oh, you got to, you got to hear this one. And he'd buy me a record or when he's here, he, we'd go to the, he'd like, you need to check out this record. So I have amassed um, half of their catalog thus far on vinyl. And um, up until this week, I've always kind of thought of this band as a, a very special occasion band for me. I really connected with the early part of their career. I really like it a lot. Um, they really struck me as a band that um, is very free. They sound very free. They kind of do whatever the hell they want as far as songwriting goes. My, my idea on that has changed substantially since digging into the rest of their catalog. Um, <laughs> I still, there's still a special, going to be a special occasion band for me. I'm still going to like these early albums, but I, I, I've come to find uh, a lot of different opinions about them moving forward. But um, I owe a lot of my um, exploration, you know, to Zoller. And there's been a lot of great stuff, a lot of special moments, you know, sitting and listening to the records together and stuff. It's been awesome. And that, and that really, um, makes the records more special. So, you know, the second half of the catalog that I haven't been as connected to, it was a little bit different of a, of experience for me, but having said all of that, um, we're going to be going through the catalog from the beginning to the end. And we're each going to give our ranking as we go, instead of, you know, doing our, our rankings backwards, like we've done in the past seems to work out good. And we're going to start off with Craig, for the uh, debut album, the Blue Oyster Cult, self-titled Blue Oyster Cult album from 1972. There so it is. You have this. You have this terrific album. But yeah. actually, before you had that terrific album, you have this puzzling and often great uh, experience. That's the Stalk Forest Group. Uh, this show is going to go long, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about all the extras I have set aside. But before they were uh, Blue Oyster Cult, they were the Stalk Forest Group. Uh, <laughs> The hard rock heavy metal edge that's present in their music, some of which is heavy metal, some of which is hard rock, some of which is kind of progressive blues and a whole bunch of other things going on, was not at all apparent in Stock Forest Group. And my understanding is you have this band where there were the two founding guys, uh, very much um, Albert Bouchard, uh, drummer, singer, songwriter, and Donald Buckdarma Roser, uh, guitarist, singer. Uh, songwriter as kind of the foundation of the band with uh, Sandy Perlman, who was, I believe, a heavy metal, like a journalist, and maybe the person, some of these facts are in dispute, who first took the term heavy metal out of the Steppenwolf song, Heavy Metal Thunder, and applied it to uh, music in whatever the magazine, uh, Crawdaddy, maybe was the name of the magazine he wrote for, uh, something like that. So, Get some of the stories, feel free to correct me or put in some additional footnotes for people who know this stuff. I've read contrary things, and I'm going to kind of go with what is either freshest in my mind or, or whatever, uh, you know, whatever, whatever seemed true. But so that was kind of the core. Um, they had another singer whose name was maybe Les Bronstein, and he was out, and they brought in Eric Bloom to kind of have the more traditional lead singer spot, which he oftentimes fills in this band. So one of the great things about Blue Oyster Cult uh, and, and about a, a lot of my favorite bands is multiple songs, there's multiple lead singers and harmony voices that are in uh, harmony singing that is a combination of different voices. 
It's not like, you know, what we're used to today. And it was something we talked about Blind Guardian or Tanzi Kirsch singing. And then there are like 15 other Hansi Kirsch's backing him. And it, and it sounds like it's manufactured in the studio, which can be fine. But if you have a bunch of different arresting personalities, such as Blue Oyster Cult, uh, such as the guy in Blue Oyster Cult, you can come up with something, uh, I, I think, richer. And so you get this album, which my understanding was there was a little bit of a push towards um, uh, Columbia getting a Black Sabbath. And this album certainly is not Black Sabbath, but no. it's... It's sort of halfway between that and what Stock Force Band was, or Stock Force, like, or Stock Force Group, which was much closer to something like The Birds or Grateful Dead. That doesn't suck. And um, uh, so this album comes out, and uh, you get a lot of you, you get immediately all the different personalities. So the the first song kind of blazes in with a riff that's accompanied by Hammond or Hammond organ, and uh, you get. It is. It is. Uh, it's Eric Bloom singing the composition. It's all the. It's Perlman who's writing a lot of their lyrics, and I never am quite sure how much of the music, but he's he's credited prominently throughout a ton of their albums. Albert Bouchard, the drummer singer, Buck Dharma, singer guitarist, and Eric Bloom, singer, occasional stun guitarist, and you get that opener, which is definitely a, a hard rock thing, probably closer maybe to like a Deep Purple. Kind of cut, and sometimes the Hammond organ that's on this album uh, starts starts pushing it a little bit more into a door sort of vibe. So this album as a whole, um, this is one of uh, a few that has been my favorite album of all of their albums. This album certainly has the most obscure, cryptic quality. There's a remoteness to this. There's an inscrutability to this that's absolutely fantastic in terms of consistency. I think it is their most consistent album ever. Um, I like absolutely every, every song. There are other albums that I think have higher highlights, uh, several that have many highlights. Uh, and this has, I don't think this has any great songs, but I think it has a bunch of very good songs. And so going through a Transmaniacon MC, um, you get that kind of quirky, like bloom thing, uh, sort, of, sort of his vocal approach, where he's just doing the hell, the Transmaniacon MC. And then there's a guitar run. And this is a lot of what you get with this band is their, their comfort of handing it off where there's like a held note and then there's a guitar run and then there's a little jazzy fill. And worth saying about Albert Bouchard's drum performance on this album um, kind of reminds me in some spots, it feels like uh, a little bit Gar Samuelson on the first two Megadeths. Like you're, I'm hearing the jazz. I'm hearing the ghost notes. I'm hearing some strange accents. I'm hearing a lot of really kind of nice stuff on the ride that like, later um, becomes less a part of the band as they commit more to the hard rock and heavy metal aspects of their sound. But there's a ton of jazzy uh, work all over this. Then you get them on the lamb, uh, but I ain't no sheep. One of three times they do a version of this song, one of which isn't on an album. Uh, and that's pretty good. It kind of loops along and then gets pretty exciting at the end. Then came the last days of May, a beautiful song that has many better live versions. Uh, and that's one of the reasons this band is my favorite band of all time. Uh, one of many reasons is this this is a band that did many of their songs better live. And like, so last night I saw Carcass in concert and Necroticism and Heartwork are my two favorite death metal albums of all time. There's not a song they're playing live that's even 80% as good as it is on the album. It's all struggle trying to make it happen live, particularly Jeff Walker who comes short. BOC regularly outperforming their stuff in a way, a little bit like 80s King Crimson, where they're just getting it down in the studio. And then later, they're really like um, getting into the pocket more and playing more with it. So uh, great, great stuff there, like the jazzy outro and um, the jazzy stuff that's going on in the ride in uh, I'm on the land. is fantastic. Um, uh, so you get to Before the Kiss of Red Cap. Probably my least favorite song on the album, mainly because even though it has a lot of different directions and it's a pretty daring arrangement, uh, and in, in, in some ways it's like the precursor to songs like Golden Age of Leather, I just don't really care for the initial riff, which is just kind of a, a little bit too much like, I don't know, Southwestern flavored like country rock. Uh, and, the, and the vocal melodies. So grab your road and ringside seat. It's just... But all the stuff that follows that is great. 
uh, City's on Flame. Here we get the searing, ultra quirky Albert Bouchard. Um, there are great live versions of, of him singing this. I've never heard a really good live version of Eric Bloom singing this. This is just the quirk of Albert really, really coming through and all of the all of the facets of this band. So this one is Sandy Perlman, Donald Roser, Albert Bouchard. So you're getting the intricate fretwork that Roser was already doing at this point. He was a great guitarist at the beginning and then within a few albums lands in the spot of my favorite guitarist of all time with only Michael Schenker and Neil Sean being in that conversation. Um, and, uh, but you get like screams, you're getting really kind of creepy stuff with like Albert doing the chorus and Joe, um, singing the verse and there's just sort of nocturnal strolling around. That thing has a great drum fill that transitions into, uh, she's as beautiful as a foot. Apparently it was originally called he's as beautiful as a foot. It was written for the lead singer prior to Eric Bloom to sing about himself. I don't know if that's true. But the people didn't care for him, and they gave him a song to sing that he would where and, and I, I think the idea was he would be oblivious that he was singing about himself, and it was called "He's as Beautiful as a Foot and Shifted." Again, lore, and and it may not be correct, but but stuff I've read. Um, the whole album has a muted quality, and I think it's some of what makes it cryptic. I think for the mo most part, I like the production. You can hear the instruments. They sound ultra warm and organic, albeit um, two to three miles away. Um, uh, I think it's it's redeemed. Uh, no, sorry, it's it's workshop. Workshop of the telescopes. The last two songs were the two it took me a long time to get into, and it's partly because the mix is so baffling on workshop of the telescopes. There's a guitar line that comes in at about I think it's three minutes and seven seven seconds, and it is the loudest noise on the album and i feel like by like 200 percent it is no matter where you have this album set that just it just like leaps out at you and i have to think it's a mistake but maybe it wasn't a mistake maybe they mixed the entire album compressed so this one guitar moment could leap forward nonetheless it it, it seems like an error as and, and there's a and there's a hit on uh in cities on flame where it's like my heart is black and it seems a little bit fudged in terms of the punch of the drums and the vocals and the guitar. Uh, this is a really tight band that has, the, like, it, it probably has done like like four thousand live shows. They, when it says on tour forever, like for a chunk of years, they were on average doing one hundred and fifty shows uh, live. Like they are, they are a relentless touring machine, and one of the reasons they're so tight. Uh, but workshop of the telescope uh, of the telescopes. I really learned how much I like that song when I heard a live version. That didn't have that crazy mix, and you could hear the core ideas come out better. Uh, but this album, so this album, as I said, uh, there was a point where um, where I rank this as my favorite of all of their albums. Uh, I rank it as at, at number three at this point, uh, and really and, and really enjoy it a lot. I love the remote inscrutability. Like this is of all of the albums. If there's an album actually made by some cult, and you don't know what they're doing, and they have an agenda. And they're just and they're and they're and it's and it's gonna happen like and they, they're gonna put something out there in the world that's malevolent or gonna undermine undermine your values. This is that album, and the and the cover is great. Like they they go back and forth with great covers and bad covers and covers in the middle. This one, I think the artist's name is Gallic, um, is great. And it's I a very striking, cool image. Very yeah. cool. I, and I think I heard Joe Bouchard tell a story once about how. They didn't know what happened to this artist. Maybe he didn't get along with uh, Krugman or Perlman or somebody in their camp. But then Joe Bouchard got in a cab one day in New York and Gallic was driving that cab. Don't know if it's true, but again, <laughs> it's, it's a story. I think Joe, I think Joe told it, but um, I, uh, I love this album. Uh, uh oh. Oh, I guess not on my end. Oh, you're back. You're, you're back. Yep. It's a weird place to start, but it's it's a fantastic thing to to inspect in them. You know, and them really, really at their at their most obscure, but landing on the scene immediately. Uh, you know, they've arrived. It's they're 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 good. They're good straight straight from the straight from the get go, and had a sense of humor. I will point out the song "Stairway to the Stars." 
as they're in the first album, they they nobody really knows who they are as far as I can tell. And they're and they're singing about like, um, you, like you want me to sign your cast? Good health to you on your cast. You broke in um Stay away to like singing about like their fame, and then they're putting out this album. He's just like she's as beautiful as a foot, and screen <laughs> and and workshops of the telescopes. All of this bizarre stuff. So. Although, although strange and inscrutable, the sense of humor was also there as well. I will say before we move on to Aaron, you mentioned um, this band having a good three different songwriters in the band. And um, I think early on in their career, that really works well for them. I think as they went on, they it, it kind of sounded like multiple songwriters who had different ideas of what Blue Oyster Cult is or should be. That's that's just the impression I got, and, and it made for some very scattered, weird listening experiences moving forward. But I would ag- agree with you. I really appreciate that early on. It it makes it a unified, unique uh, uh, attack on their these early albums. But I don't know. What do you think about that moving forward? I mean, we'll talk about them individually, but it just seemed like there was a, a some different ideas of what they should be. Moving there are forward. definitely different ideas of, of what they should be. The multiple songwriters, multiple lead singers, multiple guys singing harmony, to me, is always a strength of this band. Yeah, yeah. But they're definitely diverging ideas of what they should be. Uh, and uh, and different songwriters and performers who had peaks at different times. I mean, on this, on this, like certainly like the, with the with the first with the first three, you're seeing Albert's hand writing like the, the, you know, like as as a songwriter or co-songwriter. At like doing a lion's share of, of, of the best cuts. Uh, but you know, like each, each guy has, has his strengths and, um, yeah, like all, all, every member of the band wrote, and then there's Krugman and there's Perlman and there's Helen wheels and there's Meltzer. There are a bunch of other people and, and four of them lead sang, uh, Alan Lanier lead sings one song, which is called true confessions outside of that. Uh, he does not lead sing, but yes, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I don't think the loss of way is so much the competing egos or that sort of thing, because I think that was always a strength of the band. I think that there's a point where they lost their way, and there's a weird thing with the band making stuff like this, all of a sudden having like a giant hit, and that giant hit being written entirely by one guy who was doing less less songwriting at the beginning. Right. All right, Aaron, your thoughts. All right. Well, here it is. With the little time, with the big timing strip on the cover, and I love this record so much, and the cover for that matter. But I've thought about getting another copy just so I had one that doesn't have this on it. Uh, let me just ask a question. My belief is that those, because I have my Spectres is the same way, that those mm-hmm. earlier pressings have better sound. I've heard people say that they're fresher, and and my Spectres that has that is the best sounding version of it I've ever heard. Have really? you noticed? Have you noticed? I've, I've never noticed. I've never really compared, but I'm not much of an audiophile guy that way, okay. so. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I really couldn't tell you. I don't have anything to say on that at all. So, um, yeah. As far as the record goes, though, um, you, you know, it's funny because I'm not really much of a lyrics guy. But since Craig has brought up, you know, some of the funny stuff on this one, you know, another thing too coming at him late is uh, I don't necessarily have all this baggage. So I'm sort of coming into this stuff fresh, right? And specifically, the song uh, on Stairway to the Stars with that business about, you know, they cast your broken arm the way it's emphasized. I always kind of got the impression it's because he broke his arm. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you fu- like, like, like there was a menace saying, oh yeah, your broken arm. You know what I mean? And similar sort of deal with the uh, flaming that's, that's tele- interpretation. I, I don't know. A similar sort of thing with the flaming telepaths where he's like, uh, you know, is it any wonder that my joke's in iron and the joke's on you? That's like, because he fucking jokes. <laughs> this is the joke and the joke's on you. You know, yeah. So that I, there's, sure. there's a sort of violent undertones that I felt like I kept picking up from these guys in these weird ways. You know, I mean, and not just, and probably on this record more than any other because there's that. Then there's that whole thing with the Transmaniacon MC. And yeah, I've sort of heard some stories about like you know with this idea of this biker gang that was like these demons and this sort of story built around it. But you can take all that away from it and just look at it as far as like what it says at face value. And there's some pretty fucking weird shit going on in there. And then there are all these simple little things that make it so great. Like you were talking about the guitars, but the entry at the very beginning, there's that descending, that chromatic pattern. You know, the, that the guitar plays over the mm-hmm. main riff. Mm-hmm. 
It's just so simple. And this record is loaded with things like that. Uh, another little thing that's just a weird thing about this one is um, on Cities on Flame with Rock and Roll, you're talking about how uh, Albert sings it. And I'll probably call him Al Bouchard. There's a reason for that, which I, I can explain another time because I did it in my own video. Um, but uh, on that song specifically, the way he sings the line, he goes, my heart is black and my lips are cold. City's on flame. And where he places that city's on flame and then with rock and roll is like just under the pitch. And I've never been able to figure out if he's doing that on purpose. Like, I mean, you know, people talk about quarter tones a lot, but he's really, he's not a full half step below the proper pitch where it is on all the live versions. He's just a little under where it belongs. I've never figured out if that was a style thing he was doing on purpose or if he was just singing flat and it came out awesome. <laughs> but it fucking blows my mind. Am I the only one who's noticed that? Have you noticed that before, Craig? I no, I and, and that, that's what I said. Like my ear for pitch has gotten better over the years, but I'm so, like I've been listening to him sing that for for so long. There's oh to me, there's always like there's a squeakiness to to his vocals. Yeah, and I, 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 like I wouldn't say like he feels locked in the way that Bloom does, but I wouldn't have isolated that particular phrase. Like I I didn't notice. It's the, the quarter, a quarter tone on that phrase. Yeah, he does it on each line, too. Like, he sings in tune, in tune, in tune, and then just a little under, and then back up in tune. It's like this yeah. one specific note in the phrase that's repeated, and he does it consistently. So I mean, I, I know. All the bends and stuff, and when his voice cracks, the part, black, like that kind of rising I up. Stuff. Yeah. I love that. that. That's like him. Like, that's why I like his singing, is because you know, of shit like that. You know, that whole pitch thing... I mean, I listen to this record not to not to cut in on you here, Aaron. Um, okay. This whole, I listen to this thing and it sounds very live to me. Maybe it's because they played a good chunk of this album live in the studio, and maybe he didn't quite hit that pitch, but he was just under it enough where they listen back to him like, "Fuck, man, it's good enough. It's got a good feel." I mean, it might be better. It might be I better, mean, but he, he didn't hit that pitch because he wasn't play. doing it a hundred times over and over until it was right. They probably yeah. played it. Maybe, I'm I'm guessing it's the seventies. Who knows how they did it? But I would, I listen to this record and it has such a live quality to it. I, I would guess that a good share of it was maybe played live and they kept the stuff that worked and the shit that didn't, they may have overdubbed. Who knows? You know, it's yeah. tape. It's, they're doing it on tape. There's no digital oopsies or corrections. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm on the lamb, but I ain't no sheep is actually probably my favorite version of that song. Like the red and the black versions I've heard in that. They're faster, and there's some more sort of action going on, but I kind of like the nuance in this one. It just feels like this one's a little bit more thoughtful and a little less just sort of balls-out rock and roll. And they I mean, always do the rock and roll. So I mean, There's a third yeah. one that they recorded like uh, for Secret Treaties, but they didn't use. I forgot the name of it. It's very disorienting to listen to, but there's a I third heard that one. Yeah, it's a bonus track on a later release of uh, – of, of secret treaties and it's 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 less good than the other two but sorry continue right on well i think i agree with you on before the kiss of red cap being the weakest song on here not necessarily for the same reasons but um the the bounce to it feels a little bit forced to me i think we're talking about the same thing but we're sort of perceiving it a little bit differently like with the way you were describing it that sort of uh i don't remember the word you use now but the impression it made on you more, the was more like wang that was bothering yeah. with me it's yeah. bounce but it's the same thing, you know. It's like a dreary kind of bar rock riff, and the and the singing is not elevating it, and then it takes yeah. flight when uh, Joe Bouchard does that bass line transition. But I think that uh, Workshop of the Telescopes might be the most Blue Oyster cult Blue Oyster cult song because the way it's weird, like it kind of rocks, but it's kind of a little bit too weird to really rock. And the riffs just kind of don't make sense. It's like you hear it the first few times you hear it, it doesn't really stick because it's just sort of in these weird places. And then you sort of go, yeah, and you get your head around. And you're like, this is fucking fantastic. And then it releases all that tension going into Redeemed, too, actually, which I think is a great song for, like, closing out this record. I, I read something once where someone was like, oh, yeah, that was like a leftover song from a previous band that felt slapped onto the end. And I was like, I completely disagree. I feel like that brings a conclusion to what they built up over the whole thing. That's like... That's like the happy ending. They like told all these weird stories and now we're all going to smile at the end, even though we didn't really resolve all the shit that we drudged up in the set of Edgar Allan Poe short stories that was this record. We're all going to smile and say, we're happy now. We're going to go home and have a good night. 
you know, course, it's it's their course. version of Rocket Queen on the end of Appetite for Destruction. Then, <laughs> oh man, that, that's the best song on that album. Question: Oh, question. And, well, it, it does the same thing Aaron just described. You know, it, it ends on kind of a very kind well, of happy. I, I'll say that this that Redeemed seems like if you like the song, if you like Redeemed, you should have the Stock Forest Group album. It's in, it's that stuff the entire time. I mean, I haven't bought that because I've heard it was different and I didn't want to be disappointed, but I would probably love that record because I if like you a lot like, of if you like redeemed. It's like that, but with actually a, a, like, like better lead playing the lead lead playing is particularly good. I have a question for you. Do you think that those, the way the notes leap crazily out of the mix at 200% at the end of workshop, do you think that's intentional? It's so much, it's so loud. I've never been struck by that. The way yeah. you have, I, I was, I was, thinking, I was going to listen to it again because I didn't notice that. It, it is, it is, uh, it it's is because, because that's how the flat note in Cities on Flame sounds to me. It's so obvious, and it's only in that one version, and it's so consistent. It just, it's, it, it dominates the song in my head. So it's like it, that. That's why. So I got to hear that fucking thing on telescopes now because that's like another instance of that same sort of phenomenon. I only did it in your brain instead of mine. Yeah, I know. yeah, it, 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 it's, it's there. <laughs> But I, I love that song, but it took me a while to get around. There's a lot of swirling, crazy 70s stereo oh, wow. shit going on with that one as well. But it's a great do you, tune. Do you know that like uh, EP? There was a 10-inch that came out on Monster yes. Records. Yes. I didn't yes. that, that, that has the version. first one I bought. That has the version of Workshop that I was like, this song is great. And I never knew it was great because I was always so puzzled by that mix. And then when I returned to the album, I said, oh, this song is great. There's yeah. just layers of obfuscation. Or, or there, it's just there's just shit getting in the way, and it's swirling through my mind. And then there's a at that three minutes and, five minutes and seven seconds that is just like a like an ice pick into my ear. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, all right, are you good, Aaron? Yeah, we can we can keep moving. All right, Alan, you're up. Okay, uh, just some general thoughts and background on this one. Um, yeah, Craig mentioned you know, the Sandy Perlman and kind of latching on to the you know, term heavy metal. I've noticed several guys in the band you know, in more recent years have come out and said they never really liked that tag or that idea. They kind of went along with it at the time and allowed Perlman to market them that way, but they never really felt like it was a great description for them. Yes. And yeah, I think more and more people have come to realize that. You're right, Craig. Columbia felt like they had missed out on Black Sabbath and they wanted an equivalent and they were going to make this their equivalent, even though it wasn't really ever, they're not the same thing whatsoever there. Um, and you see that in different ways, you know, with Blue Oyster Cult, while some of the music is heavy, even by the standards of their contemporaries, it's a little hard to consider them heavy metal sometimes. Uh, you know, Marty's pointed out several times, you know, they don't use much distortion on the guitars, if any, at times. Uh, things like that. The band they always strike me as a lot more similar to, especially on these early albums, is Budgie. They've got, you know, that kind of you know, the weird, obtuse kind of lyrics, you know, the very pronounced sense of humor with, you know, song titles like She's As Beautiful As A Foot. That should have been on, you know, an early Budgie album. It would have yeah. been right at home with that kind of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, they always, everyone always wanted to call them, you know, the American Sabbath. They always should have been called the American Budgie uh, from my perspective. Anyway, that said, other things about the album. Uh, there's also an Ion Farmer pointed this out in the chat a little bit earlier while it's going for you know the updated 70s hard rock kind of sound it does still have these you know throwback moments there on uh, mentioned the doors in particular and there are definitely times you get sort of a doors vibe in certain sections here and there yes. it's not that they have like entire songs that follow that but you can definitely hear influences from that era i uh, worked into the tracks still Oh, what else did I want to mention on this one? Let me just uh, say this. I didn't hear the budgie thing at all. So now I'm going to go back and listen to that. That that okay. I, I was not expecting that. That's that's really a trip. Uh yeah. I and again, Budgie's another one I'm not, you know, I have no long history with. They were another yeah, I you know band I started checking out pandemic wise. And it may not be that they sound exactly like, but just in terms of kind of the aesthetics around the band, the way that they're yeah, new, you know, new approaching music. Parachutist woman. Mm -hmm. Like, like yeah. new disintegrating parachutist woman. That could that could be a BOC song title. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess I can see, 
Maybe if Blue Oyster Cult were Welsh, they would have been like Budgie. That would explain <laughs> the difference in the sense of humor, you know? Perhaps. Yeah, no, I'm seriously going to listen to that now. It's funny because I've actually been into Budgie a lot longer than Blue Oyster Cult. I got into Budgie when I was in high school. Okay. But yeah, for me, um, I agree with Craig's description of the album. It's a very consistent album. Uh, even though there's a lot of variety in the songs, they're all pretty good. Although there's not a ton of standouts. The one track for me that is a standout and is one of my favorite tracks, period, by the band is Then Came the Last Days of May. That one, you know, it's got this very, you know, great emotive vibe, very somber. They're in full storytelling mode. It goes very well. Um, just, you know, a really awesome song start to finish. Uh, one that really stood out. Uh, and it's, yeah, I counted probably in my top, you know, five Blue Oyster Cult songs. So with that in mind, this one, I rank it pretty high. Aaron, we did not get a ranking from you on this album, by the way. <laughs> I didn't realize until like a minute ago. Sorry. Yeah, I, I thought of it while you were talking and then I it, uh, skipped. So where did you want to rank the uh, subtitle? Right, so, so here's my caveat. And I'm sorry. to I feel like I'm cutting into your action here. But I, my okay. caveat is I only ranked the first 11 studio albums because that's all I really have. I have the 12th okay. one, but I haven't digested it like the other ones, so it didn't feel like I could hold it at the same level. So so the, the, so the bottom of the list here is going to be number 11 when we get there. Okay. It won't be number 16 or whatever it really should be. Okay, so that's my caveat. So the first Blue Oyster Cult record, there have been I, – I also the other thing is that when – because this was impossible, so I just sort of went into it. I was like, oh, fuck it, however I'm feeling right now, whatever I feel like defending today, basically, you know? So I kind of went for the hotter take when there were two different ways I could go. Sure. So for those reasons, the first Blue Oyster Cult record, which I give a 10 out of 10 as far as how much I like it, is number six on the list. Number six. Okay. That's quite all right. For right me, um, let's see. And one thing I'll preface a few times tonight with my rankings. Since I don't have a long history with this band, and I've basically heard all of their albums within the past two and a half years, my ranking should be taken with a big grain of salt. They could be very fluid. There are some albums I have spent, you know, I've played, you know, a dozen times or more. There are some of these albums I've only played two or three times. So a lot of these rankings could move up or down a couple of slots. And there are really no albums in the catalog I dislike very strongly. There's a the couple at the bottom I could do without, but overall I find it a pretty consistent discography. Uh, that said, I did go ahead and rank all 16 or all 14, I guess. Yeah, 14. Um, and I've got the self-titled ranked at number four. Uh, again, very strong, consistent album, shows nice variety, has the one gem of a song that stands out for me with Then Came the Last Days of May. And so on this particular date in history, I'm putting the self-titled at number four in their catalog. And now I'm going to pass it over to Marty so we can hear his thoughts. Okay, um, going in, I mean, you guys have gone through songs i'm i'm just i'm cleanup crew type of guy on this in this whole situation but um i will say i i this week i spent a lot of time pondering boc's place and as time and music and genres have moved on i mean you can like like let's look at black metal for instance you got the norwegian scene you got the swedish scene you got the cascadian black metal scene all these bands that pro crop up they all have a, a similar sound and feel and you can typically listen to them and say, Oh, these guys are from Norway or oh, this sounds like a Cascadian band, New York in the seven. I mean, let's, let's face it. The seventies are kind of like the wild, wild West when it comes to music. I mean, there were so many different things going on from Prague to this new, you know, not rock and roll wasn't new by any means, but it was getting harder and, and, and stranger and, what makes New York such a, a, a melting pot? I mean, look at Kiss. Kiss put their debut album out a year later from this one. Um, BOC came out, uh, Blue Oyster Call came out in 72. Kiss's self titled came out in 73. You kind of want to tell yourself that there would be kind of a, a similar tone, but there's not. Kiss went for more of an English pop thing. And um, what else you got? The New York Dolls, which are total glam. And and, and BOC comes out and they sound like no one. They, they really don't, they don't strike me as having, you can hear influences of other styles of music, but there's no necessary, you know, big band of the time that's influencing these guys, which to me is awesome. I mean, it kind of puts them in a classification for me and, you know, super special, atypical. 
I tend to not always gravitate towards the super special atypical. I have a lot of appreciation for them, but I never really feel like listening to them. But this album is the first BOC I bought. And as a guitar player, uh, not a great one, but a guitar player nonetheless, I, I was really driven, uh, uh, locked in on Buck Dharma, for one. I mean, I, I remember one, one of Zoller's visits, we watched some live show. Some of the most amazing solos ever. And a lot of that transcends into this music. If even the worst albums on here that I don't like, the guitar solos are still fantastic. I mean, there's always something good, even on those stuff that I don't like. And I can't say even the stuff that I don't like sucks because, you know, stylistically speaking and musicianship wise, they're all exceptional, well composed, well considered albums. But for me, uh, side two, uh, City, Cities on Flame with Rock and Roll. I mean, that might be the easy one to pick as a favorite, but as a guitar player, I listen to the main riff in that song, and it's so herky-jerky and strange. It, it has, the way it's played has a good hook and a good feel to it, but it's got such a weird cadence to it, or not cadence, uh, just a weird flow to it. It shows a band that's coming at things from left field a little bit. And I really, really like that. And there's a lot of that on here, but they can walk the line between, you know, clean, pretty to weird musically. And I really appreciate that. And for that, this record to me is, you know, the first three or four are the most consistent. And this is a very strong, consistent album. I really like the live sound of it, even though it blows me away that they get heavy without conventional distortion. Nowadays, you want distortion, you step on whatever stomp box and you get, you know, chainsaw guitar tone. Easy. This here, it sounds like a bunch of amps turned up. Not necessarily showing a lot of distortion, but it really highlights how good the musicianship is to play that cleanly with such a, a, um, a stripped bare tone. I think it's very brave. I think this is a great record. Um, having said that, it ended up today ending up as number four for me um this is a great start um a great start very creative beginning very interesting song structures and ideas and atypical vocals i mean every single singer on this band has got a quirk to them that might bother some people and turn some people off but that quirk is really very special to this band um and it continues to grow as the band progresses. But yeah, this is an excellent beginning for this band. I give it a four. You know, one other thing I was going to say, sort of to what you were saying about the, um, the, uh, the sort of the weird jerkiness of it. There's this particular way of writing a riff that I've noticed that Blue Oyster Cult does that I haven't heard in other bands. And it consists of a couple of open chords and then a guitar run. And Cities on Flame with Rock and Roll is an example of that. The way it goes, do, do, do. Yeah. Another one is ETI. Yep. Yep. So that was a pretty shitty rendition, but I think you get the idea. Man, I thought I was listening to the album there for a second. Fuck, dude. I was about to turn it up. Is that Freedom Rock? Turn it up, man. Anyway, we're gonna move on to uh our the second album it is tyranny and mutation and it came out in 1973 zoller two quick things one yep. uh I, I i know there are comments on the side i'm a i'm a bad multitasker so i've asked marty to bring up anything i should respond to directly i don't know that we should make the show go any longer someone already pointed out that <laughs> the amount of time we spent and we've done one of like four, I know. <laughs> 14 albums so, uh, so I like I'm I'm able to read some of it. I actually don't know. I I, I really just want to listen to what the other the other three hosts are. Yeah. are saying. And guys, we're gonna get Zoller. I mean, he's he's he likes doing this. Thankfully for us, and we're gonna get him on for other topics, and one that's less uh, heavy lifting to do. We're gonna open it up to questions because I know for his films and other questions people have for him, we're gonna get that. We're gonna let you guys have that, but it probably won't be the tonight because there's so much. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot there's a yeah. lot to do um so we then move to uh tyranny mutation the other album with the, with the gallic cover killer cover too great I, imagery. I out for for the audio files out there this thing exists uh which is the gold mobile fidelity sound lab edition that is the first two albums and in terms of 
uh, CD versions of this album, this this is the best by far. Uh, if you Just have don't the, drop the case, or you're going to be pissed. Oh yeah, yeah, no, these are they're a pain in the pain in the ass, and so they have one for this. They also have one for Agents of Fortune, uh, and I, I think I have Pink Floyd Metal. I don't have many of these, but I have a handful of albums, and um, so. We go to this album, and uh, uh, this is probably where I'll diverge from most of the hardcore Blue Oyster Cult fans. Um, I, and I like this album, but for me, it is it's a, it's a it's a step down. And the main reason it's a step down is just consistency. Um, I think that the second side of this album is maybe the best album side that they have. Uh, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't get to the peak of how great their greatest songs are. But man, that's an incredible four song run. So, uh, but the but the first but the first side I um I like I really like one of the four songs. And uh, so there's Red and the Black, uh, which is my favorite of the four, and it is a, you know a, a, a redo, albeit at a much faster tempo. Mm -hmm. of, I'm on land, but it ain't so sheep. Like let's do let's do the the riff quickly. Uh, Bloom is extra playful in this. Uh, in this one, and uh, it's the kind of thing, seeing them 26 times live, and they've probably done this song 16 or 17 times, you're always missing, got a whip in my hand, but you always want that whip. When Rondinelli was <laughs> the cover, he would, he would, he made, he made an effort to put a, to put a crash there, and, and maybe Chuck Berge, but I'm not sure that's going a long time ago, um, uh, but that whip sound effect is fantastic. But it's super playful. They're having a good time, and it sounds like it. That the beginning of it is just thunder. It's basically like a stadium ending. But at the beginning of the album, this seems like maybe the way Motorhead or somebody like that would open an album, uh, and and may have opened an album. And the first thing I, I like, I, you, you'll notice if you listen to this right after um, the debut, is they're tighter. Uh, this is this is better either. Better rehearsed or more time in the studio, I can't tell you. But so then we go to OD'd on Life itself, which I've just never cared for. I I, I don't really like the riff. Um, I don't like the the vocal hooks, uh, particularly on that tune. Hot Rails to Hell, I also don't really care for. And this is um, just like we, we've talked about Albert and Joe and Eric. So uh, Albert, Buck, and um, uh, Bloom. Uh, but let me mention now that that Joe Bouchard, uh, who's the bassist and and contributed less in the way of songwriting, just in terms of the number of songs that he co-wrote in those earlier days, he is their ace in the hole. Like my favorite album by them, my second favorite album by them, their most commercially successful album and their worst album. He wrote my favorite song on like all of those or co-wrote it. So he is a fantastic songwriter and not to be underestimated, even though like Bloom, Buck, and 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 Albert are, are are a little bit more central and in in terms of either writing or singing or both. Um, so Hot Rails to Hell, uh, just I I I, just, I feel the riff is okay. Um, all of that, like there's a little bit honky tonk piano going. That's usually not my sound. Uh, just have never cared for it. Seven Screaming Dizbusters starts out great. I mean that's uh, that. That riff is is monstrous, uh, and then this is a song that kind of loses its way. This is this reminds me in a way of a lot of the stuff on Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, which I feel like that album rearranged is an incredible album. That album as it is, almost every song progresses to parts I like less, with worse singing or worse ideas, and just so much of that album loses its way. But there's yeah. brilliant stuff in it, and so like my feeling on Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, the Seven Screaming Disbusters, because when they when they just kind of get into the countdown and then the Lucifer and the light. Oh, da, 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 da. There's a lot of great bass playing. I'll put the third verse in particular. There's a lot of phenomenal bass playing from Joe uh, on this thing as well. And then you get to the second side. So they said like, might like it's a side of great songs. All four songs are great. And um, it's a shame that like, I think the first side is three songs. I don't particularly care for. I don't dislike, um, but I don't particularly care for. And then red and the black, which I think is good, but, not a pat like not comparable remotely to any of the stuff that goes on the second side and you get um with uh with baby ice dog uh such a, this is i think probably the first like really great eric bloom performance and i think a reason that he can be slotted as a little bit more the traditional lead singer 
Um, his voice is a little fuller, and he's and certainly by the time they get to the '80s, he's the one who leans into vibrato. Like I'm not hearing Buck. Like Buck is fantastic. Like they're all, all, all four of these guys are great singers, um, and in and, and with different qualities. But Bloom could land in a traditional heavy metal um, space because of the dramatic qualities of his voice and the richness of his voice. And but like Baby I Stall, that to me is the beginning of his great singing. And then they do something at the end of that song that's like this is this is why it's great to have this number of singers where you get the the um, the Free zone, free zone, free zone. And they're doing the back and forth between Bloom and, and Bouchard. I apologize for all my off key, key singing in this in this show. I won't be able to stop myself. <laughs> I think get Wings Wedded Down with some lovely like twin guitar harmony stuff. Like here we're in like Wishbone Ashland. Teen Archer is just like uh, like the, the breaks in that, the Hammond organ breaks, Alan Lanier coming to the fore, and just like um all of the all of the in the drum breaks that take you to the end you know that there's there's a, just a giant drum fill alternating with the guitar part and then they get to the end part where where albert's doing all that stuff on the ride incredible stuff and then my favorite song on the album mistress of the salmon song quick line girl i just got to chill saying that like i think that's that is the best song that they have on the first two albums i love that song i was Thrill the one time I saw them play that live, and that is just uh, they just call her quick line girl, and it's just the way the the way the harmonies come in, and it's like she's the mistress of the salmon salt, and you get all that like all of that jazzy ride, and then you get that like heavy riff that when it gets into the harvester life, the harvester, it's just incredible, and it's like. You know, it's like that whole thing to kneel or pray, and then and then you get the like there's that like steering stuff at the end. It's just an incredible ending to the album, and that song and the ending of that song conjures the obscure malevolence of the first album, uh, and is I, that, that's got to be uh, that's that is yeah that is Bouchard Albert Bouchard and Sandy Perlman wrote it. But again, that whole sec the second side of this is incredible i just i yeah side a i'm just i'm just not uh, you know and they've divided it. they call side a the black and side a the red just to change it up uh and the red is gold uh and the black has one song i really like and, and three that i think are okay uh so this one ranks seven for me all right aaron well, it's funny because I think I feel a little more positive about this one than Craig just did, but I was I put this one at eight, so maybe not. Um, the, the funny thing is, I'm kind of like backwards, like like the um, the red and the black is sort of the intro, you know. I, you know, it's fun, it's fine, but like that's not the song I'm reaching for when I'm reaching for this record. This record really starts for me with "Odeed on Life Itself," where that sort of like that kind of weird sort of cynical edge, that sort of like this sort of feeling to it he has in the way he delivers the vocal line and that I can totally hang with, you know, it's the way it sort of step back in the delivery. Yeah, I'm all over that. And then, um, you know, I always enjoy this record when I play it, but the songs tend to stay with me less than the other ones. And that's really why this comes, you know, it ends up a little bit lower on my list is it just doesn't, uh, doesn't have that staying power. Every time I put it on, I go, oh, yeah, I know these songs, and they're all great. But uh, it doesn't – I don't – Those they're not the ones I sort of hum to myself when I'm walking around, you know. Wings Wetted Down is a cla is great, though, too. Mr. The Salmon Salt, I got a second. I, I don't know if I put it quite as high as Craig just did, but I think it's a fantastic song and a high point of this record. But, yeah, I don't know as much to say about this one as I do the first one, or Secret Treaties, so I might as well just roll with that because <laughs> – All right. <laughs> Alan. Let's see. Yeah, I kind of agree with Aaron's statement there at the end. I like this album when I think about it, it's like, oh, that's a great album. But it's not one that I, yeah, when you look at the titles, like, yeah, none of these are the songs that really get stuck in my head long term from their catalog. Uh, I agree with Craig. Side two is very good. I'm not as high on Baby Ice Dog as he is, but the other three tracks, Wings Weighted Down, Teen Archer uh, is a great track. Hadn't been mentioned by name yet. And I think I like Side A a little bit more overall than Craig did. So it kind of balances out where it's still a pretty solid album for me, start to finish. You know, just a couple of tracks, you know, maybe you dip a little bit lower. 
but yeah, it you know compared to the self titled for me, it doesn't have that one must hear over and over and over again song like you know then came the last days of may on the self-titled for me so i've got this ranked just a step lower than the self-titled i'm ranking it fifth whereas i had the self-titled ranked at fourth this is one that i may have it ranked a little bit higher the albums that are right behind it as we'll find out later this evening, are ones that I have not played as much. So there's a chance this album could slide down just a little bit over time, and some of those with more listens might move up a little bit. But uh, for this date in history, we want to put this one at number five and say that, yeah, Craig's right. They sound tighter here. We still have a really good set of songs here. Uh, for me, it's just missing you know that one big must-have on the playlist song, even though there are lots of good ones on here that I like hearing. So, Marty, where do you put this one? Uh, you think I'm cheating off your paper here because uh, I have this at number five as well. Um, oh, okay. And I would agree. I, the first album had a couple really standout songs that make you want to keep coming back. This one didn't maybe have that as much. But um, one thing it did have was a, a big jump in production. I really like, <clears throat> I like the raw, almost feral guitar tone especially when the leads kick in, there's just a searing quality to that guitar tone that sits in really well with this mix. Everything sounds tighter, a little fuller. Um, but all right, weird song titles and lyrics, but a solid early 70s rock album. It is solid. And yeah. I did have it ranked higher initially, but I ended up changing it because I actually Zoller picked this up for me last time he was here along with a Utopia record. So if I was ranking it on album cover alone, I'd give it a nine. <laughs> I love this guy's, this guy's imagery is fantastic. It's a very, always a very striking image, but um, very cool. even the back, it's a very cool back cover as well. But I think it's a solid rock album. I don't think it's as urgent sounding or um, uh, I think there's a lot more dynamics on the first one, but um, I do like it. I've listened to it quite a bit. I gave it a little higher ranking because of the production. I really like the guitar tone, but other than that, yeah, you guys kind of covered it well enough. I don't need to prattle on. So let's get in uh, Zoller to their third album, uh, secret treaties, 1974. Laz actually, if I can just jump in for one second, I think Laz kind of summed it up. He said tyranny gets pulled, it gets played when I'm on a BOC binge, but never gets pulled by itself. That's kind of where I am with it too. If I'm listening to four of their records, which happens a lot, Okay, so it gets yeah. pulled out a lot. But if I'm just going to pull out one, it's not going to be that one. Yeah. Okay. Probably. All right. Zoller. I want to take a moment to say uh, hey to Hefe, who is in the chat. And, yes. And I, don't know, I don't know when he came in, but I did acknowledge that uh, you are the guy who got me into the band, playing me the live veterans of Psychic War when you were home on Christmas break in Miami. And, uh, and, he, and he mentioned something that was – fun back you know like back in the pre-internet days like i didn't know what the lyrics were for almost any of these things and then at some point i got them maybe wagner sent them to me i'm not exactly sure how i got them and um uh but we were on a camping trip and we just went through these things and we're just mystified all these songs we've been trying to figure out what they were saying and none of the lyrics well <laughs> not none but like so many of the things we were like wow this is what it's been saying like like well certainly what you know we'll discuss cagey credence uh, in a moment, but there's some puzzling lyrics going on. So we get to the third Blue Oyster Cult album, uh, Secret Treaties, um, acknowledged uh, by, by many people uh, and many fans as, as their as their uh, best album. Uh, actually, I found out recently, this is a little sad that I, that I missed it, but they did a show, Blue Oyster Cult, with Albert Bouchard, where they played this album in its entirety um, in, in New York, but I was oblivious that this thing happened. Uh, so that's a, that's a little sad, though. I'm happy to hear that Albert is continuing to have like better relationships with the, with the guys these days because they did one where it was Secret Treaties and I think one where it was Tyranny and Mutation. So um, I love this album. Uh, this album is my second favorite in, in their catalog and certainly their periods uh, when it was number one. And um, I like you're really getting all the personalities coming out uh, on, on this one. I think this is also the, uh, the first album where you get a truly great uh, Buck, uh, uh, Buck Dharma guitar solo. You've got a lot of stuff, just a, a fun, like a fun aside. So the song Career of Evil opens it up. Great song. And it, it's, yeah, great song, super playful. Um, it, it, that's Bouchard and Patti Smith 
So she's involved. She's one of the, like, let's say five to six people who regularly turns up around the edges of this band. And very, very often in her case on, on standout songs. So Career of Evil is, uh, is, is really enjoyable. There's a single version of it where they replace the, I'd like to do it to your daughter on a dirt road. They change that line to, I'd like to do it like an otter on a dirt road. So they change do it to your daughter to do it like an otter, um, which actually I prefer that lyric. And in, <laughs> and in that single version, um, you also get these delirious um, backing vocals, backing that become kind of lead vocals from Bouchard, like, like, Career of evil. Like he's just belting it and it's fantastic. So that that's one I actually like. It's not better than this version, but it's comparably good and has some has some different stuff. So you get that and uh, and then you get uh you go to Subhuman, which this is Eric Bloom and and Perlman. So early on, like I think, you know, it was one thing when I was looking at all the credits for all all these and seeing like like uh, Bloom was a little bit more involved kind of from the get-go with with songwriting. And I know um uh did you see that oh, oh i i thought he says do it do it like an otter but it could be ought to i don't know how how you ought to do it on a dirt road but i don't know how an otter does it <laughs> probably you know, the same way just yeah <laughs> my earlier my earlier comment that i often and i i often had mistaken interpretations for the lyrics it certainly sounds like an otter to me um uh, so with Subhuman, you get a, a, a song that was originally called Blue Oyster Cult. So th a tiny bit of history was uh, there was a point when I think Blue Oyster Cult, and this is coming from Albert Bouchard, an interview I saw with him, they had played a live show that they thought was terrible. And they're like, we need to change our name. And at that time, I don't know if they were Soft White Underbelly or if they were Stock Force Band or what they were. And... Um, and, and when they... Uh, and, and when they... We're trying to think of a new name. Albert Bouchard mentioned that he had a name called Knife Wielding Bastards. Uh, <laughs> I believe that's the name that he said in the interview for the band, which um, we're glad he didn't go with that. But so they, they, Perlman and Krugman, I think, went into a room and Krugman a little bit more the engineer and, and Perlman a little bit more um, like, the, you know, the poet writer for them. And uh, and they came out and they, they basically took the name of a song that they'd written that's called Blue Oyster Cult. And that song is this song, and it's subhuman. And later on, Imaginos, it's called Lewis the Cult again. So that song, I think, is the first, like, really, like, Baby I Star was like, man, Bloom is, Bloom is really excellent as a vocalist. And subhuman, you're getting the vibrato, you're getting, oh, these are the reasons that he's kind of, like, filling a spot, like, a little bit closer to, like, a Dio kind of guy, like, the control. Um, it's, it's a great song. Uh, one of one of a bunch of songs where there's a better live version of it than than this studio version, but that thing is it is um, you know ladies fish and gentlemen like meet me in the blue sky van and meet me by the sea that shit is so good uh, and then you get dominant to submission so I told you my beginning getting into this band was the extraterrestrial live album which has Bloom singing dominant to submission and. I'm a huge fan of Bloom. I'm a fan of all the people in this band. In general, I don't like his shoutier versions of the Albert Bouchard songs. And so I heard this later and heard Albert Bouchard singing it and actually saw Albert Bouchard sing it when he's playing with Ross the Boss from Man of War at a club. And that was a fantastic live experience. Uh, and uh, so much character, so much character to Albert in this. All the sort of stuff, like all of his like, squeaky childlike enthusiasm kind of going through this and and i put it to you sirs uh tell me a better guitar entrance than buck dharma's entrance on this it's like a boy like it is it is like a it is such an incredible entrance note like this crazy bend uh and then he's he's skittering all over the place so those three i completely love me262 i don't care for um Unfortunately, that's a song that became a staple in their live show. So I saw that thing many, many, many times. Albert Bouchard, like a year ago, would do a different version of this song that's actually better. Uh, but I, I just, I, like, th this is just one I don't really care for the refrain too much. And it and it overstays its welcome, kind of trying to sell those ideas. I like some of the syncopation, 
And certainly in some ways, it's a little bit more heavy metal than some of the other things they do. And then we get to the unholy thing that is KG Creepies. Like, I don't know what that's like. I couldn't tell you at all what this thing's about. Insane, some insane dude, like, being chased around by the neighbor's cats. Well, it's so lonely in the state of Maine. That, that's pretty puzzling stuff. Uh, that song is great. And, and if someone um, if someone were to say, like, play me a song that shows you the Albert, the Albert Bouchard quirk as a lead singer and as a songwriter, that's the first one I'd reach for. It's not his best song. He has a bunch of other songs that are better. But, man, is that strange. Uh, then you get to Carter Servais, which uh, I also don't care for and also was a part of their live show forever. Uh, I just I just don't like the refrain. I think the riff is kind of mundane. Uh, not really into it. Then you get Flaming Telepaths, which is superb. The synth entrance when Lanier comes in with that synth, like that stuff is incredible. Um, uh, and then we end with Astronomy, which is their first masterpiece. Uh, and I'm very stingy with the word masterpiece. I differentiate excellent and very good and good. And this band has made a ton of very good and excellent uh, and great songs at this point. But Astronomy, closing out this album, written by Joe Bouchard, uh, Albert Bouchard, and Sandy Perlman. So, again, this is one of the – Joe is coming in, writing less, and he is he is leading off uh, in terms of giving you uh, uh, Astronomy. And this song is one of the best songs ever written and incredibly emotional – couldn't really tell you so much what it's about, but that break, when they have the break and then you hear the guitar, the ding, 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 and then the, and then the, it's, it's maybe it's Rhodes at that point, or maybe it's Hammond, but the, all the organ stuff that's, that's going. And there are a lot of live versions of this thing that are good. I don't like any of them as much as this original recording because in the live versions, they tended to um, do a ramping up into that end section. And I think it's better to just slam into it, astronomy, and just have the and, and just let the horses loose. And it is incredible. It's one of the high points in music history. Um, the song has has put tears in my eyes many, many times. Uh, and it was great when I was seeing BOC in the '90s when they could really outperform the studio stuff, even though they had that extended part and it wasn't the arrangement I liked as much. And Bloom could just out sing in his old parts. And Buck could outplay his old parts. And Bobby Rondinelli's coming up with incredibly tasty shit. And Alan Lanier was fantastic. So, um, yeah, that's their first masterpiece. And, again, like, I'm stingy with that term. This band has five masterpieces um, for me, and, and that is one of them. And I love this album. For a long time, it was my favorite of theirs, but it is it is my, my second favorite. All right. Hey, question. Do you know why um – they had uh, Buck Dharma sing that song when they redid it in the eighties. I don't, I don't know the answer, but I will be talking at length about that incredible remix. All right, because <laughs> because with Albert, it's like if he's not in the band anymore, well then yeah, someone else has to take over the vocals on the song. But in that case, I never really, I mean, aside from the fact that it's a really from the ground up a reinterpretation. It's of the a song. reinterpretation. Like, and having a different singer just reinforces that a little bit more, even. It changes the color of it a little bit in a different way, again, you know, on top of all the other changes. But other than that, you know, which is just sort of the obvious, you know, I was wondering, I, I don't know if there's a story or. I don't, I don't know. I know some stories about Imaginos, and we, I got so much say on Imaginos. Let me just save it for Imaginos. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, here's my copy. I actually, so didn't rank, Zoller, you didn't rank that. Did I miss it? If you did, oh, no, it's, it's, no, it's, yeah, it's number two. Number two. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that. All right. Well, this is my number one. I'll just come out with it. I, there are other ones that have sort of challenged it from time to time, but this is the one that I always come back to. Um, so the first thing I notice is that maybe not the very first thing, but one of the first things I notice is that it seems like Patty Smith's lyrics are the really evil ones. <laughs> like when they're like, when they're like, like, you know, cause I sort of mentioned like sort of implied violence thing they seem to have going on. Patty Smith seems to do that. Like no one else in this fucking band, not only on this record, but on uh, agents of fortune too. And that's just off the top of my head. So that's all awesome shit. Um, 
Yeah, the subhuman was a song that it took me a while to get around to, or to sort of get to get my head around, really. But it's one of those just sort of unfolds. It's one of the ones that keeps me coming back to it. You know, I don't know if I can add a whole lot more on top of what Craig just said. So I'll just jump ahead and say that I think ME two sixty two is fantastic. Dominance and submission, I mean, is great. But when I get tired of this record, need to put it away for a couple of weeks before I'm ready to hear it again. It's that tends to be the song it's on the basis of is dominance and submission. You know what I mean? Especially when you've heard a few different live versions where they drag that part out. It can get a little boring, but um, but I still think it's a great song. Um, KG Cretans is definitely sort of the weirdest one on here. I would say I like, I like how punchy and memorable that one is, though. I, I think that's a really KG. What you got? <laughs> what you got there, dummy? <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of has that weird rhythmic thing going on in a similar way as telescopes, though, too, doesn't it? Where it's not really it kind of resists ta you tapping your foot, you know? Harvester of Eyes is another one, too. And that's that's actually another one that I've sort of gone back and forth on. You know, when I first got into this record, I didn't really think much of that song. But I really kind of came around on it a lot. It's become sort of a favorite. Like, that's sort of the first step in the build-up to astronomy on this record for me, right? I mean, it's really, the, it's really the whole record, okay? But, like... When Harvester of Eyes comes on, it's okay. Now we're sort of, we're, we're, this is the final push here. You know what I mean? And I've said it before, but I'll say it again. I think Flaming Telepaths is the best, second best song on any, or second last song on any record. Because it's just perfect. It feels like it sort of brings every, it, it takes everything that's gone on on the album to that point. It sort of summarizes it and then leaves it open to be picked up by astronomy with that sort of um, pedal note on the piano in the middle. There it might be a synth, actually, but the piano sound that sort of connects the two songs on the album. So, yeah, all of side two on this is just one, like, big crescendo to... And, and it's a crescendo that builds up to the song that's actually the softest and sort of the most subdued on the album side. You know, I mean, obviously it's not. There's a ton of shit going on. There are loud parts in that too. There's a lot of contrast, right? But it's also the one that sort of has the slowest lead and is the most sort of thoughtful and pensive that way. And uh, the whole thing's built up to it. I just think it's genius, pure genius. Aaron, what what do you think? I, I've always wondered the, um, uh, and I, I I think, I don't know if it's, it's a rim shot and a hi-hat, but the, the kind of the intro when, when they're playing, like, you know, the, there's the lyric, you know, the clock strikes 12 and moon drops in and, and they make the drums kind of sound like a ticking clock. And I don't know if it's just verb or if there's something else in the mix there. But you talk about the whole thing is it builds, it builds, it builds and then it has yeah. this quiet thing. And then there's the and I feel like that's sort of marking the time like a clock would and the way they process his drums. There's another song or two where they do that. But I don't know. Is that just is that just verb or you think there's something else in there? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Um, oh, there was another thing I just thought of, though, and I just forgot it. That doesn't matter. <laughs> so that was your number one. Okay. That's my number one, yeah. It almost feels like an obvious one, you know. It, maybe it'd be a, you know, it might be better for my reputation if I pick Club Ninja or something contrary <laughs> like that. But no, it's Secret Trees. All right. Alan. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. You talk about more than I do, but a lot of times the very best records really are the or by specific bands really are the ones that have the biggest reputations. It's not always the case, but sometimes it is. Okay, Alan. All right, folks have had very good takes on this album. You know, it's definitely a fan favorite album, and yeah, uh, KG Creeding. So nobody seems to have any clue what that one's about. A big thing with Blue Oyster Cult, of course, is there's all kinds of weird, hidden, poetic meanings in their lyrics. It's something that fans love digging through. And it's something I did as I've you know, worked my way through their catalog in the past couple of years, as I've tried to go to different websites and figure out what some of it means. I pay more attention to lyrics than some folks do. And so having all these weird lyrics, it's like, what is exactly going on here? Poetic interpretation was never my strong suit in English class. And, you know, for some of the songs, they're kind of obvious. Some of the songs you read through, you know, different comments people have left on discords and whatnot. It's like, okay, that makes perfect sense now. I have yet to see any really convincing post about what the hell KG Cretans is about. Most of the comments seem to just be, 
yeah, we got no fucking clue what this is about. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, beyond that, this one has several fantastic songs on it. Uh, now, I'm with Aaron on ME262. I do like that song quite a bit. Um, I like you know what's funny about that. I'm sorry to interrupt oh, you, but no, go right ahead. like if I were going to compare that to another song off the first three albums, it'd probably be the red and the black. I could see that. Craig got excited about. I got less excited about, but I got excited about um, ME two sixty two, and Craig got less excited about it. No, I can see that. But there's something um, there for everyone. You see, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all hate it differently. I don't, I don't dislike it, but but my whatever low level I enjoyed it certainly has gone down. Seeing that one probably twenty four of the twenty six times I saw them live, like they always play it, and it is beloved. I'm not in like I'm in the minority. Of of not being a fan of that song, and, Dude, and I don't see why. Those are both con those are both staples. Partly because Bloom could sing them really well, and there's there are good lighting cues that can go with both of those songs. But uh, just not you know not for me. Give me give me Fleming Telepaths, which no, they all. I'm really happy we're disagreeing on so much here because it gives me new shit to listen to next time I play these records. <laughs> like that Budgie thing Alan came up with. I'm not kidding. I'm going to be listening for that because I have not heard Budgie in Blue Oyster Club. I'm going to be listening for it next time. You better believe it. Good deal. And, and it's that much more fun when it's a band I know so well. You know what I mean? If it's a record I've heard twice and Alan says, oh, have you heard this? It's like, oh, well, maybe not. But here's like, I know exactly how these songs go, but I still haven't heard something. So now I'm intrigued. Yeah. You and I are good at doing that to each other. I had to go back and replay, you know, parts of Burn after, uh, you know, the stream a week or two ago. And it's like, yeah, Fools is one of those songs that just never had fully sunk in and uh, bad on me and good on you for pointing it out. Yeah. Uh, but oh, let's see, getting back on track here. Other stuff I wanted to mention. Uh, yeah, Subhuman is pretty cool. It's another one that's got a little bit of kind of more of a throwback 60s garage sound to it. And yeah, I think it's the first time lyrically they used some of Sandy Perlman's Imaginos uh, poem as the actual lyrics. I might be mistaken, and there was something on the first two albums. But that one is yeah, definitely you know from the Imaginos epic that, of course, you know was meant to be his sort of magnum opus. Uh, with Career of Evil, folks commented on that one. Yeah, Patti Smith, you know, lyrical contribution. I've never been a big Patti Smith fan. You know, those goddamn horses died for someone's sins, but not mine. Dude, I hate uh, I, I cannot listen to that album. I just yeah, cannot fuck get horses. <laughs> I cannot get horses through that album. Horses are stupid. <laughs> I have tried several times to get through that horses album, and I just can't do it. I but, kind of um, with Brady of Ethiopia, but I've always thought horses was kind of a turd. Yeah, it just doesn't work for me. I'm but, saying fuck um, real horses because I'm not a big fan of them either. Anyway, go ahead. Th this is not a bestiality <laughs> podcast. So uh, <clears throat> this is a family friendly <laughs> podcast. Uh, so we're not going there. But uh, but yeah, still career review. She does good some good lyrics for uh, some of the Blue Oyster Cult songs. Career review is pretty good. It's not my favorite set of lyrics she contributed. We'll get to that later. Uh, but yeah, side two then has, um, you know, it, it is kind of funny when Flaming Telepaths has to be the second best song on an album. That's just kind of messed up, but, you know, it leads into astronomy. And as y'all have mentioned, astronomy is mammoth. Um, it's one of those tracks most bands would kill to write one song that good in their entire career. And, uh, you know, Blue Oyster Cult had already nailed it on album number three. So, yeah, very good album nothing on here that i don't like i think i'm with aaron that you know if there's a song i get a little tired of after i've played the album a couple of times it is dominance and submission where i'm tempted to start hitting that skip button and that tells me it's like yeah okay i've probably played this one a handful it's, it's time to move on to maybe another album at that point not a bad song at all it's just one of the songs that wears thin faster than the other tracks on here all of that said I'm going to rank this one number three in the catalog. It could be a little higher. This is one of the albums I have not played as much as some of the others. It's the one of the early albums that never did show up in the used bin. So I haven't heard it quite as much as, you know, the uh, other stuff from the first half of their career, but even, you know, having heard it relatively fewer times, it's, you know, easily a top three type of album and has three fantastic songs with, uh, again, for me personally, ME262, Flaming Telepaths, and Astronomy. All right, Marty, bring us on home on Secret Treaties. All right. This is my number one. This is all right. Whoop. Let's get the right way here, Vanna. <laughs> um, easily one of their albums that has the most songs that I really like on it. Career, I mean, first, let's talk about the production. Distortion List Guitar, it gives it a weird flower power 70s 
energy and air, um, it gives it that vibe, but they make subversive rock songs out of it to their triumph. Um, Career of Evil, Dominant Submission. I really like the memorable, punchy nature of KG Cretans. Flaming Telepaths, Astronomy, which later on in their career gets the, the Metallica treatment. Obviously, Metallica is one of those bands right now that is on everybody's mind and all over the internet because they just released a new album or they released a new single. I remember reading a Diamond Head um, interview where the guy said that Metallica saved their career, gave them a shot, a much needed shot of money with the royalties. And I think I saw something similar with BOC where the uh, royalties they get off of uh, Metallica's cover astronomy really helped the band continue forward. But um, so that's great. You know, a band like Metallica, which in a lot of ways exceeded these bands popularity <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, is given life to their influences and keeping them going. But to me, this other than the really weird production, it's a very, there's hardly any distortion on these guitars. It's really weird to me. Um, but they write such crafty hook laden, quirky songs that really stick. I keep coming back to this one. This is my favorite. Absolutely. hundred percent, which, um, brings us to a yeah. oh, one quick thing there, Marty, cause you have yeah. mentioned it. Yeah. They have, you know, kind of a different guitar sound. And something I've thought about and noticed over the years, whenever I read you know interviews or summaries of later heavy metal bands, you know stuff like you know new wave of British heavy metal and early '80s era, you know the question of course is always you know what bands were you influenced by, who were your favorites, and Blue Oyster Cult is a band that very ever rarely gets mentioned in that list. You know there are lots of them who are Blue Oyster Cult fans. But it's not a band that ever gets listed as a huge influence on heavy metal from later years. Whenever that question comes up, you know, it's always some combination of the same six bands. You know, Priest and Zeppelin, Purple, Sabbath, and, uh, you know, maybe UFO and Thin Lizzy. You know, Blue Oyster Cult at best is seventh on that influences list. And just, it always strikes me that you never see their name thrown out there when you know bands were given the chance to say you know who you're really inspired by you know when you ask them maybe specifically about they're like oh yeah great band lots of cool stuff but uh yeah just you know their different approach to playing not using the distortion and such yeah, you know, they really don't seem to you know have you know, as much of a direct link to inspiring you know that you know next group of bands to go in a really heavy direction necessarily Sure. Well, I think also worth pointing out is you look at metal bands and how many metal bands do you see that have um, five people singing, four lead vocalists. Yes. So that's an approach I would love to see more often. I mean, this is something that makes Kiss very special for me. This is yep. a reason I'm a Doobie Brothers fan, and I like the Beach Boys, and I like the Eagles. And yeah, like having having different having different vocalists is really nice and uh, really fills out the sound. I mean, I you know like. All the time I see, you know, like I saw that that carcass obituary show was like they were in support of Amon Amarth. And, you know, they're like, a, it's like a giant spectacle. And I'm like, you got like these four other dudes. Why don't some of them do some backing vocals and make this sound better? Like they're mm -hmm. just playing guitar, like, like just do some like chanted growl backing vocals. Like I think that's a lesson that could be taken. But there are a lot of really sweet harmonies in Blue Oyster Cult that have nothing to do with what people think of it, you know, traditionally in the heavy metal space. So I, 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 yeah. I think they are appreciated more than a direct influence on a lot of these bands, though. I have seen a, a Hetfield quote where he said that they were, that they were influential mm -hmm. on them. And, you know, if you look at that Iced Earth covers album, I think has like two Blue Oyster Cult songs on it. Mm -hmm. Maybe Cities on Flame and uh, maybe Burning For You or whatever. But like, it, it, they, they pop up, but it's, it's, and also a lot of their stuff is complex. Like if you are a metal band covering them and you're a metal band with one singer, like good luck with Golden Age of Leather. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they, you're, those are good points, Craig. And yeah, they, a lot of their songs would be hard for other metal bands to emulate because their songs are too smart for the bands that just want to do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right. But their songs are also too mainstream, maybe for, you know, bands yeah. that are trying to be, you know, you know, brutal and, you know, really crush it and right. bang it out or something. So, yeah, it would be they, they would be a tough act to emulate for a lot of metal bands. You're absolutely right. All right. Which brings us to their fourth album, 1976 is Agents of Fortune. 
let, uh, let me say uh, in when when we had a discussion prior to this, um, the metal theologian had had brought up the idea of oh. discussing some of this live stuff. Do we want to do we want to keep doing it? That looking at the at the like roughly fifteen hour broadcast we're now looking at. <laughs> I, can, I mean, I can go, I can go do real quickly and not do a play by play and and do this and then leap into the album or we can uh, whatever you, you guys go want to do. Go ahead, go ahead. Let's just so do I, let's do I, a I quick overview on the live okay. ones because so, yeah, they are worth um, mentioning for sure. Yeah, uh, okay, talk for me. I'll be right this, back. This album, this album for me, uh, it has songs that are better than the studio, and that's one of the things I love so much about Blue Oyster Cult. The Subhuman, this version is uh, is incredible. Last Days of May, this version is incredible. Cities on Flame, this version is incredible. Seven Screaming Dizbusters, like the Subhuman, actually. This version is better. It's better than the studio version. Now, um, the the uh, 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 this is my favorite of the live albums, but this does end with the Ma uh, Maserati GT, I Ain't Got You song, and Born to be Wild, which uh, they do an okay enough job with that. Um, there's also ME262. Like, the song selection is not my favorite. Uh, this is probably the first place where anyone could get on record outside of a bootleg. Um, a Bucks Boogie, which is a live staple and something they did probably every time I saw them um, or, or close to it, if, if not every every single time. And uh, so there's good stuff on here. And as I said, like the subhuman really becomes more substantial in this version and so did last days of may does as well uh and seven screaming Dizbusters busters to me is better even though it gets into the playful stuff the hey lou uh uh but there's a there's a countdown it's a two three four and then they have this crazy descending run um from uh from buck that leads you into almost like an astronomy level explosion of excitement and really good musical ideas uh, so Seven Screaming Diz Busters went from a song that I thought uh, really lost its way in the studio version to something I really like in this version. And the Subhuman is also superior. So, so a lot of reasons I love Blue Oyster Cult, but one of the reasons is uh, oftentimes they made their songs better when they played them live. Um, do other? Do you want to comment on the live things, or should I roll into Agents of Fortune? How? What are we looking at? Aaron, I think you had some stuff maybe you wanted to... Ed or oops, did we lose? Aaron has wandered off for the moment. I think Aaron's got a few things he wants to say. Yeah, I'll jump in on the live one real quick. Okay, yeah, please um, do. <coughs> yeah, excuse me. I was listening on my phone and I was six seconds behind while I was doing that. So no worries. <coughs> hey, also I gotta say, I've never done this before, but I didn't want to miss out on anything that was being discussed. So I had I was listening on my phone and I had it on the vanity while I was doing my thing. <coughs> and it's weird to see your own camera live while you're using the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> it'd been even weirder if you were still sitting in the chair while you were in the other room that would have been a fucking <laughs> double check just to make sure i was like i know it's on my laptop i wouldn't be here but like the stakes are kind of high i'm still gonna make sure i'm not on a joke on you <laughs> so one thing about this record it's funny we were just talking about metallica because one thing you know i had my ups and downs with metallica like a lot of their fans right i mean i haven't really paid a whole lot of attention in a long time but one thing they were always good at was picking covers. And you really see that when you compare what they were the songs they were picking to cover with the songs that like Anthrax was picking to cover. I mean, night and day as far as the song selection quality, right? Well, unfortunately, I think Blue Oyster Cult falls pretty firmly into the Anthrax camp on that front. Because I really don't need to hear them do Born to be Wild. And as much as I love them and as many times I've played this, and in spite of the fact that Blue Oyster Cult has done more to get me to like that song again, than any other band, including Steppenwolf, since I was like 17 and originally got sick of that song, you know? So like as much slack as I can possibly cut them, I still rarely play side four of this record because Born to be Wild is just a culmination of shit that really, that Maserati GT, I ain't got you shit already is, you know? It's just, it bums me out. Same deal with Roadhouse Blues, although I guess it's been long, I have more distance from the doors psychologically that, that Roadhouse Blues doesn't spoil uh, ET Live for me the way this does on here. But this is like, I mean, I still love this record. I've played it a lot, but that's that's really kind of a bummer, that whole. I, I, let me point out, just a brief aside, um, they did a studio recording of Born to be Wild that was a B-side for something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm 
I'm not sure. It might have been Secret Treaties era. And that actually has a bunch of interesting other ideas. Like that version of the song is pretty interesting. It's not this live version or any of the other live versions I've heard. But there is a studio take of them doing Born to be Wild where they start bringing in all this pretty cool organ. And I'm fine. Like, I think that song is fine. Like, I like, I'm, I'm you know. That's, that's still, that's like, that's like Judas Priest doing, or no, it's like Black Sabbath doing a Grand Funk cover. Yeah. No, I'm, 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 I'm with I, I don't, I don't, are better. I do, I, I do not want it. I, I agree. But there is a more interesting studio version uh, if you start, uh, you know, hunting in the corners as I have for years. Yeah. That's what I thought I was doing when I bought uh, mirrors, but. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get the mirrors jab. Anybody else have anything to add to the live album, or are we moving on? I'll for for thirty second take. Yeah, cool live album. Uh, Aaron, in their defense, they were probably contract not only contractually obligated to play Born to Be Wild. You know, given their uh, you know reputation with you know, the biker crowd as sort of you know one of their favorite bands. If they didn't play that song those guys would have just, you know, ridden the motorcycles directly on stage and decapitated them, you know, Altamont style in, in person. So they probably had to play the song just to survive. <laughs> That's they rock roll, uh, yeah. They, they probably weren't given a choice given, you know, who was in their audience at the time. So it's like, play the fucking song or we come up there and we fucking knife you. So <laughs> That's uh, fucking funny image. You may be onto something. I, I, yeah. It always struck me as a little funny. This band, you know, had such a big biker following because as we've discussed, they weren't the heaviest thing going and you know they've got this you know very obtuse thinking man's rock music vibe going on which you wouldn't necessarily immediately associate you know with you know the hell's angels type crowd but uh, there was obviously a connection that you know, clicked pretty strongly but anyway yeah i'm not going to hold us up on this one so uh yeah let's move on to the next studio album please so agents of fortune um, obviously a, a huge seller for them. I'm going to assume this is their best-selling album, but those are the kind of stats I just actually don't know. Like, I know Fire of Unknown Origin did, did well, but I'm assuming that this this was their best-selling album. And actually, to just kind of go a little bit on the whole Steppenwolf idea, like, uh, I, I obviously I adore this band. If I have one overriding criticism... Um, and, and you'll hear this come up in, in, in a bunch of different in, in a bunch of different things, including when I talk about um, uh, songs on, on this album and this ain't the summer of love is a little bit this, this sort of thing. But is there is when they put out um, kind of the Steppenwolf thing and there's like a toughness. And when Eric Bloom, I think Eric Bloom is an incredible singer. He's written many of my favorite songs ever. I do not like his shouting for the most part. And that's something that happens sometimes in the live show. As I said, like I never enjoyed him doing Cities on Flame or Dominance of Submission the same way because he would add in all that shouting. Uh, and and I and I think like I'm like when I hear them do Born to Be Wild, I'm like it, maybe in his ears he is when his when he's shouting, he's thinking he sounds like or other people think he sounds like John Kay of Steppenwolf because that's that kind of sound. Heavy metal thunder, like that whole thing. Um, but I just don't I like. It sounds good when John K does it, and I don't really like Steppenwolf. But I, I like his voice Wolf, when he, what? I hate Steppenwolf. Yeah, like I don't. I don't like Suki Suki Su. I like. I was always expected to like, and I was like, these fucking songs suck. They suck. And yeah, the first time I saw BOC was the double bill with Steppenwolf. So I think that that's there. Like, and I don't know if it was. Blue Oyster Cult's idea, or Perlman's idea, or Krugman, or, or Columbia, or whose idea it was that a side of this band was a little bit Steppenwolf. But I think that that was, you know, you talk about appealing to the biker crowd. I think that's there. And um, so I think get, that tracks with Perlman, too. What's up? I think that tracks with Perlman, too. It, 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 could, it could. Not like that's implausible, what you're laying out there. Not at all. Um, uh, summer. Of, so this this album have a complex relationship, and I really didn't like it for a very long time. Uh, and uh, this one, I, I mean, it was probably like 15 years ago where I really came around on this, and I used to like kind of put it uh, towards the bottom of of the list. Uh, and and there's then there there are reasons why. I mean, I I rate this one six now, so this one has gone up considerably for me over time. But this ain't the summer of love. There's a weird, like, I don't like the chorus. It's dreary. 
A lot of the stuff that BOC does I don't like either because it has a dreariness that I don't like with the harmony uh, or it is um, or it's shouty. Like that's a lot of like a lot of the stuff where, where I don't care for what they're doing. There's a weird double super deep voice that's going along. Anybody on the outside. Like I do not like that. It's like novelty stuff. I guess Axl Rose is pulling it off better later later on, but don't like it there. I don't really care for this song. Uh, True Confessions is really some words, dude. <laughs> There's some words coming, dude. Go ahead, keep going. <laughs> uh, true, True Confessions. So this is Alan Lanier singing. I thought for a very long time this was this was Albert Bouchard kind of restrained. Um, this song, I remember once like having an argument that this band was metal, and I, I you know I now would not classify this as a metal band. They have metal songs, they have hard rock songs, they have things that are neither metal nor hard rock. But I was I was having a discussion with Hefe, and he just started singing "True, True Confessions," which is certainly not <laughs> at all. It's like not it's not hard rock; it's borderline rock. Uh, but I enjoy the song. Um, uh, so that's that's those two cuts. Then we get um, a little known song, "Don't Fear the Reaper." And what I'll say about this song, I exactly. Um, the metal theologians experience with this. I never, like, I always thought it was pretty good and it was on the radio and it wasn't until I got into the band that I just started seeing how beautiful this thing was. Yeah. Amazing song. <clears throat> and, and I remember one of the first interviews I ever did for metal maniacs was with Carl Sanders and, uh, of Nile. And he, one of the, he actually wrote me a really kind letter when I was doing my fanzine and it was, we were talking a lot about Blue Oyster Cult and he, in in that interview, he's like, Man, I would be really proud if I came up with that whole middle section of of yeah. Don't the Reaper. And I think the song is very good. That middle section is excellent. That that guitar and like Middle Eastern kind of stuff that's going on. That that's that's really beautiful. And 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 obviously there's the running joke with the percussion of that song. But for me, there's a there's a there is an essential percussion element to that song, and it isn't the cowbell. It's the double crashes that when they get to the final course, the and anytime I saw them and the drummer didn't do that, I'm like, what are you doing? You need to do that. That's more important than the cowbell. Like those crashes need to happen. It's part of the crescendo is where this song goes. Um, so that's a very, very good song. Um, I will again, probably take maybe be the only one. I don't care for extraterrestrial intelligence very much. Um, I, like it's a little too jokey. Come here. There's more. Bum, 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 bum. It's it's okay. It's a little bit more leaning towards where they would go on Cultosaurus in a more overtly metal direction. So in terms of why this album took a long time to grow on me, this ain't the summer of love I don't really care for. True Confessions took a while for me to come around. On. Don't Fear the Reaper I've heard a trillion times. And ETI didn't really care. And then for me, the album really kind of begins in terms of, of like the magic that took me a while to see. You get Revenge of you Basically, it becomes like the Bouchard party. Um, you get Revenge of Vera Gemini. Oh, that's I got hated that fucking song. <laughs> Patty Smith, man. With the Patty Smith, and and it, is, it is gorgeous. It is certainly their most like like sensuous song in some ways, and it is just a seductive song. Um, and then you get the uh, like sinful love where you're getting like their kind of delirious take on like, on like on like fifties piano stuff, the here, like I love you like sin, but it won't be your pigeon. And then like the the <laughs> um, the, the, the harmony, your otter. I'm sure he hates the shit out of this. Oh, I fucking hate this record, bro. Anyway, yeah, no, no, I know. and I said like this album of all their albums is one that took me the longest time to get into, and it's now you know ranked pretty highly for me. But that all that like all those rising harmonies and um. I love you like sinful love, and then the da, 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 it's it's fantastic. Uh, Tattoo Vampire, which I saw Albert Bouchard and, and Ross the Boss do, um, with with Albert doing the vocals. I, this is just this is a puzzling tune. It almost like I, I feel with the beat and the <laughs> that's in the mix. It almost feels like an industrial, like it almost feels like it's like a ministry prototype. It's a strange tune. The um the 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 riff like the processing on the vocals and like just to emulate his Chinese breasts like that's I don't there's stuff there like maniacal laughs going on that are swirling all over the mix. This song is a bizarre puzzle and I love it. It is 
it is them really uh like really at the at the top of their craziness and um uh then you have morning final which is my favorite song on the album and and that song uh probably puts tears in my eyes every time i hear it i just think it's a gorgeous song uh i heard a live version of it once uh, I never saw them play it. This is Joe Bouchard wrote it and, and sings it. And he wrote it after like someone was like murdered, so, like right near a place where he was living. And it really is impassioned. And there's something with Joe Bouchard's lead vocals where there is like a there is like a like a simmering anger in there that is really like whereas like I feel with Bloom, you're getting a, like a performative anger, like uh, like a Dio. You're getting a dramatic anger, like an actor giving you the anger. And with Joe Bouchard in this cut, like there, it's it, the the it's the 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 chorus is absolutely um, gorgeous. The oh baby, don't you make it feel so bad? All that stuff, and there's just a lot of pain there. But that like down the subway steps, and to me, he he sounds better in terms of getting rough than Bloom does. And that is just a gorgeous song. It also has some really nice world building. When you get the guy, um, and it sounds like Eric Bloom kind of pitched up the paper, 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 mister. And you're getting a sense of like the subway and the, and the, and the environment where the song happens. I heard a live version that was apparently on the King Biscuit Flower Hour. And the, the irritating announcer comes in in the outro. But there's an extended piano outro. That live version of this song is their sixth masterpiece. But I don't, I don't even know where that can be found. I heard this thing a few times. I might have it somewhere buried in a stack. Um, but that, that's, I would say, like I said, this is a band with five masterpieces, but that live version of it's incredible. Uh, then you get Tenderloin with some really weird synth stuff. And Alan, it's, I think that's Alan Lanier wrote that one, if I am. Yes. Uh, I enjoy that. And Debbie Denise, uh, Marty's got to hate the shit out of that one. Uh, and that, that one is, that one I feel like in a way is like the song of the, is, is there, is like an autobiographical song. It's Bouchard and Patti Smith again. It just feels like this is the song about being in this band and having these experiences all over the, like all over the world and, and like the balance of like going on the road and having a woman, you know, and having like a, like having a girlfriend or wife waiting for you and all this sort of stuff. So it's this sort of glorious, like, dawn of the new beginning at the end of the album and really enjoyable. But, like, I, again, this one took me a long time to get into. And, uh, but it really is kind of like the first four songs have all their different kind of baggage to it. But then it's just like, it, and then it's just like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Like, um, I, I enjoy or love, like, all those songs with, with the highlight being me, for me, Morning Final. Um, and I and I understand if everyone is going to say "Don't Fear the Reaper," that's 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 an incredible tune. But I just it's the morning final is so heartfelt and is just you know a, a, a Joe Bouchard gem. And uh, so that's where number number six for me in their catalog. All right, Aaron, Agents of Fortune. All right, well, I got to stand up for the first half of this album, <clears throat> but um. I don't think I have a whole lot to add for most of the second side, uh, except Debbie Denise, I kind of think is almost like um, a sibling to Redeemed as far as ending the album on a yes. similar sort of positive note. Yeah, well put. It's not as Redeemed is more um, direct, I think, in that regard. Debbie Denise, I think, is more ambiguous. It's not as clear a happy ending, but I think the effect is similar. So, um, yeah, and I love it for that. Sinful Love is one of the ones that I think really starts to point to what they were starting to do on the next couple albums, like the sort of 70s malaise that crept into uh, the next couple albums. But the thing is, that same that same like 70s malaise shit is um, can be awesome at times. You know what I mean? It's like, I hate the Rocky Horror Picture Show soundtrack. Oh my God, I'm going to bring this up. Yeah, yeah. There are things oh, that you can... Oh, yeah. Okay, okay go there. there. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally hear it too. I, I mean, oh, actually, it's all, yeah. Actually, that sound, when, when I'm talking, when I, when I say Blue Oyster Cult, late 70s malaise, that's exactly what I'm thinking of, is that sound. Fucking meatloaf sound from, yeah, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> you're, you're, you're pulling shit out of my brain. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, so, so I hear that. I get that. And that kept me away from this record for a while. Oh, yeah. Okay, like getting <laughs> past that. 
And, and, and that was, it's funny because this was sort of the record in a way that opened up the rest of the band to me. Because once I got my head around this record, then like when I heard some shit on Spectres that I thought was crap, like a lot of it, if you watch some of the earlier videos as I was making my way through the catalog, I, I kind of hated that record actually, but I love it now, of course. Um, but but with that sort of, yeah, I'm, I'm just repeating myself at this point, I think. Um, so so what did it, what got me past that? So first of all, I mean, Don't Fear the Reaper was like just actually listening to that song. You know what I mean? And and, and a lot of that we've really already touched on because like the fourth time the song was coming up in this discussion already. And um, but you know the interchange between the interplay between the vocals. You know what I mean? The way that's handled with the with um, the backing vocals actually being a second voice in the song. You know what I mean? And it's like. I don't know, man. I was kind of depressed when I rediscovered that song. And I was like, this is just one of the most profound things I've ever heard. And that cowbell, by the way, isn't even all that high in the mix. You know, it's like, I get the joke, but like. It's it's recorded. I I, and I I heard an Albert interview. It's recorded on a track with like maybe two other percussion things and like a backing. Like it was yeah. sort of a last minute throw in where, 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 where he did it. But um, yeah. it just cuts. I mean, it's just a. The, the the nature of the percussion you know oh specifically was the um what i was going to say about sinful love I, I had spaced before it was uh for the 70s thing is the sinful love you know what i'm talking about that yeah. i don't know what the words are and then i love you like sin but you know that but i won't be your pigeon what the yeah. fuck yeah. <laughs> well, well, i don't know what the words are i don't care it's the it's the sound of it that move that that type of syncopation was sort of like that little bit of um, a little bit Bowie. That little bit of there was that little bit of groove that was creeping in from the soul music into the rock music. I mm -hmm. think that was like the nod to not necessarily disco as you know per se because I'm sure they would have resented the fuck out of that in '78 or whatever, right? But like sort of the nod to some of the rhythmic things that were happening in that world, if that makes sense at all. It might not. I'm making this up as I go along. So anyway, this ain't the summer of love. I couldn't disagree more. I think it is one of the best album openers fucking ever. Like the way it just starts, like because it starts directly. It's like right into the action. It's like jumping right in. Here, here's a um, corollary. You know the song "Raging Waters" by Testament. Mm -hmm. The first couple of times I saw them live, that was the song they opened with. They just fucking walked out. None of this like slow intro and shit. The third time I saw them, they had a slow intro like what all the metal bands did. And I was kind of disappointed because they came on and be like, okay, one, two, three, four, bang, you know, and they were in, you know, and that's what this does. Only it actually gives itself a tiny little prologue with that little guitar under the, before it goes, boom, boom, boom. And then yeah. him seeing that lower register is weird. It's jarring. And it makes it cool. I can't stand the live versions where he sings it up. And I understand because when you're singing up like around middle C and, you know, between a middle C and a G for an hour and a half, you can't just transition down an octave and be able to sustain those notes. You know what I mean? So he did that in the morning in the studio and it was fine. But the effect of that on the record is just so different. It's like something different. It's something darker and kind of has that menace like sort of more overtly on the surface that was already kind of lurking underneath that surface mud on the first few albums. Let, let, me, like, let, me, let me, let me just make a, a counterpoint because the, the, the verse riff I like the singing is, I think, okay. Why I don't like the song is the chorus. The, I, I just, I, and I don't know if it's too chromatic or what it is, but the kind of up and down, like this ain't the garden of Eden. There ain't no rain in above. Right here. Where does it go? And things ain't what that's not where you expect the, the chord progression to go. They used to be, and this ain't the summer of love, you know. It's right, and yeah, that, that that kind of rising, yeah. But but, but it's, it's, giant. it's sort of built like this, but it's almost an afterthought to the verse. It's like I right. always feel like in that song, the chorus is there because the verse has to go somewhere. That song lives for the verse in a way that not many songs do, yeah. The, ver the verse is far better. Yeah. Uh, True Confessions is fucking awesome, but like, but, but, you know, I, I always talk about shit that's bad. Like, you know, I, I've been kind of on this kick where I'm really into this idea of like bad and good rather than being two sides of a spectrum, being two separate variables. And this one is probably about as bad as they got before like mirrors. 
Um, but it's also really good. You know what I mean? It's like you have to embrace that badness to take in the goodness. And the badness is kind of that funny sort of singing and that sort of weird tone to it. But it's actually all fantastic. I, I mean, I, I don't even feel right comparing it to a song like Going Through the Motions or something like that, which I would call just bad from them. So maybe I'd revise that statement if I were starting over. But I'm going to run with it for now. <laughs> yeah, ETI. Oh my god, dude! I just fucking I do. I play that song so much that like if and if my kids in the room and he hears the opening like well well he says bruh, <laughs> <laughs> right there. like in fact I, I was talking about how there's like the uh, the like there's a chord chord and then the da -da -da -da, the guitar yeah. run in my house it's chord chord bruh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like the for me again? That's one that's hurt by the chorus. Do you like the chorus of that song? Oh, I think it's awesome. I think it's fantastic. I love how it's sort of soaring. And and actually, when you were talking about the yelling before, if I were going to say why I think his yelling is actually awesome, this is one of the songs I would cite as live versions of this one because he basically just abandons the tune on the live versions. I mean, they kind of rearrange the whole thing anyway in a lot of places, like that opening guitar solo on the live versions that isn't on the album. That's fucking brilliant too. But the way it opens on the record also makes sense as it's just a different right. interpretation. So I'm glad they have the other one on the live one. So I have them both, you know, but, um, but yeah, the way, but exactly that sort of contrast, it goes from this sort of yelling sort of punch sort of thing to this sort of soaring. Ah, it's sort of like the sort of this rests, you know, it sort of like spreads itself out a little bit before it comes back down to the focus, you know, sort of the punch, you know, three men in black said, Right. You know, conceptually, cool. I'm with you. The melodies they choose to sing, I'm just not a fan of. But conceptually, I get it. Yeah, no, I think it's absolutely brilliant. And then, and then, as far as Vera Gemini too, uh, that's that's Patty Smith again, right? So, like, yeah. we have like we have Career of Evil, and now we have Vera Gemini. It's like the really fucked up shit Patty Smith seems to be sticking her fingers on. <laughs> like even more than like Sandy Pearlman or whoever else is writing their fucking lyrics, you know. Bouchard is a big teddy bear anyway. Actually, he probably wasn't. <laughs> All right. Are you good, Aaron? Um, yeah, I'm good. I'm just sort of like shuffling shit around. So I don't know if you've given it a ranking yet either. If you did, oh, I missed it's, it. It's number two. Number two. Wow. Oh, oh wow. That, that really just, was... that just well, happened. If 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 I would if I was really into ETI and um and Summer of Love, it would be much higher for me. So yeah. And it sounds like you like all the other stuff. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm not like there, there's nothing that you said that I would disagree with on the negative side. <laughs> but it took me a while to get there. This record had a really long and slow ascent for me, you know, and it was almost song by song, you know, like yeah. sort of didn't go okay. Well, this time I really like Sinful Love, but I'm kind of bored by the time we get around to Tenderloin. But next I'm like, oh, Tattoo Vampire is a fucking banger too, and you know, and then. Debbie Denise clicked it and sort of, sort of grew in from the middle and just became like a yeah. record for me over time. All right, Alan. Agents of Fortune. Agents of Fortune. First thing I have to say, yeah, yeah, sorry to correct you, Craig, but nothing is more important than the cowbell. I've been holding this thing for two damn hours waiting to looks do like this. Looks like you just so bought it, it too, which is even more impressive. It does look I like I did. <laughs> we are now at the point where we are buying props specifically for the stream. So, there, there's uh, no we in this. It's you. <laughs> it's, a it's a royal we. Yeah, Cretan. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's talk some agents of fortune here. Very good points brought up by both Aaron and Craig. Um. I'm much more in line with Aaron on this album overall. I think um, this ain't the summer of love for me. Yeah. is a great opening track. I like the production on this album is really good. It's got a great, clean, clear sound to it, but I like the fact that they opened it with a very heavy rumbling kind of song. Well, and again, the focus, yes, is on the verse more so than the chorus for sure. But yeah, that's, you know, even though this album sounds very slick and, you know, well-produced, they're starting it out with a very heavy rumbly number. Right? And I like that a lot about it. True confessions is a song that's on this album. Oh, I love it. It's it, to me, it, it sounds like it should be like the, you know, soundtrack for some kind of bad early eighties, you know, sitcom or something where they're always like showing the main character, like in goofy poses and freeze frame for a moment. Uh, 
I, I'm I sorry. It sounds like it should be on Alice Cooper Goes to Hell. <laughs> Uh, don't fear the Reaper. Yes, you know it's a watershed moment for you know it's arguably among the best songs of its era or any era. And yes, while it does get played to death, it's one of those songs I will never turn it off when it comes on FM radio. I, I do, it has not worn out its welcome even after nope. hearing it. Lord knows how many times. Oh yeah, I agree. Um, I agree with Aaron on ETI. I really like the chorus, the way it builds. It's very airy. It's got this nice, you know, clean, epic vibe to it. Um, cool song. Like that one a lot. Uh, Revenge of Your Gemini. Yeah, Craig, now that one you described really well. It's got this very sultry vibe to it um, that works quite well. Um, so overall, yeah, the first side is great. Side B, Sinful Love is kind of cool. The big one for me here is Tattoo Vampire. That song is, uh, as I think Aaron said, and Craig, you agreed, it's just a banger of a song. It's so weird. It's got this weird, frenetic energy about it with the vocal distortion and such. Um, that weird vibe. They, 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 just, they just let it rip. And yeah. they haven't necessarily done that on a song on this album. So out of nowhere, all of a sudden, they're just, you know, it's this crazy over-the-top, you know, let's just, you know, really amp it up a bit and it just kind of grabs you by the throat for a couple of minutes and then they move on to something completely different. It's really cool. Um, and yeah, the last three songs, like Aaron said, sometimes I get maybe a little bored as the album starts to wrap up with tenderloin. Debbie Denise is a weird one. Uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of like their version of kisses Beth in terms of the lyrical content, at least it's yeah. The we're on the road, we're partying. There's a girl back home. Um, it's not maybe as poignant as Beth. It's maybe not quite as bright and happy as Redeemed was. So maybe it's somewhere in the middle there. But yeah, overall, it's a very varied album. It's the only album, it looks like, that has every member of the band gets to sing on at least one track. So yeah. that kind of, you know, yeah, really highlights the diversity going on here. And most of it works really well for me. Uh, Aaron went number two on this. I will actually go number one on this. I have it oh, at wow. the top of my uh, Blue Rooster Cult stack. <laughs> what is happening? Again, I do want to. Well, I do want to state, and it's worth repeating. It's probably been an hour and a half since I said it at this point. It, I've heard all their albums in a condensed period of time over the past two to three years, more so than the other rankings we've done. This one has a lot of. Uh, potential to be very fluid over the years. Five years from now, when I've lived with all these albums for a lot more time, this album could slide down a whole bunch of spaces and something else could slide way up. But no, I think it's you know a strong album. It's got um, at, it's got three songs I, I really, really like with just This Ain't the Summer of Love, uh, of course, Don't Fear the Reaper, but also Tattooed Vampire. Uh, those, you know, uh, are at the top of a very strong and very diverse album. So I'll put it number one tonight. And Marty, I think, is going to rank it a little bit lower. Yeah. One thing I want to put with, with Tattooed Vampire, and I actually I meant to mention this when I discussed Flaming Telepaths, like there's a point when Buck landed with this thing of like putting so many different kinds of musical ideas into solos. But like in Tattooed Vampire, some of these things, like it is amazing the, the tasteful, solos that he can just pack in as fills like like he's my favorite guitar lead guitarist of all time um i but i i think like in terms of coming up with guitar fills and memorable musical ideas that are just feeling like a couple of bars or something i think he's unparalleled like there are other lead guitars i could you know like michael shanker neil sean i mentioned i love george lynch i know i love neil young in a in a, in a very different way i love david gilmore richie black um, Blackmore obviously obviously is, is fantastic. But like in terms of the guitar fill, I think that you could probably prove that in like a science lab or in a court of law that Buck Dharma has no has no equals. No, he's all ama he's amazing. All right. So, Marty, bring on the hate. We, we, we can see you hate this album. Let, let's let's go here. You worked at work all week or all day. It's hot, sweaty shop. I can't wait to get home and get to my refrigerator and get that ice cold, refreshing gulp of milk. That would be don't fear the Reaper. That thought in your brain and how refreshing that gulp of ice cold milk is going to be. You get home, you throw after a long day of work, throw open the refrigerator, grab that milk, chug it right out of the gallon. It's curdled cottage cheese, sour fucking milk. That right there is blue oyster cult, the deceiver 
on Agents of Fortune. And let me tell you why. This album I listened to late in the week. I've owned it forever. Um, I bought it for Don't Fear the Reaper, which is a 10 out of 10 song. That song is recorded differently than the rest of the album. It sounds like a different band than the rest of the album. Starting with this record and for a while moving forward, Blue Oyster Cult got into this idea that they were writing rock musical songs for movies that didn't exist until later in their career where they actually did write a rock musical type of soundtrack type of thing that doesn't sound anything like the records that came before it, which is mind blowing to me. And but, then they wrote songs for a musical movie that did exist and they were supposed to be on it, but didn't Right. <laughs> that Rocky horror picture show comes to mind. Meatloaf comes to mind. This is where piano in a, in blue oyster cult turns for me. This is where the piano becomes very show tuny. As far as soundtrack, like I said, these fictitious movie rock doc, uh, rock musicals, this album is full of it, other than Don't Fear the Reaper, the only song that sounds nothing. Can you imagine if this entire album had the same feel as Don't Fear the Reaper, the same darkness? It would have been a fucking killer, dark, twisted, awesome record. Or it would have been a Neil Young album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I've listened to like the Revenge of Vera Gemini with swim like a fish lyrics and then sinful love i love you like sin but won't be your pigeon what the fuck i mean obviously lyrics have always been strange for this band you know the otter is it an otter is it not an otter otter um it just sounds to me like a confused album you know it's a tale of multiple songwriters with differing visions of what boc is the more flamboyant side of the songwriters won out on this one and it and it continued on for many records for after this for me it's talented. I love the solo work on it. I like the vocals on it. It's a weird, clean, dry, but good production. It's just very meatloaf, Rocky Horror Picture Show to me. And I just, I can't hang in that realm. Although I do like some Avantasia. So it's, I don't, I can't, I can't tell you what's right. And Mar Marty froze for me. Did he freeze for you guys? He did. Yeah, he hated this album so much he broke the internet. No, I, I, I think, I think the, I think the internet has just stopped this, abs like this absolutely like insane, insane tinfoil hat diatribe on Agents of Fortune. He is just, yeah. he's just uh, yes. Elon about. Musk has decided that he won't ban most stuff on Twitter, but he will not let Marty continue this conversation on YouTube. <laughs> In, indeed, the, uh, I mean, like you know, I, obviously, I think the meatloaf comparison was enough to just. To just to, to shut him out. Yeah, well, uh, I know what he's talking about because that was the way I responded to this too. Not no, so this is the slowest growing album of all of them for me. He's just earlier in that maturation process, but I don't know he's, that he will ever come around. But like, but like, uh, see, this one, this one kind of did it for me until I until I got past it, and that was kind of the growing thing was me sort of acclimating to that. But um, Specters, I totally had that going on, dude. When I first got Specters. I thought, fucking, are you ready to rock? I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Right. You know, I mean, I guess we're going to be there in just a minute anyway. Uh, should we go for what? Alan, how should we should proceed? Should we wait? Oh, fuck, I'm sorry. My, it's a new computer. It's set. If I don't touch anything, it, it shut off. What? What? I mean, basically what happened is there's like a filter. There's a bullshit filter. And when no. the media comparison happens, it just shuts you down. My computer I, my I, computer knew when to do the mic drop. That's what that was. That was a fucking mic drop moment for by uh, <laughs> poured from the grave from Steve Jobs. You I'm just the YouTube <laughs> algorithm with the meatloaf thing, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mar your shelves are pulled down and, and, like, and like 400 CDs of yours have been stomped on and someone has definitely <laughs> in the corner. It's not me. But it's not I, nothing yeah. to do with the meatloaf comparison that you just made. Yeah. So, uh, Marty, you, Marty, just to one quick uh, thing before you rank it, I th I do I see kind of where, I think where you're coming from, and there is one thing I would recommend. You know, if you want to give this another chance sometime, more cowbell. <laughs> he just has to get more mileage out of that prop he bought. I paid six goddamn dollars for this cowbell today. I'm getting my money's worth out of it tonight, people. It will come back again. Absolutely. I, I, I would I would recommend again like it took me a very long time to come around on this you may never but I would say like the first song that that began the process for me was tattoo vampire 
Just spend yeah. time there. There's another thing that will appeal to the metalhead. And then I'd say, like, after that, it's sort of a toss-up. Like, Morning Finals, my favorite song on the album. But I think I think Tattooed Vampire is the other one you will like if you – even if you just spin it a couple times the next time you're in the mood for BOC. Yeah. That's a good um, idea. Yeah. In all seriousness, that would be the song to start with to try to get your foot in the door a, a little bit. And even if you don't like the rest of the album, I think you will dig Tattooed Vampire if you spin it a few times. It may have gotten lost in the wash being late yeah. in the album. You may have already kind of tuned There's a bunch of stuff that. on there I don't think you're going to like. Like, I don't think you're ever going to think this album is great, but there's, but there's, you'll find stuff on it you enjoy. I mean, having said all, I mean, I, I pretty much made my points and it's a matter of preference. I talented still to this. It's talented record. I just, it's not for me. Um, the only thing keeping this out of the 14 spot was don't fear the Reaper. Other than that, I gave it a 13. It's number 13 on my list all yep. day long. And I don't even feel bad about it because <laughs> it only goes downhill from here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go downhill. There's only 14 albums. I know, I know, but I, I have a lot of similar feelings. But it's funny because I listened to this later in the week, so I, I I had more positive things to say about this direction on later albums. But I got real fucking tired of it by week's end. That's so I said. This week proved to me that I don't have the patience for long term boc exposure. It's got to be the special. Like I'm gonna listen to this record. I'm gonna love it as opposed to all this shit I haven't heard and it's all fucking meatloaf dangling from the nuts of poor dead meatloaf. Right. It's just, uh, it's rough. Anyway. The bomb that might land on your house <laughs> during this broadcast has nothing to do with those meatloaf comparisons. Careful <laughs> opening that next package from Craig. I'm sure it's in like five years actually what you think. Because see, you're saying this now and I'm not going to I've had this record for a decade, bro. It's Oh, dude, I had Cultosaurus erectus for two decades. Yeah, and that's got a lot more meatloafisms. They go even further into that realm, but we're <laughs> oh, going to get I'm there. Gonna, dude, I hate it. Let's, stay, let's stay in order. Let's stay in order. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's not jump ahead. We're, we're going to jump gonna... ahead because we have to talk about specters first. We that's have to right. talk about specters. But, but I'm just saying, 10 years is nothing. Cultosaurus took me 20 years to come around on. So, <laughs> 1977 specters. <laughs> Aaron, here. After 10 years, you didn't come around. Oh, yeah. You just succeeded I mean, to Stockholm Syndrome. I gotta say, the best thing about this record, other than Don't Fear the Reaper, is this lady's helmet hair. <laughs> I mean, that thing is defying that is defying the laws of I mean, can you imagine coming home? I got my hair done. What do you think? Uh okay. It's a helmet. Anyway. I, don't I, fear I, I will also point because you showed that picture of you know with Eric Bloom and the sunglasses. So I've seen them live 26 times. I think one time did I ever see him without sunglasses, and it was just removing it for a moment. I think I've seen his eyes without sunglasses once. When he wipes away the tear, realizing the crappy albums he made sounding oh, like man. meatloaf. <laughs> It'll just be a coincidence with all your terrible anthrax and Liverpool and Testament albums have just been destroyed when I visit next. Craig, I apologize for my co-host. He has been put in time out for a minute to consider what he's done. Uh, <laughs> so, but please, so, please lead us into Spectres while Marty okay. uh, considers his life choices. Okay. So we are. You can. You can. Where, where, where did he go? Oh, no, uh, he's, uh, there he, oh, there he is. So uh, here we are with Spectres, um, 1977. Star Wars came out, and something better than Star Wars came out. Um, this is my favorite album by them, uh, and and has oh. been. Uh, 15 years, maybe maybe longer. Uh, as I said, there were a few, like the first album in Secret Treaties were vying for this spot uh, often. And then it then uh, eventually it, it landed it landed here. Um, uh, I adore this album. And you get all the different flavors and all the different things that Blue Oyster Cult can, can do uh, on this, which isn't to say it's a perfect album. The whole, like, the, just an aside, like the perfect album um, discussion, that list of perfect albums for me is Pink Floyd Animals. End of list. Like, I, there's one album that I can name that I think is every song is a masterpiece, like, at the highest level and couldn't be improved, and it's Pink Floyd's Animals. No other band has ever done it. Like, I've probably heard 4,500, if not 5,000 albums. So, I, like, the, I'm not searching for the perfect album because I believe it has happened once. Coltrane's Love Supreme is pretty damn great. Um, and Marvin gave what's going on, but the there's a bit of a lag in the middle there. But this album is incredible. And this album has two songs that I would call masterpieces and two others that I think are absolutely top form, excellent, just below that level. So 
Uh, I think it's really the album where like every personality gets to shine the most. And um, where like Agent of Fortune is kind of this weird thing. And then I feel it really becomes the Albert Bouchard show plus the highlight that, that Joe Bouchard delivers. Um, this, this album really, I just feel like everyone, everyone is, everyone is contributing uh, vocally uh, in terms of the, the, the in, like playing their instruments, doing all that stuff. So it begins with Godzilla. Uh, that's one of my two least favorite songs on the album. And I like all three. I like all three of their hits. Like I really like Don't Fear the Reaper. I really like uh, Burning For You. And Burning For You regularly is, is much better live. Uh, Godzilla, and, 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 and maybe the metal theologian can speak to this. There's some processing that's going on with the vocals in the verse. And I just don't like it. Uh, there's a weird, and I don't know if it's just the way they've been glued, but it, it's, I don't know. It almost sounds like a, like a pitch shift harmonizer. There's something going on there that I've never liked. Uh, yeah, I, mean, talking about I think it might be multi-tracked actually. I'm not sure though. I don't, I, I'm not an expert on this shit, but it's, it's, it sounds a little bit, it sounds like it's two voices or something like that. It's like not exactly. Yeah, I don't know if that's it or not, though. It, 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 there's a something there's something weird going on that I don't like, and then the chorus I find uh, uh, I find kind of mundane about the oh no, there goes Tokyo, go go Godzilla. That, but this song would be example number one, like number one of a hundred when I say that Buck Dharma has no close competition in terms of who comes up with the greatest guitar fills of all time because. Like these things, like all throughout these verses, it's like he raises the bar of the entire song by those by those ornaments. It's amazing. He he is he, he, is, he can put it in so, so that song is one of my two least favorite on the album. I I enjoy it. I like every song on. I like every song on the album, but that that one, I, I again is is kind of borderline. And then I also just have the baggage of, you know, I've seen them twenty six times live. They did it. I saw Albert Bouchard. We didn't even write this thing, I don't think. I don't think he has any credit on it. It's just Roser. It's just Buck Dharma. Um, and I saw him do it with 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 Ross the Boss from Man of War and put on a giant Godzilla uh, uh, like helmet while he was playing it. So it was, it was kind of charming. It was nice hearing his voice do it, uh, him, him sing it. Uh, then we get to Golden Age of Leather. This is a masterpiece. This song is absolutely unbelievable. This song is... This song... Um, I feel the journey of this song through all of the rising parts. You you know you get the you get the acapella beginning, uh, and then you kind of get this cruising, like biker like biker kind of riff. Uh, but then it's like oh, test night to, and then you get the da, na, 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 na. and then they just they kick up the tempo. You start getting these incredible bass lines. Um, and then it starts turning into this like this glorious other world like sci-fi future apocalypse and all like the all of the all of the vocals and just the way like the like just the, the, the harmony vocals and the way they come in it's it's like like here's a taste of the beach boys here's a taste of like you know heavy metal stuff here sound this sounds like it sounds like priest like it says the red and the black and then you get the -na 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 -na. you get like this like priest thing coming at you. And then you get the, ah, will be, you know, like that whole thing is, is completely like beach boy sound. Um, and, uh, it's like that, that whole part when you get the, the, uh, all the harmony vocals, it's like, they made a vow. And then blue is you like, uh, to give it all they had to give like that whole thing. Like we made a vow to die as we, like that shit is incredible like that's where like you like in terms of an influence like like maybe like blind guardian with all their harmonies was starting to do something like that but like you have this absolutely soulful incredible um bl uh, uh, bloom performance opposite these glorious giant you know buck and bouchard harmony vocals the riffs are great the solos are incredible like the journey of this song like it's how, how long is this song? Like five minutes? It's not that long. Not that long. It's not as long as it feels. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's 5.52. It's 5.52. I swear most albums will not give you the journey through different colors and different places and different emotional states that this one song does. It is a masterpiece. 
if Marty compares this to move to, to if Marty compares this to, to me, I am I am I am off the broadcast and I'm <laughs> over there to murder him. <laughs> this song is a high water mark for music history. It's also a song that I saw them play live and and, and make it better because uh, instead of doing the ultra high the golden age vocals like Buck just sang it in his kind of normal register. Well, I think it sounds nicer, and he was just doing a golden age and i just think it sounds sweeter there with all the harmonies of like full voices incredible masterpiece uh i mean I, I i've made a lot of stuff in my life um songs books uh movies uh comics now i've never done anything that that is as good as this and i don't think i will ever do anything that's as good as this this is just uh, like inspiring as an artist every time i hear this i get chills i can't believe how many great ideas are packed into this song all-time great then you get Death Valley Nights. This is excellent. This is Albert Bouchard, plaintive, quirky, with the ultra lush backdrop. And I'll say this about this album as a whole. We're obviously a couple of stabs at like, you know, rocking like rocking radio stuff and biker stuff. And even though like Golden Age of Leather is like about bikers, it's not a biker tune. Right. Um, this album, a lot of this album just has like, and it's one of the reasons it's my favorite album, in addition to it having two masterpieces is this just has the the lushest, most like gothic atmosphere. And some of it is that the pianos on this album and a lot of these songs are not making honky tonk choices. They are making like decorative um, gothic, like almost like classical uh, elaborations. And Death Valley Nights is beautiful. When I saw them on the 40th anniversary show at which I got this uh, shirt, uh, I believe they said it was the first time they had ever performed it live in Albert. I uh, came up to the front and sang it, and that was a that was an absolute highlight of my life. Then you get um, "Searching for Celine." Um, is this this is Lanier, right? Yeah. So this is a Lanier song. Uh, Lanier brings the funk. He brings the funk a couple of times. Thank and, goodness. <laughs> what you say? I said thank goodness. <laughs> he brings the funk a couple of times. And this is sold, like, at this point, Bloom is moving into, like, the top of his game as a vocalist. And he's having a lot of, he's having a lot of fun with this one. Uh, Fireworks uh, is another lush song with some particularly good uh, synthesizer stuff. Are You Ready to Rock? That took some time to grow on me, that one. It's a fun one, though. It's fun. And, yeah, I know. In co- I mean, it's certainly closer to Kiss than, than many of the tunes. And in college, when, like, we, I, I remember... Uh, uh, like, you know, I'd work on a movie shoot with my uh, my roommate then, Fred Raskin, who's now uh, like a really successful editor. He's Quentin Tarantino's editor. Uh, he cut Fast Five, Guardians of the Galaxy. He's doing really, really well. But when we worked on like student films together, he would uh, like, and I was a cinematographer and he was just working in some other capacity on the on the thing. He would always just like, are you ready to rock? Yes, I am. That was like our, like, we're like ready to shoot. Uh, so I have just those nice memories from like film school days of that. Uh, Celestial the Queen is a, is a is a super pretty another like just really lush thing like like Death Valley Nights and almost as good. And this is a Joe Bouchard thing. And Helen Wheels is also credited here. Uh, going through the motions, not 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 a highlight from this album. Like that one is is the other one with Godzilla where I would I would like the album more if it were gone. It seems to be it's Eric Bloom. And I'm going to assume this is Ian Hunter, maybe of Mop the Hoople. Realistically. Yeah, like let's let's assume that's who it is. I enjoy the song. This was one for a long time I disliked and like, are you ready to rock? Eventually I'm like, I enjoy this. It's the spirit of the album. It kind of sets up, um, you know, the, the, the next two cuts. You have I Love the Night, gorgeous. This is the other excellent, like superb, just below masterpiece level song. I, I, it's 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 great. Like in terms of a what like it's ab- absolutely uh, just a lovely song. And one I prefer to "Don't Fear the Reaper." It's in that same sort of space. Very lush. Uh, I think the atmosphere is better. I like the lines. Again, talking about Blue Oyster Cult live. I saw them live a couple times. They added in a bunch. They added in like a whole new verse. They added in all this material. They had written out a whole new verse and huh. extended solos, and it was and it's just gorgeous. So to me, that's the one where I'm always surprised that like, oh, Godzilla was just a, a single hit. Like you had a hit with Don't Fear the Reaper. To me, I Love the Night is more of the same and better uh, and, I, and, and an easy enough thing for people to kind of catch on to in terms of the premise. Uh, and then we get to, to 
Nosferatu or Nosferatu. <laughs> um, <laughs> the masterpiece, my favorite song by the band, one of my favorite songs ever. Obviously, it's it's an, it, it's. I, I, I think the atmosphere on this couldn't be richer. And this is the band again coming together, that synergy where it is, um, uh, it is absolutely, uh, it's, it's just an unbelievable experience. And you get the, the piano, the da -da 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 -da, like playing those arpeggios or whatever, like really setting the gothic atmosphere. And uh, when the guitar, the lead guitar comes in, that couldn't be more searing. Another like 11 out of 10 Buck Dharma guitar entrance, followed by an 11 out of, out of 10 Buck Dharma solo. Like you can't believe this is happening. But then like Albert Bouchard's drumming for that song. Like I could teach a class on the stuff he's doing. And just like, you know, it's like the morning sun has come too soon. And during that part, you know, Buck, uh, uh, Albert Bouchard is, is like doing snare, crash, snare, crash, snare, crash. And like, just these ways where they're just handing off from vocals to drums to piano, yeah. searing lead guitar. It's absolutely stunning stuff. Uh, and then the, you know, and the riff that comes in the mortal terror reigns and it's like that. It, like the reason that they're in the heavy metal discussion is because of how sinister shit like that is. Like that is a, that is an incredible riff. And uh, that you know that riff is is ranking with with my favorite Sabbath and Priest and all that sort of stuff, and it's a great heavy metal riff that's in the middle of this. They're doing other things like heavy metal is a piece of what they're using. I wouldn't say this is a metal song, but there are metal elements in the in the ambiance is that. So um, you know, like like uh, Spectres has an amazing penultimate ultimate combination, as does this. Like the last the last two, it's like wow, this is unbelievable. But this one also to me has golden age at that same masterpiece level and uh I, I adore this album and it's been my favorite for for i i'd say probably like 15 years or, or so like there's a certain point when i just started like when some of the other ones that had bothered me like are you ready to rock uh and going through the motions uh where i just enjoyed those obviously at a much lower level that's like slipping away on mob rules like I enjoy that tune. Certainly not. It's certainly not "Sign of the Southern Cross," like one of the five best songs ever recorded in the history of the human race. But "Slipping Away" is fun. Um, so, anyways, Spectres, my my favorite by them. Right on, Aaron. All right, well, Spectres. <laughs> um. Okay, so I, I found lots of reasons to like this record, and I, I, I'll side with most of what Craig just said um, on the positive side. Um, we'll, we'll get to some ones where I don't. But, but but starting out, like Godzilla, I'm actually totally on board with. I was just thinking about this today. I like it too. It's so that's such an easy song to hate between the popularity. Just that weird da -da 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 riff. It just I don't know. It's super simple. It just it's weird. I I just dig it. It's good. Riff is great. My complaints are primarily vocal ideas. Yeah, it's yeah. I think it's great, man. And you know something coming from my sort of standpoint with lyrics, where I consider good lyrics gravy. I can really get behind a lyric like he picks up a bus and he throws it back down. <laughs> That's just, I mean, if you're going to write dumb lyrics, I, I mean, <laughs> that's just S tier, you know? You can't it's, beat it's no, I won't be your pigeon, but, you know, it's pretty cool. <laughs> well, but, but, you know, when they're writing, like, really, like, good lyrics, they're really good, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, a lot of the, uh, see, my whole thing with this record is I feel like that sort of 70s malaise kind of puts a shadow over all of it. Because it really hangs out in there. You can hear it in Godzilla, and you can hear it in Are You Ready to Rock? But, like, Godzilla is, like, what you like about hard rock from the second half of the 70s. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah, they're probably doing a little more coke than they ought to have been. But that's still <laughs> a really fucking good song, dude. You know? Um, going Through the Motions is, like... Um, it's like the sort of thing I remember hearing on AM radio when I was a kid that just like wasn't very good. Like uh, I love a rainy night by Eddie Rabbit. Oh, don't even get that in my head. Oh, my That's God. like about the same caliber as uh, going through the motions, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> is that a is that a is that a praise? <laughs> oh no! 
Okay, okay, good. It's like these sort of distant memories that I have of like the first shitty music that I remember hearing in my life sounded a lot like going through the motions. I can sing every word to that song. It was on the radio all the time back in the day. Anyway, go ahead. Um, and another thing about this record that I think is really weird is um, on the other records, there have been two so far where I said there was sort of like kind of a nice song that sort of like closed it out. I sort of feel like with after Are You Ready to Rock, the record goes straight there. I feel like Celestial the Queen and I Love the Night and Nosferatu, they're all great songs, but they all kind of play that role. And so they kind of blur together a little bit for me. And it's not necessarily in an unpleasant way. It's just their distinctive identities don't seem to come across as well because they sort of lump together with that sore thumb in the middle of going through the motions, which is the one I just zone out during, you know? So, so that already makes this record weird. That make this feels like an EP to me almost because almost all of side two is just this weird wind down. So all I'm really left with is a, like, Two rockers. I'll, I'll I'll give them. Are you ready to rock? I'll just overlook its faults. So we have Godzilla. We have that. We have um, the simple song with fireworks and um, sort of the quirkier. Well, you know, so forget that. I'm going to back off what I was about to say about searching for Cillian because that's that's lighter in a way, but in another way, it's not lighter at all. So I'm not going to try and make that argument. But then you have like this big sort of epic in the middle with Golden Age of Leather, you, and you see what I mean, like. By the way, I've, by the way, the record's shaped. That feels like it's this big epic in the middle of the album, even though it's the second song on the record. So there are just all these things about this record, the way it's constructed, that just sort of feel weird and not quite right. And there's a part of me that really respects that. You know what I mean? Like what I the the record that I just described is an unusual record and an interesting record, but not necessarily a record that I think is like great in the same way as some of the other ones, you know? I, I can still listen to this over and over. I mean, I love this record, you know? Uh, the only song that I actually really don't like on here is Going Through the Motions. Everything else I could put on pretty much any time and really enjoy it. But overall, I don't think the whole thing coheres as well. And overall, I just don't think it's up to the standard that they set on earlier albums. So where did I rank this? Um, this is Chromie D's favorite uh, album. Mm. And this one for me is about tied with Club Ninja. So as a little sort of tip of the hat to Chromie D, I gave the edge to Spectres, for which reason it comes in at number nine. Hey, that's yeah, me too. Anyway. Nine out of 11 for me, though, remember. <laughs> right, right, right. All right, Alan. All right. Um, yeah, you guys have covered this one pretty good. It is the album where you start noticing that they're going maybe leaning into the pretty sounds a little bit more and you know, moving a little bit further away from the harder to rock sounds of earlier albums. So I get why this album takes some heat from a lot of people. I, I do see why some people don't enjoy this one. Uh, personally, I do like it. I think it's, I think the good outweighs the bad overall. And even though it's going for, you know, kind of a lighter, more accessible sound in some ways, it's still done very well. And there's still a lot of highlights to it. I like Godzilla. It's a fun song. I think it was smart putting it right at the front of the album. I think it would feel very out of place if it was mixed in somewhere else because yes. it's just, yeah, it doesn't fit with the rest of the album. By, so they get it out of the way first, and that way it doesn't have to fit with the rest of the album so much. Um, Craig gave a great uh, detailed description on Golden Age of Leather. It is a really cool song. That's a good song. Um, I, it does play you know, into you know, one of their strengths. They can build these you know, big, epic songs that feel like 15 minutes worth of you know, storytelling went on, and yeah, the song's less than six minutes. For me, and again, this may be oh, simplifying it or not the best analogy. It feels like you know there's a little bit of a Queen influence or you know a Queen parallel there with these kind of tracks. And I'm not a huge Queen uh, fan. I don't know their stuff inside out, so apologies if that's not the best comparison. Uh, yeah, Death Valley Nights is a cool song. Um, yeah, searching for Celine is fine. Fireworks is fine. Are you ready to rock? Does feel now that one feels a little 
strange they could have opened the album with that and it would have maybe been more intuitive than having it in the middle of the album especially since the songs after it don't necessarily rock that hard <laughs> so it, it feels a little <laughs> odd in the running order it's the kind of song that that's a good idea for the running order I, like I, like i i'm like yeah that like if they if they swap if they if they put that there yeah like i i would prefer that mm-hmm yeah, cool. you know, and while you know it's not their you know deepest song or their most complex song, but it's fun enough. I've got no problems with it. Celestial the Queen, yeah. Now here's another one where they kind of you know are starting to get you know that you know Brian May, Freddie Mercury. Yeah, you know, they're building you know this big, pretty, elegant, and epic sounding track. It just you know sounds like it's being carved out of glass or something, and it just comes together really nice. Going through the motions again, and it, it is kind of a weird hit song for Blue Oyster Cult. It doesn't... I can see where for a lot of Blue Oyster Cult fans, that song feels just too watered down. I don't mind it, but yeah, it is a little bit of an anomaly. And then, yeah, you get the two vampire songs kind of wrapping it up at the end. And I get what, Aaron, I get what you're saying, that they they are kind of similar. And even if backing up to Celestial Queen, that yeah, you kind of get, you know, the nice, pretty, calm, you know, section on side B. But both are very good songs. Um, yeah, I love the night. Like you said, Craig, you know, Bug Dharma is so good at those kind of songs. Just these quiet, smooth, you know, very pretty delivery. Uh, you know, he's outstanding without having to be upfront about it in any way. So, yeah, overall, it's an album I like quite a bit. Um, ranking wise, it was a very hard one for me to place. Uh, I ended up with it ranked seventh. And to be honest, I think it's the one that could probably move up the easiest from the albums in this cluster. I don't think it would ever move down. I think it's a step above everything I've got below it. But uh, I was kind of surprised it came in as low as seventh. But that's where it ended up at this point. Um, and again, I've said nothing but good things about the album. So it kind of highlights that. I do like it and I do like the albums ahead of it. Maybe just a little better for different reasons, but it's still a very good album. When I got this one, it was when I was a little, you know, a little bit of trepidation going into this one because it doesn't have the best reputation. Um, you, you read a lot of reviews on it, and like uh, you know, some of the quotes, you know, Aaron and what Marty may say in a minute, it, it, that '70s malaise and getting a little too clean, a little too slick, a little that they're moving too far away from their roots, you know. The, this is not the, the album that's going to appease the Hells Angels part of their fan base at all. But I, I still think at this point, you know, they were still uh, firing on all cylinders just in a little different way. But that's enough for me. Uh, Marty, have at it. Hey, hey, can I interrupt for just one second? Oh, There's please do. Question. Absolutely. There's a question in the chat uh, from Turntable as to why didn't they just call it Are You Ready to Rock spelled out instead of R, like letter R, letter U, ready, number two, rock, LOL. The answer to that question is cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Marty? Uh, Doctor Roxo. Uh, yeah, I don't know. All the all the kids are doing it. Who knows? I think I think they're sort of they're they're doubling down on the Neanderthal. <laughs> like, I think they know what that song is, and uh, in, in a way, that song is even more going through the motions and going through the motions is because those are different motions. Uh, and I think that they're doubling down on the the Neanderthal with that spelling. All right. Well, the big question is, who will rock you? No. That song rocks. I like that song. It's a solid callback to their older era. It's quirky. It's fun. Are you ready to rock? Really? Yeah. Yeah. I thought so. I thought so. I, I thought it had a feel of the, you know, it could have been on the first record with a, uh, that in that production, I think would have fit pretty well on that record. But I hated that song so much. <laughs> I don't know. I like it. I don't know why. <laughs> I just every time I hear, I mean, this is a record that Zoller bought me a long time ago when he was here visiting. Said I had to hear it absolutely neat. A lot of the things he said, he told me in the store. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reasons why I had to have it, he wanted me to buy. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm good. And he's like, no, I'm buying this for you. I'm like, okay, cool. But um, Godzilla, weird and heavy hit. Nothing like the rest of the album. Again, they're trying to get lightning in the bottle twice. You know, you got Don't Fear the Reaper, another song that sat weirdly on a record as being completely different from the rest of the record. They try it again. I like the song. I mean, I'm maybe a little bit sick of that one because it's been on Northern Michigan rate rock radio so long, but this is a grower record. I haven't spent a ton of super long ton of time doing 
on this, but every time I've listened to it, I've, I've picked out more and more from it. Um, the golden age of leather is a great song. Um, searching for Celine and fireworks. I've got, they're very weak feeling re- songs, but I really like the interesting ideas in them, which makes me not hate the songs. They just, they're just very malaise, I guess is a, is a good uh, way of saying that, but tired. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even when this band is doing things I don't like, there's so many great talented moments in the songs. It's hard to be like, you know, fuck you. Um, I don't get that with this record. This is number nine for me. I don't know who else called it. Number nine. It must've been Aaron. Um, it's really, it's a solid record. And I think the more time I spend with this record, it's going to grow into something I like even more. And thankfully the piano stuff it's on here, but it isn't as flamboyant as it gets later coming up here very soon. But, um, yeah, that brings us into number. What is this? This is their hold up. Hold up. You got oh, a live oh. album up here. If, I believe we're doing, if we're doing these, we, those the mention of this. Um, so there's this live album, Some Enchanted Evening. Someone pointed out in the chat, I did see how good a cover this is, which it certainly is. It's cool. It, it, it is. Uh, uh, I, I, I've listened to this album so few times. Um, what, is, what are the songs? Are You Ready to Rock? A Low Point? ETI, which I don't really care for so much. Astronomy? which is good, not as good as the studio version. Kick Out the Jams, which I don't want to hear. Godzilla, which I don't particularly care for. The Reaper, uh, Don't Fear the Reaper, which is which is a good rendition. We got to get out of this place, which I don't care for. So Dude, their covers, their I thick really, cover selection. Ugh. What? The, 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 the cover songs is awful. Kick Out the Jams. But even, but even their list of original songs, like they're coming, like, what, like they're coming off of Spectres. It's not, you're not getting Golden Age and Nosfera too, and and I love the night. But you're getting you're getting. Are you ready to rock? And clearly, that's like they're they're presenting themselves a certain way for a crowd. But like, I just don't like. I like. I think I've spun that twice in my life. Like, there's no reason for me to listen to that album. Here, you know, you know what this record is for me. I have to leave. I have to. I I I have plans. I have to get. I have to hit the road. I have about twenty minutes. Okay. Um, okay, what can I do in 20 minutes? Do I have to take a shit? Because that's perfect for that. No, I don't. So what else can I do in 20 minutes? I can play one side of a record, and I need a little dose of Blue Oyster Cult because I want to kick it until I've been listening to and I need as much packaged as I can into one side of a record. Are You Ready to Rock? ETI and Astronomy delivers that really well. If I have 20 minutes and I need a dose, side one of some enchanting evening really hits the spot. Other than that, no, I've probably played it. I've played it more than twice, but uh, I, I, I still, if I'm counting on my fingers, I've got a whole hand left over. <laughs> All right. Alan, anything to add? I, the, I think, you know, Craig's, you know, concerns with the albums can be summed up, you know, very succinctly. It needs more cowbell. <laughs> I've almost got my money's worth out of this bell, folks. Almost. I promise. Almost. <laughs> there, there are other things coming. I'm going to advise you: hold the hold the cowbell by the ring, and then hit it because you're you're hitting it, but also muting it. Yeah. I'm trying to. I, 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 I'm, let's let's try something because I'm thinking I have to mute it or it's not going to turn up. Let's see if it actually still rings because sometimes my mic, if something is really loud, it oh, it's like, oh, it's what, what Zoller's saying is he needs more. He needs more cowbells. What he's saying. Is it still coming through? Yeah, yeah. it's coming through. It's coming okay, through. that's that's interesting because yeah, that's the whole reason I didn't do it that way was uh, I, I've noticed in the past if I yell or there's a loud noise, a lot of times it ends up a little out of sync. So there was some overwhelming the the stream. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll rock the cowbell at least once more. I'm sure. All right. Speaking of overwhelming the stream, we have these these five chaps are coming back, holding their mirrors. They warned you. And we've got what the kids were calling it at the time in the uh, 78, 79. Indeed. So we've got, we've got mirrors. Um, I remember one time I saw one of the, you know, many times I saw them, but the, one time Bloom said, Hey, we're going to do a song for mirrors. And there was like one person clapped and Bloom looked <laughs> up and was like, thanks. You're the one who bought the album. 
Well, they have a sense of humor about it as well. I mean, this is clearly 14 uh, for me. And, and, and uh, the only album of theirs for a long time I disliked. Uh, and now I think it's just north of the equator. Like, I'm giving this album... Um, I'm giving this album like a 5.5 out of 10. This album is barely passing. This is getting some kind of D or, or whatever. Uh, Hefe just said biggest album quality drop ever. Like there are a couple of these historic, historically disappointing things. I lived through one with Countdown to Extinction following up for us in peace. I cannot imagine what it would have been like with Deep Purple's Machine Head followed up by Who Do We Think We Are. This one is staggering. This is like a... This, <laughs> punch in the face the drop of quality from what i feel is they went from their num my number one favorite album of theirs to their worst album and that that's that's i think that there's a pretty much a consensus there except for people um except for uh people who don't want to listen to the new stuff which i get it's fine um I, like but this is a clear number 14 and, and i've heard them all and spent time with them doctor music i don't like it's better here than on the live album um, the you know the backup singers is sort of weird. Great Sun Jester is hard to Very remember. Back. In V is a song that that Blue Oyster Cult clearly has an affinity for because it's on two albums and they played that pretty regularly. Uh, Mirrors is a weird kind of glam song. I'm not sure what that is. Okay, then we get Joe Bouchard saving the day uh, with Moon Crazy. So Moon Crazy, you get that 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 like that verse that's kind of loping along in a six eight. Like singing along over the sea, and then a da -da 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 -da, and then it leaps to the four four, the moon crazy summer of change. So it's 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 not far from disco. I like some disco, so I'm like I, that's not going to be the thing that turns me off. Ideas that I think are bad will turn me off. I think moon crazy is good. Um, the 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 highlight of the album, and um, so I, I I've I've said this to friends of mine. They've they've heard this little anecdote before. Um, if I had a time machine and, and could go back in time, well, I'd probably just stop this album. But something else that I would do is, is have a discussion with them about the song called The Vigil. Because um, The Vigil, which they play live, uh, I've, I've, seen them, I've seen them do it. And I've seen them pull out a couple of others. Um, Lonely Teardrops, they did at the Alan Lanier retrospective because it's a Lanier cut. Um, uh, so the vigil, this is Buck Dharma and an S Roser. I don't know. Sandy Roser. I'm not sure who that is. I don't know if that's a wife or a child. So the vigil I, I feel is, is perhaps one of the great and that can be best or most significant or worst juxtapositions for me in music history, because I hate the verse. I hate the riff. It sounds like droopy dog riding a donkey. I can't stand that. <laughs> Oh, and then the, the, the lead vocal comes in the in a perfect vision terrible like this weird monotone and then you get the harmonies reinforcing that idea vision it's awful and then you get that guitar I, I just I hate these verses these verses are like a low point for me maybe in their entire catalog but the, the other parts of this song are absolutely incredible this is like, I can't think of a song that has this big a contrast like ever that I've heard in my life. Um, Razor's Evil Invaders, I can't stand the singing in the, in the verse. It's like bad limerick crap. And I, and I love the shit out of that song. But the vigil, like when it gets into that, when it gets into that soaring guitar stuff, that couldn't be better. Like when it goes into the da -na 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 -na. And then there's like somewhere, somewhere out there. They get into all of that singing. And then that whole like chanting cult aspect of like, come to us. Like there's so much, this like, there is a golden age of leather that would, that sequel that would use all of those parts from the song, but would get rid of that God awful verse with that terrible riff and that terrible lead singing and that terrible harmony uh, and every time I hear it, I pray through like willpower or my ability to like collapse the like the wave function and alter eigenstates of electrons that I could somehow alter this this song to not have that verse because they go back to it. They, they, it blossoms into this absolutely gorgeous 10 out of 10. 
and then it goes back to those terrible ideas and then it soars again but man is it it is i am it it it, that song gives me anxiety and is like depressing every time i hear it because it's like this these amazing top flight ideas imprisoned by this terrible verse uh that it starts with and that it returns to um so then we go to you're not the one i was looking for is okay um lonely teardrops uh here we get so we get some more i think this is linear i think this this is more linear funk um uh is it yeah yes and i enjoy that one uh that was one they did you know they did in his in his honor at the retrospective and i enjoy uh lonely teardrops so this album for me is i think a lot of okay stuff uh moon crazy and lonely teardrops i enjoy moon crazy being the highlight you know joe as he gave me you know co-wrote uh the you know my the the best the best song on secret treaties wrote the best song on my favorite album specters also wrote my favorite song on their worst album. Uh, so, you know, that he's always offering, he's always offering something. Uh, you know, he just, he just writes less. But then, you know, as I said, like, Lonely Teardrops I, I, I enjoy. But, but this album is, like, you know, my second favorite band of all time is King Crimson. King Crimson has an album called Beat, and this is the same thing. Like, they have one album. I'm like, this is right at the hairy edge of something that I enjoy. And, and, and some of it is just because... I like the sound of the band so much. And also because I like the album so much less, I've listened to it so infrequently that it's kind of new. Like I listened to them like, oh, what happens in this great sun gesture when I was listening to it recently? Because it had been, it had been, it had been a while since I heard this thing. I bought like, you know, like it, it's, it's, I don't think it's a bad album. Um, but to me, it's, it's like just skating above mediocre. And if anyone says it's bad, I, I don't really have a lot of defenses here. I like Moon Crazy, and I like Lonely Teardrops. The Vigil, the Vigil, I think, is like one of the great tragedies in music history. That's like Randy Rhodes playing Crashing is that song. Like, like, I, <laughs> <laughs> you could, like you listen to the solos on those first two Ozzy albums, and it's like, oh my God, this is like, like for the quantity of solos he did and how many are immortal Hall of Fame classics. There's no one who has a better track record. Let's say, excusing the Quiet Riot stuff he did, but for those Aussie things, and then the Vigil is that. Like I, this, uh, like if I had a time machine, I would go back and get into the studio. I'm like, please rethink this verse. Please rethink this verse. But uh, there, there we have it. My least favorite BOC, and and the and the bottom, the bottom for many a BOC fan. This does not get. Um, um, I, I think someone's comment came up of someone who enjoyed it. Good for you. Um, I will try and get there. I don't know if there's enough medication or, um, like, you know, mind-altering, you know, tech that I can do to uh, arrive at that place. <laughs> well, you know what it needs there, Craig. Uh, <laughs> nah, I'll, I'll, we won't go there right now. <laughs> He's getting the mileage. I'm faking right. the cowbell. <laughs> so, Marty and Alan, do you go higher or lower with this record? I bottom of the barrel. 14 for me. I go a little higher. It's not bottom of the barrel for me. Okay. Well, this is this is my bottom of the barrel too. This is number eleven. But but if everyone hates, it, I'm going to try a little harder to defend it. <laughs> what I was asking. <laughs> nope. Um. Okay. I, I mean, this is all about. I, I mean, they told you. You know. Like this. This kind of sums up the record. You know. I mean, yeah. We still got the shades going on here. We've got that fucking tie, dude. Jesus Christ. Who the fuck does he think he is? I'm more alarmed with the, the tank top and super hairy chest option. That would be a that would be a double negative for me. You know, <laughs> like I'm he's showing up to the show wearing a tank top. Is he wearing a sweater underneath the tank top? I don't I don't get it. I'm gonna point out that that Alan Lanier is pulling off a moderately reasonable young uh was it Dean Dean Stockwell? Like he he looks like him in this in this thing. But anyways, please continue. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, this. Okay, so Dr. Music, I had assimilated before I got this because I listened to ET live enough times that, you know, it was sort of one of those songs in the middle that was just fine as sort of a connector between a couple other songs that I liked more, but it was good. So that's the lead track on this record, right? And that's okay. I can hang with it. The Great Sun Gesture is pretty good. Okay. That's a pretty good song. It's sort of thoughtful and, you know, it's it's not the best sort of thing they've done, but as far as the way it sort of swells and sort of the ebb and flow of it, I'm kind of on board. The problem is 
I kind of feel like they were trying to do the same thing with In Thee and The Vigil and I Am The Storm. And they sort of did it to greater or lesser degrees with all of those songs, but it feels like they kind of, they're all kind of the same color and they all kind of have the same central idea. And the effect of it is almost like the way the last, taking the shit out of it, the last three songs on Spectres sort of flow together for me, this whole album kind of ends up all blurring together. And I kind of like the sound of it, but they're, the, the personality just doesn't come through each track as well. They all have interesting parts that sort of come back and forth, but it doesn't really cohere. So, so between that and the fact that it's just kind of monotonous overall, you know, because of the fact that it all kind of has the same color and just all kind of feels like, um, it feels like a disco album minus the disco. And, and given that it's like, yeah, I don't know, man. So, so, so that's like half the album right there. Then, sort of beyond that, there are these sort of isolated tracks. So, mirrors. Yeah, those backing vocals are fucking weird. It really is. I mean, that's like that's probably the most disco thing on the album. Is that like? And um, you're not the one I was looking for. Just a horrible turd. I mean, that's like the evil twin of the also evil. Um, you're not the one I was, or not, not, you're, not you're, um, what's it called? You know what I'm talking about, going through the motions. Motions. And then Lonely Teardrops really feels like a filler track at the end of an album, except that weird synth sound. I kind of love that. That It's like there's so much to hate about that, but I kind of love it just because right, it's so weird right weird sound. Huh? A little bit of you know, like like superstition, like Stevie Wonder, like a couple yeah. of the like searching for Celine and that one, like uh, Lanier is it? Well, Lanier is bringing a little bit of the funk, like or, yeah. or, or Meatloaf, Meatloaf doing his little dance to get a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, that's probably as well as I can do by way of defending that record. I mean, if you're really into the band, it sounds like. Of the band you love making a not very good record, and the ideas are there. <laughs> like, like the ideas are there, the musicianship is there. It's just it doesn't come together at, like at all. It's just a fucking. I want to say it's a mess, but a mess kind of implies there are more different things going on there, and it all just kind of feels like more of a single wad than like something as interesting as like a good mess. So I don't know. I guess I just shit on it pretty hard, but. It's it's the bottom of the list, <laughs> number eleven. All right, Alan. All right, <clears throat> yeah. This is another one that it was one of the last of their old albums that I heard. Terrible reputation. You hear very few good things said about it. So I went in with very few expectations. And I remember after hearing it the first time, I thought, well, okay, I see why people hate it, but it's actually not. A horrible album it's just kind of a bad blue oyster cult album within the context of their catalog yeah it's going to rank a lot lower than most of the other stuff compared to a lot of just you know these sort of you know, fm radio friendly rock albums that you could have bought in 1979 it's passable at, at that level um so yeah i yeah, I, I get why Blue Oyster Cult fans don't like it. <clears throat> it may be one of those albums you just have to listen to from a different perspective. And again, not having you know this deep you know connection with the band for a long time, to me it's just like, well, okay, that's that's an okay AOR rock type album for it for its time. It's listenable. Um, there's no huge standouts here to defend or anything. Great Sun Gesture. I think this is their first writing contribution from Michael Moorcock. <clears throat> the song is a play on the Fire Clown character from uh, Moorcock's Elric uh, series. As Aaron said, not, not a bad song. Not amazing, but not bad. In the is listenable. Mirrors, this title track is a funny one. If you're someone who's not paying attention to it, it very much just kind of sounds, yes, like one of those kind of lightweight you know, radio tracks about, you know, ooh, girls are so pretty. 
<laughs> but then if you stop, you know, and pick up on the lyrics, yeah, it's more kind of, you know, ragging on, you know, girls who are, you know, very shallow and, you know, more focused and obsessed with their looks and stuff. So it's a weird tune in that musically it's constructed to be, you know, FM bubblegum radio hit stuff. But the lyrics are kind of insulting the very people that would be in that target demographic. So I'm left wondering, like, who the hell was supposed to like this song? It's not a bad little song, but it, the older fans aren't going to like this. It's too lightweight in construction. But you can't sell this as a single because it's basically saying y'all are a bunch of shallow fucking morons. <laughs> so I don't <laughs> know who was supposed to listen to it. <laughs> um, but I don't mind the song. That said, uh, let's see. It's kind of a glam rock thing. And I, maybe so. Maybe so. Um, Craig's right. You know, the vigil, yeah, there are parts of it that don't work, but there are parts of it that are pretty cool. No one really mentioned I Am The Storm. I thought that track was okay. It's not going to be in my top 10 or top 20 or top 30 BOC songs, but it wasn't horrible. You're not the one I was looking for. I read somewhere it was supposed to be sort of an answer song to the cars, just what I needed. (laughs) <laughs> and the fact that they were feeling the need to write, record, and slap an, onto an album a Cars-like tune maybe kind of tells you where their headspace was at at the time. They're trying to get, they're always, at this point, they're really vying for another hit. They're looking for that thing to keep them rolling down the road. I had two albums in a row with major hits, you know, yeah. it's, mm-hmm. we're pointing out. It's not like it was like a, you know, like, oh, they never, they did it twice in a row. They had giant hits. Right, you know, and it, it always feels like, you know, bands in that situation, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. You know, if they don't have the big hit, the pressure's always on to write a fucking hit. And then as soon as they write a big hit and a song, you know, does well for them, then it's just like, good for you. Write another fucking hit. Why can't you do it again? And it's just like, you, you, you can't win. Yeah, if they don't have, you know, don't fear the reaper, you'd be like, oh, well, there'd be no pressure to do that on this album. No, there'd still be pressure because they didn't have the hit yet. So, yeah, you just, you can't win sometimes, I guess. Um, but, yeah, so you know, that's my take on Mirrors. I ranked it 10th. It's lower than anything in their catalog up to this point. Um, there are some albums that come later that I ranked a little bit lower. I could see this one being lower. Some of those later albums... I'm not as familiar with. They could move up in the rankings over time. This might slide down. So yeah, I get that this is a weak Blue, blue Oyster Cult record. I, there seems, kind of like Craig said, there's enough going on for it to clear the bar, not by a huge amount. Uh, but there was enough for me at least that, uh, you know, I can listen to it for what it is and you know keep it off the very bottom rungs of the ladder. Uh, so I'll put it 10th. You know, I feel like you uh, you you benefited from uh, listening to that record with low expectations, and I think Very I did. Much could have. I came into it expecting it to suck. I was like, I'm only buying this record because I, I was going to the record store saying, "Hey, do you have any of the bad Blue Oyster Cult records?" I was like, "Because I have the good ones. <laughs> I, mean, I, need, I need the bad ones. You know what ones I'm talking about? <laughs> and, you know, that's the ones you keep under the counter that the kids can't see without permission. <laughs> yeah, now to come in and buy it, and you have to sell it in a brown paper bag." Now, a couple of these bad ones are the ones that I would have classified as being among the bad ones at the time are ranking very high, as we'll see shortly. But yeah, I, mean, I bought this blind, you know, like in a CD shop in the 90s and had no idea. And I was like, what is this? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I, I did not know. This is before internet era for me. And I was just like, wow. Yeah. I was expecting really it to stop. So I came in looking for things to like about it. And I and I was so into them, I just really wanted to like it too. So it really got every little inch of goodwill it could have gotten from me. And I think it benefited a lot from that. It still comes in at the bottom, but you know, I like the record. I really do. Zal, are you enjoying some refreshing cold milk right there? <laughs> <laughs> How <laughs> ironic. <laughs> I'm going to muscle milk. We're, we're, we've now entered, and I knew this would happen. We've now entered my um, my intermittent fast time. So, uh, so yeah, like, uh, you know, I've got some, uh, <laughs> keep me going. We're, we're, we're way in this, we're like halfway through this, not even, um, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll have, uh, I'll get some protein. All right. All right. Um, oh, it looks like Marty just killed himself. Again. God damn it. He, he'd Sorry. rather die than talk about mirrors. I hit the wrong button. Um, 
number 14 for me. Um, this this hit in the week where I was beaten down by a string of BOC that I really didn't want to listen to. And it really it fell in with that cinematic uh, rock musical soundtrack for a movie that doesn't exist vibe for me. The piano and the lady backup vocals really drove this point home on this record. Um, also, the production capitalizes on this with ultra clean late 70s, early 80s slick production. The songs like Punch. Um, there's some interesting ideas that feel lost in a commercial sheen and a fleeting hope for a hit. That's all I have written down for this. But yeah, this thing, it almost feels this one to me feels like as far as that 70s thing you're talking about, like the Rocky Horror Show thing, it almost feels like this thing has gone through that and come out the other side. So it has all the shit and the filth of it on itself, right? It's like it's not it's not unscathed. It's like it stinks. But but it's not still right in the middle of that like it is on some of those songs on Spectres. Hmm. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Someone uh, Tim Tim keeps asking if we know what the the hidden message is on um uh the hidden message in You're not the only one. No, I, I know about the hidden know. message on that Super Tramp record, but not on that. No, what's the hidden message? No one seems to know. And Tim's asking. I guess we don't know that, Tim. Least investigated album in their catalog for me. <laughs> um, There's a Raven song where they mic'd up the Gallagher, uh, one of the Gallagher brothers' ass, recording him taking a dump and record and put it into the mix backwards on a track. But I don't. I didn't realize. Take, well, I guess there could be farting sounds, but they would just sound like farts. You couldn't really tell it was a dump. Well, I guess you can hear it hit the water. I can't read that it says mirrors backwards on the cover. Don't think that's <laughs> <laughs> the hidden. You crack the code. <laughs> okay. Or, or it's the real name of this album, Sraranim. <laughs> it's all that muscle milk is giving you fucking code breaking powers. <laughs> anyway. Indeed. Indeed. So we're on to the next one, correct? We are on to, on to, to Cultosaurus Erectus, 1980. We're into yeah, the, the 80s. <laughs> So we've got this. Um, I, I think undoubtedly the best album cover they ever had. This it's album cool cover. is incredible. I forgot who painted this. I should know who painted this. Sorry. Uh, this art is this art is absolutely superb. I'm scanning now by uh, Richard Clifton Day. I don't know. I don't know who that is actually. Um, so there's Old this. Nick Clifton. Okay. Yeah. A, a lot. A lot of a lot of people really enjoy. Uh, this album and, and and I do too. I mean, this is a this is a this is a step up, uh, and I I'm, I'm I might not be. I I think maybe Wagner rates this as his favorite. I could be wrong. He told that. me to get this. He was the one that said, "Dude, you need to get this one." I'm like, okay. Yeah. I, I I like I like this album. Um, uh, it has some of what I really like about them in the '80s, and and some of what I don't like about them '80 in the '80s kind of comes out. But it's like this is a different this is a different animal completely than Mirrors. Like here's an album completely loaded with ideas, and like to me, Mirrors some of the stuff on that like some of those things are sparse, like Great Sun Gesture. Like there are ideas there, but they're not like coming off of like you know uh, even even if it's even if it's melodic, but like Celestial the Queen or Nosferatu, those things are packed with ideas and. To me, Mirror sounded like a band uh, with thin on ideas. And um, so we've got a lot of stuff here. Uh, Black Blade, uh, this is another one that to me is too shouty. Uh, and I just don't particularly care for the song. It's I, I first knew it from um, the, the, ET, the ET Live album. And uh, I think there's great synthesizer stuff. There are great moments. Uh, Buck Dharma's guitar tone it's it's incredible and not for nothing this is the first martin birch album right mm -hmm. so so they're they're firing a little bit more in the hard rock leaning metal and and you could say it's like it's their first kind of more committed hard rock metal album it's not entirely the case because of somehow how weird some of this album is so black Blade, i just don't particularly care for a lot of people love that song I think there are a lot of great moments that the very end you get that all that like vocoder stuff. Um, I, you know, the sheep came over from Pink Floyd sheep and then they're walking around at the end of this song. 
And I don't, I just don't, I just don't really care for it. And uh, I know Michael Moorcock is involved with that. Um, don't really like that. I, I read one Elric book. I, I didn't care for it. I, and I read tons of fantasy and like fantasy, but that wasn't for me. Then we leap to monsters. Maybe the second song I would pick after KG Cretans to show how weird the Albert Bouchard stuff can get. Holy shit, is that weird? They're like, this is like actually like a Mr. Bungle precursor in terms of some of this. In, some, in terms of some of the genre hopping, you're going like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have that like riff, whatever that thing is. It's like it's like it's like an epileptic. It's a cool riff. It's a cool riff. It's super cool, and uh, and then you get and then you get the jumping like the walking bass line. It might be a fretless, but like and like a saxophone going on, and it's just jumping all like the the tempos are jumping around, and it's pretty crazy. I like the song quite a bit. And it's weird how it just leaps into the kind of like monsters. Like it has the arrival moment from some other song and they just stick it in here and yet it works. Like this really feels like like a bunch of different ideas they put together and somehow it works. It's really like, again, like I'm thinking this is like a Mr. Bungle precursor. Um, then we get Divine Wind, uh, which is which is nice. It's like a bluesier uh, a, a bluesier sort of thing, uh, you know, written by written by Buck, uh, and then Deadline, a really pretty song. That was one of the ones when I was trying to wrap my head around this album, which took a little bit of time, but less time than Agents of Fortune. That was one of the ones I just immediately liked. Actually, I remember listening to that song in uh, in in Florida with Hefe in in uh, like in just listening to this, like, oh, this is a really pretty one. Like another one to file in the I love the night. Don't fear the reaper, like a beautiful, pretty, bu smooth buck song with like that slightly somber thing, like maybe you know, like with it. just re really, really nice. Marshall Plan, I do not like. That's that's one of the only few. That's one of the only songs written by the entire band. Um, certainly has a bit of a feel of written by a lot of people. Um, the Who reference, the, the kind of narrative of it. Uh, I, I, I really, you know, like I, I really did not enjoy Marty's comparisons to, to Meatloaf <laughs> for Angel of Fortune. But this song, I, this song to me with kind of the theater aspect of it's it. It's very Meatloafy. The first couple tracks. Double, de, like Devil Went Down to Georgia. I, like, like in all the different things that are happening in terms <laughs> of the story song. And just ideas I don't care for. Uh, so that to me is just a straight up dud. Like Black Blade is sort of on the borderline because I think it has great ideas and just some shouty stuff I don't care for. Um, Hungry Boys. Now, now we're getting to straight up weird art rock. Like the riffs and that. Like, where, like, where, like this this melody came from Thailand. Like I don't even understand. Like I don't understand the song. I like it. Um, this is this, and I don't know. Like. I, you know, I don't know how these things are conceived, but like Hungry Boys and like Hungry Boys has like sort of this anthemic chorus, the Hungry Boys that like, let's sing along with you. <laughs> but then it's like, and the verse is like, I don't know how this stuff goes together and yet it works. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's cool. Like I enjoy that. Uh, in terms of a song that's just like super easy to understand, like it's Fallen Angel and Monsters are things that take some time to get into. Um, uh, Fallen Angel, you just understand right away. This is like Joe Bouchard coming in with something that has like emotional purpose. It's more direct. Uh, his singing is great. Like he really does sound good when he does. Like he's the one in the band, I think, who should do the John K. Steppenwolf throaty singing because he sounds really good ripping it on this one. It's a pretty simple song with a really nice synthesizer, a little bit like um, Rainbow in the Dark kind of style, like the way it weaves in and out of the, the melody. It's it's nice. Um, Lips in the Hills is really good. Uh, and um, uh, you get a little more shouting than I'd like, but that, that one is, uh, it's a really strong. And also, let's say that, that the last two to me are the ones that point to Fire of Unknown Origin, where they're going to commit more to the hard rock slash metal um, that that they that they commit to on that album, and those two do it. And Unknown Tongue is great. Like that's that is uh, that like that one and Deadline are the highlights for me on the album. But I I enjoy the whole album with the exception of Marshall Plan and Black Blade. 
So it's it's a solid album for me. It is. Uh, what, what did I have it ranked at? Uh, it's nine. Uh, I, I dig it, but um, there's nothing on this album that I think is great. Uh, this album, and, and I don't think there's anything on this album that I think is excellent. With maybe Unknown Tongue, the one like excellent song on there. Uh, Deadline, pretty close, but a lot of good. And again, Monsters and Monsters and Hungry Boys. These are absolutely puzzling Bouchard. Like this is really puzzling music. Um, and the weirdness is back. And there are a lot of ideas here. The the um, so it's 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 a, it's a remarkably different album than Mirrors. Uh, and like you know, like there's some you know other than there's a little bit of a lean to an art rock, glam rock. Like some of that stuff is happening. Uh, you know, huge step up. And uh, an album I enjoy, and a fantastic album cover. I it never, yeah, like to me that album cover really was like a little bit like this was this one like sort of like set up a you're gonna have an awesome monster experience, and then you you're getting weird art rock, meatloaf, meat bad li- ballads. Let's not go there too too. Let's not ring that bell too much. <laughs> Did somebody <laughs> say bell? <laughs> never mind. We don't want the state of Michigan firebombed. <laughs> Wanna, we might not want to ring that bell too much, but yes, Marshall Plan. I, I cannot defend. I, I can't stand it. So. I just you love know. that Craig keeps like going all Warhammer 40k on Marty and <laughs> hanging the thread of exterminatus over the entire state of Michigan. Now <laughs> it's not just his house; it's now the entire state must be yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, it's heretics unclean. <laughs> damage. Sorry, rest of glorious dead band. You're going to. <laughs> Sorry, Ann Arbor, you must die for the worm's sins. <laughs> Diffuse this just a little bit. Is I used to hate Meatloaf until I realized that Meatloaf is actually kind of cool. What I really hate is Jim Steinman. Well, that's Meatloaf. I mean, there's your sound. That's well, Meatloaf. You see what I'm saying? Like Meatloaf himself. I mean, I can kind of get behind like the Meatloaf all by himself. You Bob's know? got bitch tits. <laughs> like I said. But but the songs, dude, I hate every one of his fucking songs. Yeah, he, he is he is it is terrible music. Yeah, it's cool like, cover. Billy's Joel shit and make it smell worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Billy Joel took a shit and meatloaf rolled it. <laughs> <laughs> meatloaf is bottom bottom rung, bottom rung stuff. All right. I love the album and I hate you and you guys are mean. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I when 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 Billy Joel got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because I loved Billy Joel when I was a kid, so I still kind of have a soft spot for him. And I had, at the time I was, I, I'm not going to call him not a friend, but I've lost touch. I was, at the time I was really tight with a guy who like really hated Billy Joel. So I like remember one time I said I was like, um, it was like over email. I said, uh, "Oh, Billy Joel just got inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame." I raised my glass, and he said, "I bear my ass." <laughs> it was a great comeback. <laughs> All right, so this fucking record, I don't love this cover as much as those first two. I mean, I don't think this actually... I still works. like it. It's a cool cover. It's still a cool cover, though, and it definitely promised more than what I felt like I was getting when I first got into this. Okay, so I said earlier, this record took me 20 years to... The first to two are great. I, I, yes, I should put, like, they're a different thing. The first two album covers are yeah. phenomenal, so let's say those three. I just now noticed the spaceship right here. Yeah. I just now noticed it. First time ever. Anyway, go ahead, Aaron. All right. So so anyway, this fucking record um, for years and years and years and years, like because I, I was so into those early records. Right. The first three like clicked for me a lo- kind of a long time ago. Right. I kept hearing, oh, this is another one like Scott Waters always said really good things about this record. I kept hearing this is one of those records. And I just always thought not that it sounded like Meatloaf, but that it sounded like 1980 circa 1980 AOR. You know, well, Scott know loves Scott know. loves Aerosmith and Ted Nugent. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> go ahead continue yeah i mean you know scott has a stronger stomach when i do than i do when it comes to a lot of things. me too on some of that stuff but he listens to some killer shit too anyway go ahead but i have totally come around on this record okay so black blade first of all okay again so i got my intro from et live right but but that wasn't the one where it was like sort of the okay song like dr music that was sort of in the middle of the side that was the one where i sort of looked up and went hey i don't recognize this one this is fucking really good you know, and I was like, oh, that's on Cultosaurus Arachnus. Because that one just sort of has this like epic feel that um, 
it's really completely new for the band, not because they'd never done something epic like that before, but they'd never done it in this kind of a way before. You know what I mean? And in a way that I really wouldn't call metal at all, but in a way that sort of points to metal in a similar sort of way as like King of Twilight by Nectar did for Iron Maiden. You know what I mean? You know how you can, mm -hmm. if you know that stuff, you can sort of look back at that and you can go, I can hear the epic vibe in this song, even though it's not a metal song at all. This yeah. is a couple steps closer to metal, but it's still not metal, but it delivers on that epic vibe, and I love it for that. Um, Monsters, I actually think the Mr. Bungle thing is pretty apt, because my beef with Mr. Bungle has always been that I feel like they try too hard, like they just put too much shit in, and I feel like that's what Monsters does like with that saxophone shit. In the <laughs> you know, I don't need that. But right. other than that, I'm pretty much on board, like, with Monsters. I've gone from, like, thinking, oh, this is just a bunch of crap, to this is actually pretty awesome. It's pretty well-formed. It's all really well put together. I just don't like that saxophone shit in it, you know? I'd, I'd be happy for the sax to go as well. Yeah, I'm not a big sax fan either. I it, but I, but I, I, don't, I don't love it. Yeah. Now, Divine Wind, I think, is awesome. Now, one of the things that they, the band did really well on the early albums is sort of have a song that, like, on the surface was simple and kind of cool, but there's a sort of menace underneath it. You know, and, like, um, Stairway to the Stars, I think, is a great example. I think Divine Wind totally brings that back. It's so easygoing, and it's such a slick shuffle, but there's just, like, this sort of thing about it where it's like, yeah, I might stab you too, motherfucker, you know? Hell's Angel style. Yeah, actually. So the Marshall Plan also feels throwaway to me. Um, yeah, I mean, all like the little references. It, it, it feels like, um, uh, I mean, once again, it feels like it reinforces the idea that they're acknowledging influences that they've surpassed by so much that it's kind of a waste of time. Yes. It's like Motorhead covering the Ramones. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Just please don't. Like, you can like it, but please don't. You know what Hungry Boys bring, it feels like to me? It feels like there's a parallel universe in which that's an album track off Diamond Dogs or Aladdin Sane. Yep. Like, that's sort of where I'll go with the, uh, with the plan. Diamond Dogs, emphatically. I'm with you. It's Diamond Dogs. Yeah. Like, because that course feels a little bit, it feels a little bit sort of, throw away to me it feels a little bit um you're not the one i was looking for to me the rhythm of that chorus you know what i mean but but i've gotten past that that was sort of my earlier impressions of it and i've come around and i'm like okay i can sort of hang with this now but it sort of works on a similar level and i think that's where the glam thing is and that syncopated rhythm being a little bit too obvious brings that to mind for me you know yeah lips in the hills is awesome unknown tongue i i i Absolutely brilliant song. I think it's a good example. That's, that's an example of like why I uh, don't try too hard to listen to the lyrics because I feel like that one is just a little bit more obvious where when they hold it back just a little bit, they achieve the same thing to much greater effect. But it's an absolutely fantastic song, man. I mean, like it gives me chills. Okay, so this is, let's be clear. Lips in the Hills is a rocker that's just sort of like all of a sudden is a rocker that sort of seems to come out of nowhere. Um and yeah, overall, where did I rank this record? I think I remember, but I'm double checking my list anyway, just because I don't want to get this shit wrong. Yeah, and I would have gotten it wrong. I gave this, I put this one at number five. Wow. Okay. I, uh, just, a, just one little aside on the development of the band, like, and, and you get it with with um, uh, with unknown tongue. Like you were like, speak to me. You're getting a lot. You're the, he, he's leaning more. And I feel this is something that came with Birch, the vibrato and the dramatic quality. And like, like if he was like 20% Dio before this, before he worked with Birch, here he's gone. He's like 50, 60%. And that, I think that's like of the big changes on the, in, in terms of the, the Birch albums. I think one of the big changes is more committing more to Eric as the, as the main lead singer. And again, I like, I like, you know, mm -hmm. maybe Albert is my favorite vocalist of them. So like, but in terms of a guy who can carry the dramatic and carry the hard rock and deliver that vibrato and has like a richer uh, voice, like he's that guy. Like Buck is an incredible. He's a great singer, but it's like it's 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 a it's a smooth delivery. It's not like yeah, this. The meat. There's, no, there's no operatic drama to it. 
and you're really getting like speak to me in like you're getting you're getting that extra vibrato and i feel like again those last two songs in particular you're getting you're getting the sense of who he was going to become in the 80s you know, I didn't put my finger like like what you're describing with Eric, by the way, not not just now too, but earlier when you're talking about the vibrato and the delivery and that you put your finger on some things that I hadn't quite. He he is my favorite actually out of their singers for those reasons that you're describing. You're articulating really well, but a lot of the shit, like specifically the vibrato, I didn't put my finger on at all. But that actually, but what you just described actually maybe accounts for a big part of why I am weighting some of these later records disproportionately heavy. Like when I was putting this list together, I would was kind of planning on throwing a couple of the later ones in there high on the list to sort of be contrarian and shit. But like I was genuinely ranking a lot of these high, like no bullshit. And I think you just clued into a subtle thing that um, has sort of been underlying a lot of my love for these later records. Cool. Because so, absolutely, yeah. Alan. Okay. I'm um, just uh, <clears throat> be clear here. I don't care for this album much. It was one of the first ones I got. It by took the band, me 20 so years, cool. man. I it's, hated it. <laughs> I, I've been working on it for a few years, and I don't really get it yet. One of the, I've played it a good amount. It was one of the first ones I've got, and I didn't just listen to it and put it on the shelf. I've played it, set it aside for a week or two, brought it back out. I have put some rotations in on this album, and I'm not going to rank it very high. Um Quick look at the track list. Uh, Craig, I agree. Black Blade just does not work for me. Everybody seems to make a big deal out of it being written by Michael Moorcock. <laughs> I don't really care that it was written by Michael Moorcock. Like yourself, I read one book in the Elric series. I did not care for his uh, style, and uh, that was it. You know, It's an iconic character, sure, but I didn't like his book, and I don't like his lyrics on this song. Uh, and The song just doesn't come together. Uh, Monsters is exactly the kind of song I cannot get into. These songs, and whether it's Blue Oyster Cold or anybody else, but where you just start genre hopping, you know, yeah. at the drop of a dime, trying to mesh together. Let's do some rock. Oh, let's throw in some jazz. Oh, let's swing, jump over to a country swing. I just can't listen to that. It's just not for me. Other folks really enjoy that kind of eclectic song building. It, it does not work for me. It's freedom, um, man. It's freedom. You will never come around on that song, nor, nor I can't imagine. No, I, I won't. Yeah, I, I, I just know, you know that is something that I just have to skip that track. And so right away, I mean, we're off to an 0-2 start on this album. And it's not just like a, uh, well, you know, slow start. It's like, I do not like these two songs kind of start. Yeah, so yeah. it kind of puts the album working at a disadvantage. Now, Divine Wind is not bad. That's the song that was uh, they actually wrote as an anti uh, Ayatollah song because during the Iranian hostage crisis, the whole thing is geared at the Ayatollah. If he's calling us, you know, uh, the devil, then let's send him to hell. See, that's why I don't read the lyrics and like pay attention because like that that doesn't make it better. Like whatever I, I was imagining I, just based on what I had is cooler. I yeah, just ruined the song for Aaron. I'm sorry, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just fucked it up. Uh, you know something? I'm going to drop it down to six now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a downer. Yeah, but it does work the way Craig described it. It does have that quiet kind of menace to it, a little bit reminiscent of like the Revenge of Vera Gemini. Um, it's got the, you know, that kind of you know, a little bit of a sultry, quiet delivery, but it's got, you know, it's got some teeth to it underneath. So it works fine. And the fact that it has a political message doesn't uh, bother me as much as apparently it bothers Aaron. Yeah, um, it's, it's a slow six, eight kind of menacing bluesy tune. Like mm -hmm. that, -na 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 -na, you know, like I, I like it, but I, I could see why, why, why people wouldn't. And I didn't know what it was about. And I will try and forget that. <laughs> you know, here's the thing though. Actually, I think this is one of those songs where if you get the band, it makes sense to you. If you don't get the band, then it doesn't. Because when, because when I was when I hated this record, when I was responding to it exactly the way Alan just described, pretty much, like I wasn't on board with Black Blade, and then the sax came on that second song, and I was out before I ever got to Divine Wind, right? Because, but like that kind of shit. When I, when I was there, that song just I didn't even notice it. It just didn't even really register. Once I'd gotten my head around the band, like really, and I was on the wavelength to where I could overlook the sax on that second song, Divine Wind all of a sudden became this work of genius because I understood it, you know? Hmm. Okay. Although I feel like I understand it less if it's about the fucking Ayatollah, dude. I don't care about it. I mean, <laughs> that is, what does Ayatollah have to do with this monster on the front of the cover? It makes no fucking sense. I, I don't care what Eric Bloom thinks. I mean, that's not what I... That, you it's know? not turning into Desdenova and, and flying over where 
goosenecks bend the the wrong way and we're swimming with the oyster boys. That's what it's about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so having Ellen be sure to beat out the USA, USA chances of working for you, Aaron. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> Uh, Stop the steal. Stop this. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's, it's not even <laughs> That's meatloaf. That's meatloaf. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I get to the end of side A, and then, okay, it's like a two-two split. You know, the last two songs are all right, but something I noticed too is that you know these songs do feel like other songs from other earlier albums as well. So it's not like either song is something new and fresh and groundbreaking and that different to me. I get on to side two. The Marshall Plan comes and goes. And I not really into that. Hungry Boys, no, no. Yes, this again it's not, not for me. It's not me. Uh, Fallen Angel doesn't really catch my attention. So, but then again, the last two songs, you know, bail it out a little bit. Lips in the Hills is yeah, it's a really good scorcher of a track. They rev it up a little bit, um, kind of for the first time on the whole album. And Unknown Tongue is very cool. And Craig, yeah, I liked your point. These two tracks really do feel like the prelude to what's going to come next in their discography. Unknown Tongue has got, yeah, more of that, you know, the somber, that kind of, you know, uh, heavier, a little darker, a little kind of the gothic overtones to it. Um, yeah, yeah, just, you know, a good creepy kind of song for it. But yeah, this is one of those albums where the... You know, there, again, so there's four tracks out of the nine that I'm passable on yeah but the five that i don't like i really just do very little for me so i've got this one ranked quite low i ranked it lower than mirrors okay i've got it yikes um yikes the the album does not click for me (laughs) mirrors it's it's plain but i can i know what it is and i can appreciate it for what it is this album i'm not sure what this album is but i know there's over half of it that i just cannot appreciate so it's down there. Maybe over time, you know, like, you know, with Aaron, I know, yeah, years ago, Aaron wasn't into this album and, you know, it's come way up for him. Maybe someday some of this will click with me a little bit better, but Cultosaurus is, uh, it just does not, at least at this point, it, it's not the Blue Oyster Cult album for me. It's Now, Alan, it's, you said you did like um, This Ain't the Summer of Love? Yes. Mm-hmm. And Craig didn't. Okay, right. because because Black Blade... It's not the same kind of album opener that this ain't the summer of love is, but it does some of the similar sorts of things. It comes in hard. It comes in heavy. It doesn't build up slowly. It comes right in with a bang, right? It has that sort of sound effect at the beginning and then like bam with the instruments, right? It has Eric singing in a lower register and not with the same sort of menaces in that other song, but it is a contrast with the tessitura he's usually singing in on the other songs where he's doing more as that sort of wail and sort of the dramatic thing that Craig was talking about earlier. So it's yeah. a different kind of song, but it does some of the same things as far as opening up the album. And I think it succeeds doing some of those same things, even though, again, it does it in kind of a different way. Yeah, I see where you're coming at from, Aaron. And yeah, I see why it's the opener on the album. It does kind of have that big, you know, up in your face. But you for me, I the difference would be... Comparison until just now. So if I'm completely full of shit, I might back down. <laughs> no, I, I see exactly what you're saying. The difference for me is that, you know, this ain't the summer of love. You know, it opens the album by hitting you with a, just a little bit of that primal thud. Uh-huh. Whereas uh, Black Blade seems to try to come in and grab your attention with the jazz, jazz fingers. fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's, that's like, uh, this one, that's, yeah, that difference is lost upon me. But no, I see what you mean. Yeah, it's a good selection for the opening one because you're right. It does have, you know, those sound effects and stuff that are meant to really grab your attention. It's saying the show was about to begin, but it's saying it this way instead of this way. And yeah, I, I just can't get into it. I, it maybe maybe in the if in the future it clicks, I will certainly report back and uh, update my score. Marty, what do you Literally. think of the uh, Cultosaurus? I, I just gotta get this in real quick. Oh yeah, one of the first times I ever streamed with y'all was when I got into that. Actually, it might have been the one we did with um, the New Wave British Heavy Metal one earlier on. But I ended up on the call at like two in the morning with just Marty, and he pulled that record out. I was like, "Yeah, I don't know. This is another one that Zoller was telling me is so good." And like, <laughs> and I was like, "You know, I haven't played that one in a while. Maybe it's time for you to give that one yet another chance." But I probably bagged all over that record in that conversation. I was like, "Yeah, that fucking thing sucks. I'm gonna give it another chance." I've been so into this band lately, but 
But here I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, I remember the first time you described the album to me, Aaron. <laughs> I remember exactly what you said. You said, never has an album cover promised so much and delivered so little. <laughs> All right. But you know, hey, that is cool. You know, uh, you've you know it's grown on you over time, and that's quite okay. You know, you're not going to just stick to your old opinion because that's what you said in the past. You're like, hey, yeah, I like it now, and that's absolutely oh, that's, cool. that's still fun to collect records after you know close to forty years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Marty, we haven't heard your thoughts on the uh, the Cultosaurus yet. This to me is a ten. I got I, I, I ranked this at ten, and I started listening to this early on in the week. So I started off a little more positive. I said, begins very theatrical with Rocky Horror or Meatloaf sense of playful sonic cinema. <laughs> and then I Boy, said... Mr. Colt has made more Meatloaf albums than Meatloaf has. I know. They're coming. <laughs> Due to uh, predominant organ and piano work, uh, the album trails off into identity crisis. That's all I said about this record. It didn't... I thought the production was better than the last record. And they kept the the meatloaf shit early on, and it just the rest of the album just did not pan out for me. Uh, Ten, it wasn't mirrors level of horrible. Um, another awesome cover, ten out of ten cover, pretty mediocre record for me. So let's move into. I don't think it has an identity crisis at all, man. That's man, I just hear like this this given this. There's always, you know, before we went into this whole thing. I was talking to Jeff about this a little bit the other night. How this band to me always had like this sense of freedom. It just seemed like they could do whatever they wanted in their songs. It was like this freedom, whether I liked it or not. And then he's like, maybe, but I think it's more of them trying to continue getting hits. So they, they bent their will to whatever was kind of happening at the time. And after he said that, uh, it kind of it, it kind of made me listen to these records in a different light. I mean, especially coming up. I mean, we're getting to like we're into the eighties now, and there's an album coming up that's in a very obvious play on what's happening at the time. I mean, let's face it. It's coming up in a couple albums here. But um yeah, I mean Blue Oyster Cult, they're like any other band, a legacy band that's trying to survive. I mean, they're touring all the time, probably because it, yeah, it's fun, but they're trying to make money. I mean, that's where a band makes their money is on the fucking road. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know? Uh, to, to your point, Marty, you know, there was, you know, a sense with the band and management such on this album, you know, from what I've read. And again, I'm, I'm not a long term, deeply read fan of the band, but, but there does seem to have been, you know, some pressure that, you know, after Mirrors, you know, kind of flopped, Tanked. that there was, you know, some. You know, there was a thought process that we do need to get this shit back on the road and back in the lane a little bit. And so that they were trying to do something to change course compared to what had happened uh, with the previous album. So I, I don't know if that strays all the way into identity crisis or not, but there was, a, you know, there was thinking that we, we've, we've lost the plot a bit and we better find a new one and find it fast well that, that that's exactly it but you know i'm an outsider looking in i have not been a long time fan of this band i can hear you know hits like don't fear the reaper you got a guy that's really good at writing those so they try you know with uh burning for you you got godzilla it's all that same kind of feel but yet you got the show tune affinity going on you know you got this it's still good it's really good it's just who who are you? What is it? Which you which is the prevailing wind here? You know, you know what it's like listening to you talk about Cultosaurus. Actually, it's really kind of interesting for me. Like when I was when I was like little, like when I was a Billy Joel fan. When I was when I was like a kid, though, I was raised like really religious, and I really like believed that stuff. You know what I mean? Like heaven and hell and that stuff. You know that shit kind of seemed real to me. You know what I mean? And like now I look back on that. Like from like having not believed that stuff in a long time. And it's like, it seems like a different person. Like it's hard to believe. And like on some level, I go, I totally understand it because I was there. You know what I mean? That's exactly the space where I was and I get it. But on another level, it seems completely distant. And I want to be able to like explain like where that difference is, or, like how that gap manifests. And I can't do it because there's just a gap. And that's what it's like listening to you talk about Cultosaurus Erectus. Because when I was there, I was completely there. I complete. I feel like I absolutely understand why you respond to that record you do. But yet I have moved to a place where that's a 10 out of 10 record for me. Mm-hmm. 
You know what I mean? And this is where I am now. And it's hard for me to like hear it the way you're talking about. And I want to explain to you like why it's different, especially because I understand where you were. But because I understand that, it feels like there's still this gap there. And if you can cross that gap, dude, it's a fucking 10 out of 10. But the thing so, of it, the, so you're, not there, you're not there because I was there too. And I know I hated that record. So something that's something that's worth pointing out in, in this in this does does play to and, and perhaps justify to some extent Marty's uh, confusion in terms of their identity. Um, uh, and I don't like again, I, I could be corrected, but I believe that Spectres was the last one where Sandy Perlman uh, and Krugman were like the main other part of the band. And so Perlman is kind of like, you know, you read a lot of the history. It's sort of like. Albert Bouchard, Buck Dharma, and Perlman were sort of like the three, and then they built it out, and like Eric Bloom came in, was immediately writing stuff. Lanier, you know, like, and Joe yeah. Bouchard is like throwing his ace in the hole, like every time he does it. Uh, but they, they, like, in terms of like losing their direction, like I'm watching this this Beatles documentary, this Get Back thing now, and there's and it's clear that like Paul McCartney is running the show, and that they're lacking some direction now that, that Epstein is dead, and so, you know, Perlman didn't die and they would work with him again later. But I, and I don't know if they physically moved out to California for mirrors, but I, like there were upheavals there. And um, uh, so th so so those are some of the changes. Like you look at the song, the songwriting credits for mirrors and there are some people helping them with that. But less there isn't like Krugman and Patti Smith and and Perlman like all over the place. Like it's a little bit more focused on the guys and we could say with mirrors, it was a fumble uh, for me with Cultosaurus Erectus. Uh, they're having the guidance of Martin Birch uh, helping them, but not a fumble. I think that's a dramatic improvement. But like I'm looking at these songwriting credits, there's more cock on one um, and there's a C Bouchard. But this is like the guys like the Blue Oyster Cult guys wrote this album more completely than any other album in their catalog insofar as less outside help. So you could you could say they're like in a way like they might be finding their identity as like from the inside out as opposed to a top down. However, Krugman and Perlman uh, saw them. And uh, but but I understand what you're saying to me. I don't feel like I feel like the album is a bit scattered, like the song Monsters itself in terms of the kind of ideas uh, it presents. But I think overall it's pretty focused with like it's tougher, it's more aggressive. These dr and these drum parts, and this has also got to be the Martin Birch aspect of it, these drum parts are written, and they're performed the way they were written. Some of that, like, extra ride stuff mm -hmm. that, uh, that that uh, Bouchard is putting in on the early albums, some of those ghost notes on the snare, and that, that stuff isn't happening anymore. These are deliberate parts he's hitting harder, and they feel like they're written and performed correctly, or they're doing another take. Uh, so that's I feel that that's, what's, that's the, the, the growing – like, I like Cult of – Erectus to me feels a little bit of a of a growing pain album. Like I feel some of that's there, and I think that's some of the identity crisis that uh, that Marty's talking about. And but I, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Just, yeah. just worth saying, like, like they had all of this outside help, and and in particular with Perlman and Krugman, two guys who were super important to what they did, and they're not here now. It's yeah. not and I I do want to say that. I get a band of this caliber, this long running, um, lifelong project wanting to sell records, put out a hit. I mean, I'm a, a lifelong fan of kiss and kiss have all along made no bones about fucking writing the hit. You know, it started with rock and roll all night. That was their first step into the big, the big time, you know, Beth. I mean, they, they work with, with artists like Brian Adams. They work with artists like uh, Desmond Child, who is the, the, the king of Powder Puff. Yeah. And, I mean, look at who, who BOC is working with. They're, they're, they're writers. They bring in Patti Smythe, who is some, you know, highly revered crazy street poet type of person. I mean, she is not writing. I mean, she had some hits in her time. Don't get me wrong. But with Blue Oyster Cult, it feels way more disingenuous because they, they come from this weird sci-fi odd things going on in their music and yet they're trying to embrace this radio friendly thing it just seems very disingenuous to me and again i don't fault a band for trying it but they're not kiss you know they're not a band you can't listen to anything in their catalog other than what's maybe coming up is a, a very super obvious you know um you know trying to slam dunk into the fucking commercial realm but 
they're going about it a very like the band itself very very uh yeah i lost my train of thought i'm sorry i totally lost it um we're moving on anyway uh, anybody want to comment on that before we move on <laughs> i'm good okay um, 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 uh, we've got uh, Fire of Unknown Origin, 1981. Awesome cover. Look at that cover. That's beautiful. Yeah, this is this is this is a, this is a gem. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a big fan of this album. This is. I don't know if this was the first album I got after the live album is the first album of theirs I got uh, in terms of anything, but in terms of just like a regular LP. I'm not sure if it was if it was this one. There's a good chance that it was. Um, and whenever I got Ages of Fortune, that kind of slowed down the accumulation of albums for a little bit. And then and then like when I started hearing the you know the black and white albums, I was like, oh shit, all these songs from ETI are so much better uh, in the original versions. So um, I, I you know like in terms of consistency. Uh, this is the one that I put alongside the debut in terms of like, I like everything. Yeah, uh, it, it is. It is incredibly consistent. I rank it number five in their catalog. Uh, I, you hear the Martin Birch in this. You do. Get it to hard rock and heavy metal. These part, the drum parts are performed. This is you're like the, you know, and burning for you. Like it's, it is that part. And I'm not saying Martin Birch wrote it. Bouchard wrote it. Um, and came up with it but there's a part and you're playing it correctly it's like all of the kind of little extra things uh they 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 sort of moved away to make it i think just more solid uh and uh and there's you know there are pluses and minuses with things like that so to go through the album five unknown origin i think is great you're getting uh like i mean again like at this point like like eric bloom what a what a vocalist like this is really he is really ruling at this point in terms of like, like his, his glory days and, and like, you know, like, like his held notes, the vibrato, the dramatic quality, and even a song like Fire of Unknown Origin, which is like, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, the synthesizer stuff and all of the ahs that are coming in, a lot of backing vocals, which sound like a lot of uh, bucks to me, but might be, maybe it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of the guys, but you know, really good, really good tune. Is that written by like a ton of the guys? Yeah, that's that's Joe, Patty Smith, Eric Bloom, Albert Bouchard, Buck Dharma. So we got everybody and an outside writer coming up with that gem. I should point out to to, to people there is an alternate version of this song with Albert singing, lead singing. That's like a, maybe it's like a B side on Ages of Fortune. They had this one for a while. It's incredible. It's the best of all of the B sides that they have. It's a completely different song. And it's Albert singing. It is, it's a totally quirky thing, like that song. And then he sings another one called Sally. Those are worth seeking out. Uh, so that song is really good. Burning for You, I think, is great. Like that is, you great know, song. like that one in, in a way, like I feel like something that's happening here is I feel like the differences between Blue Worcester Cult and Thin Lizzy, like I think they're getting a little bit closer mm. um, in terms of the kind of things that they're doing, the straightforward, you know, like. Like, you know, like Buck's voice is very easy to like. Like it's yeah. a little bit little bit Beach Boys. Um, you know, it's like super smooth. Uh, you know, not for nothing. He's the main singer of all, all three of their hits. So he has like the let because he doesn't have the drama and uh, a, a dramatic presentation and the kind of voice that Bloom has. I think that that might be some of it. It's also, um, uh, you know, it's 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 also the kind of thing like he's just coming up with really good hooks. He has a really good pop sensibility, so that's a really great one. That's one that like at the at some period in the '90s, Ron and Ellie's fills. I remember seeing shows with Hefe and and and, uh, and and another friend and just laughing at how bananas and great these fills were and Buck's guitar fills on that. And that was a point like he was like really playing that the the guitar that was like looked like Swiss cheese and had no no head and it was like a bizarre looking looking thing but he you know he's playing great with that then we get veterans of the psychic wars which is my favorite song on the album it's not as good as the live version that is to come because few things in the history of mankind are as good as the live version that is to come but this song is great uh i had the unfortunate experience i guess just in terms of appreciating this song of knowing the live version first so this always feels a little bit muted the you know, 
dun, 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 dun. Like those accents are all like monstrous on the live album. Here they're a little, they're a little muted. Uh, certainly it doesn't have the greatest guitar solo of all time because that appears in the live version, but it's a great song. Like, I uh, hopeless and bereaved. You and this is where you're getting him absolutely as um uh as a metal vocalist, as a met like and selling that dramatic world. He's that character, he's in that science fiction space. The difference between like you know what Dio is doing on the on the, the Sabbath albums at this time that Birch is also producing, like it's getting smaller. Uh and uh so that song's great. Uh, Soul Survivors. Soul Survivor is uh, really, really enjoyable. Um, uh, and that one, unlike Doctor Music, to me has like female backing vocals that I enjoy. Um, like to me, they they add something that that that's nicely done. Uh, and like some weird, like in in pl playing around with effects, not as novel as they once were. But the I am the end of the human race. Like when they're throwing in those lines that are processed differently. Um. Uh, the the uh, the solo in that like like again like like maybe maybe eight of the ten best guitar entrances in the history of music are Buck Dharma in this catalog. Because here's another one, like it's just like it, they're fantastic arrival moments. And also at the end of that, and, and 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 maybe the metal theologian can speak to this and tell me what the hell's going on at the end of that solo. There's like it seems to sort of dovetail into some sort of noise. Like it seems to leave the realm of being a guitar and go like, and I'm not sure what that noise is. It's awesome. Oh, I don't know, man. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but so anyway, Soul Survivors, Soul Survivors, clearly a gem. Uh, uh, heavy metal, black and silver. And, and the metal theologian can maybe educate me on this one. That riff. There's something really weird going on with the harmony of it, and I don't know if it's the. And I think it is the. The so it's like. And I think it's that high note and where it's landing with the bass guitar. Like this song, in some ways, is the rah rah. Except this is super weird. Like the way that that riff sits, it's like it's this weird kind of cool, um, uh, like dissonance. And uh, and another one that at the end of the song they're doing like a stadium finish like the Who would do, and then except it's duh, bah, duh, bah, with all these weird noises and it's fantastic stuff. Uh, <laughs> Vengeance Act is is like you know here here we've got we've got Joe singing in landing in another jam. This one he wrote with his brother, uh, but that one has a really nice progression to that speed up. Fantastic stuff. I've got to assume that this was somewhat inspired by the the part in the heavy metal movie that I think is based on a Mobius comic with the woman on the bird. Like it's uh, like I, I got to imagine they just based it on that Mobius comic, the woman with the bird. Uh, I think I think this song is great. I think that that part of the heavy metal movie is terrible because it's rotoscope, and and I never want to watch anything rotoscope. That is like that's breaking the rules. I can't stand rotoscoping. No rotoscoping. Um, After Dark is super puzzling, um, and it's like it's like this sort of mock playful, except there's menace underneath it the entire time. And I've got to assume that the high note that Eric hits at the end is the highest he ever hit in any of these albums. The like I I can't do it, and I won't make you suffer through me attempting to do it. But that's a really cool tune. Joan Crawford is them having a sense of humor again in a way. To me, it's like a better Godzilla. Uh, lots of stuff in the mix. You've got Albert Bouchard doing his Christina. Like you get him and then all the no, no, no. Like that. that's a lot of fun. It's also a real uh, Alan Lanier highlight. And again, them using piano in a way that's not honky tonk, but like gothic and adding something cool. Don't Turn Your Back is an odd one. That was the one that for a long time was the one I was like, I mean, it's it's certainly not a highlight, but for a long time, I was like, I don't really understand this song. I certainly don't get it in the context of it. The album closer for this album, I enjoy it. It has like, uh, it's just like I actually, in a way, like like that. I, this song would fit better on the next album. I just don't know how it sits on this album, and I don't know where, um, and I don't and I don't know where like where I would put it in that running order. But here, it's 
it's pretty ambi- like like ambiguous. I feel like harmonically, like and you have all those like all those like heavy synths just holding. It's a cool tune. That one was the one that took me the longest to warm up to. But here you got an album, nine songs. I like every one. That's the same thing. The first album, I like every song. So really solid. You feel the Martin Birch with the punchiness of it, with oh, the yeah. deliberateness of everything. Out in, and definitely Eric Bloom in these two Mar- uh, Martin Birch albums has gone from being like uh, like a, a like a good vocalist to I think a great vocalist. These are these are like these are the these are this is where he grew. And I and I don't know. Oh, one bit of trivia I know about this album. This entire album was essentially co-produced by Albert Bouchard. What happened was Martin Birch, I guess, after Monsters, said, "Listen." If, we're make, if I'm making enough, and again, this is according to an Albert Bouchard interview I saw. He's like, if we're making another album, if you guys, somebody in your band needs to stay in the studio. Like, because I guess they were just winging in and doing all their parts and overdubs. Like, one of you needs to be here the whole time if you want me to do the next one. And so Albert was the guy. And I think this began some of the tension between him and everybody else. Because probably some resentment that he had to be the guy. But also him being in this kind of producing the rest of the band role so he's supposed to have a co-producer credit on this and then there was uh, uh, again according to albert bouchard this interview that i saw there was something maybe in martin birch's contract that's like oh you can't have someone else listed as a producer on your album so he doesn't have it but this album uh i, I think i think behind the scenes albert bouchard is very responsible for this album and uh but i think also behind the scenes there's some resentment uh, both ways, like from him to them that he had to do it, and maybe from them to him that he is like cracking the whip of Martin Birch and however, how, whatever the dynamic was there. But he, uh, according to him, should have a, a credit and was there the whole time in a way that the other guys were. But uh, it's a great album. I mean, it's, it's, it's the first album of theirs that I, that I really like fully enjoyed. Right on. Aaron. All right. Well, this was the fourth one that I got really into. <laughs> <laughs> As I was sort of saying earlier, this was kind of the one that opened up the whole rest of their catalog to me after the black and white albums, you know, because this one had such a different sound, you know, such a and really such a decidedly 80s sound, which is one of the things that had bothered me earlier on. So once I sort of got to the point where I could really get into this, which really was just a matter of sitting on fucking listening to it for real. I mean, Burning For You, if that's the most odious hit you ever hear, then you're never going to think that people get tired of fucking hits because that song just stays good, you know? And Joan Crawford, I mean, that piano intro is one of the, like, a lot of times, like, a piano intro like that that's kind of long and tends to get lengthened in live performances is going to bore me after a while. But not that one, man. I can still listen to it all the way through. You know, that whole song, I think, is just brilliant. I really do. It kind of has that menace a little bit. You know, it kind of has the goofiness, too. But um, it doesn't doesn't really seem to crack much of a smile with it. Maybe just a little one, a really tiny one, but only a little bit, you know? And I love that about it. Um, Don't Turn Your Back feels like another one of those sort of closer songs to me, you know, but not as effective as some of the earlier ones. By that metric, I don't think it holds up, but on its own terms, I think it's pretty fine. Uh, Same with After Dark. They kind of have a similar vibe to me. Um, But I like the fact that After Dark is a little more forward, you know, belongs early in the record for that, too, you know. Uh, Fire of Unknown Origin, right out of the gate, is one of my very favorite songs on here, too, man. It's just so, and it kind of comes down to that vocal delivery, too, that sort of performance, that kind of epicness. Um, Yeah, and I don't know. I feel like I'm starting to repeat myself. Veteran of the Psychic Wars is probably my favorite song on here, too, though. Just an all time classic song. It's amazing. It's so simple, but so effective and just perfect. You know, I mean, not there isn't complicated shit in there, but the basic idea is just so simple. Yeah, I mean, you have this great, dr- this great drummer, and yeah, like what he's doing, and that's what I say. Like this whole thing, it's like let's come up with the core part that drives it and deliver that again and again, so it's less elaborate, but 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 more focused. And that that song is a great example of that. Yeah. Incidentally, it's like given Martin Birch's reputation, it's kind of hard to think of a band that's probably more suited to working with him than a uh, Blue Oyster Cult, you know? I don't know that much about his reputation. Oh, yeah, he has this reputation to be like a real like Taskmaster, like a thousand takes of everything. Okay. Like, you do, like you do it a hundred thousand times, unless I'm confusing him with someone, but I think that's Martin Birch. Yeah. Oh, it's like uh, uh, Bruce Dickinson was saying in uh, the beginning of uh, Number of the Beast. 
that scream he does on it. Martin Birch had him do a million takes of it where at the point where Bruce was throwing chairs and fuck you and right. and he ended up using like the first take or something after all the shit he put him through. Kind of funny. But no, he's definitely he wants the best, you know. Yeah. 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 I've heard a lot of bands that are really kind of hating it because of that. He just wears them down. But but the corollary is for in a case like Blue Oyster Cult, when the band is so well rehearsed and just so tight, like as a unit. It could have been a dream. I mean, I don't know. For all I know, they hated each other, especially because they're probably all doing a lot of coke and that. Yeah, I mean, again, they they did they did two albums with him, but that second one, it was with those parameters of someone needs to be with me the whole time. So that to me doesn't mean like he had a great experience the first time. It's like yeah. things have to be a little bit different round two. Well, the proof is in the pudding. Whatever yep. he puts, whatever hoops he makes him jump through, the end result is really really good. Um, Alan. Fire of Unknown Origin. Yeah, so this one was a little bit of a grower for me. First time or two I played it, it didn't really click very much, and I started to worry this might be Cultosaurus Part 2. Um, but with repeated tra uh, spins of it, you know, a song would start to sink in here, another one would sink in there. So it got to the point where I actually liked this one quite a bit. Um, I like the mood of the album overall. Like Craig said, it's a very consistent album, um, kind of similar to the first one. Uh, what have we got? All that said, I still am not nuts about the opener, Fire of Unknown Origin. But you know, Burning For You is one of those classic rock songs that just works. And I don't really get tired of that track, so good there. Veteran of the Psychic Wars, I'm on the same page with everybody else. It's a great track, really well done. Uh, definitely my favorite one that Moorcock uh, helped write. Um, the highlight for the album, pretty easily. Yep. Uh, other ones, I'm not going to go through every track, but yeah, Vengeance is good, as Lazarus and some folks were mentioning. That's one of the songs that was written for the heavy metal soundtrack, but then didn't make it into the heavy metal soundtrack uh, for heavy metal, the animated movie. Yeah, After Dark is pretty cool. Joan Crawford I like. It's got that weird kind of, again, the kind of gothy uh, sounding, <laughs> slightly you know, creepy vibe to it. And of course, you know, kind of you know, very effed up kind of subject matter as well. And yeah, and Don't uh, Turn Your Back closes the album out really well. So yeah, it's turned into you know, a very consistent album that I like quite a bit. And I've got it ranked pretty high. Yeah, actually, I thought so. I've got it ranked second. Um after oh, wow. uh, Agents of Fortune. So, and again, this is one, it might slide down a few spots. Uh, check back a year or two from now, a couple of the other albums might have crept up, and maybe this one doesn't come in quite as high. But it, the consistency, uh, you know, with Psychic Wars, Burning for You, uh, Joan Crawford, you know, it's got several songs that are. So, yeah, it worked its way up pretty high up the ladder by the time uh, I'd finished playing it. What do, you, what do you think of it? I never seen it. I put it at number four. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah, Mr. Aaron. I didn't know if you drank it before I got back. I had to go take care of the pets for a couple of minutes there. I um. So, no where'd you got it, Marty? This is my number two, and it and it kind of surprised me to be honest because I've had this record for a long time. I've always listened to it and liked it. Um, I in fact before I started playing, I wrote the line: "Why is this album so revered?" I wanted to, to focus on that because I, I remembered it being a different way than it really is. And I ended up spinning this a couple times this week. And I think the Martin Birch factor is a very uh, evident thing. The production is really solid. It mm -hmm. sounds like Blue Oyster Cult. Um, even the hit Burning For You. This is just a combination that they got perfectly right. It's not it's just a good radio hit. You know, you got that Chickawaka guitar with that walking bass line and the super smooth, like butter fucking vocals. I mean, absolutely great. Um, working man's type of vocal range. He just sings in a sweet spot. It's just, it's just really, really good for the song. Um, veterans of the psychic wars, weird and heavy, a very cool song. Vengeance, another heavy track with complex layers and synth. Um, Joan Crawford, odd choice, but it works. Don't turn your back. Um, does anyone else get music from the elder vibe from this song? No, but I will bring that up with a different with a different uh, album. I just the way the the whole song feels. 
It reminded me. It could have sat on music from the elder and and. I know in what there. you're saying. I know what you're saying. I think they they do land closer to music from the elder on another one, but I know what you're saying. Yeah, oh. and that, that right there, I love that record. I yep. love I love that. It, you uh, got shift. me into that. I'm 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 with you on that. Other yeah. than uh, with the one or two, uh, you know, one or two dreadful songs that are on yeah. there, but mostly I like it. And they shed they shed those those things elements that have been bothering me for multiple albums leading up to this and it's just blue oyster cult doing what they do really well and writing good songs and martin birch really got some good takes out of these guys not that they needed that i mean they're very accomplished well-oiled machine at this point don't get me wrong but i mean it's the same thing with maiden birch and maiden is a perfect combination when birch left maiden Maiden started getting squirrely, and now you know, now it's just a, a train wreck of a shit show. But you know, forgive people that are that love the new turn of Maiden with Kevin Shirley. I'm not a fan, but um, this is my number two. I'm really surprised it ranked up so high. I I get why it gets the buzz. It's just a solid record, and it's a very unassuming record. Other than "Burning for You," which is the obvious hit, the other songs aren't really you know, jump out at you super. It's just a thinking. It's like a thinking man's thinking person's um, album. There's a lot to digest. There's a lot to chew on. And um, they make you like it with just really good songwriting and good choices and great singing. I, it's, it's an awesome album. I'm really impressed with it. Very I, much. I, one thing I'll just point out in terms of the production, because there's a, there's a beefiness to it, yep. uh, a little less subtlety and a little bit more, Kind of, kind of compression and i wonder i'm looking like in terms of what is this 81 that this came out yep, is that, yeah. mm -hmm. where were cassettes at this time because i like i've listened They're to this still album. a thing <laughs> no no like like so like i've listened to this album on cassette and record and cd yeah uh, and i'm like this one sound this one this one i feel i'm losing less than many of the others on cassette and i don't know if that's a thought when they're going in the studio at the at the time but like the punchiness and like, like this this shit you can blast it in your car and you're not gonna you're not gonna be missing some of the stuff. It's all really present and, and deliberate and there it's a less dynamic but but beefier. Yeah. Recorded analog for analog. You yeah. know. All right, we are into we're getting there, folks. <laughs> um Revolution by Night, nineteen eighty three. That's how so, oh, yeah, yeah. so this is this is the third and the last one. I actually these. have this one. <laughs> yeah, this is the third and the last one of these that we'll get to. Uh, again, this is my introduction to Blue Oyster Cult, so I, I have the fondness in terms of those memories, but I do not listen to this album, um, mainly because uh, you've got a lot of um, Bloom yelling, and I, like you know, I don't want to I don't want to rip too mercilessly on this guy. He sung so much of my like favorite music, and he wrote a ton of it. Um, this album I will always have in my collection because this album has. Veterans of the Psychic Wars. The live version of that on this album, I'll say for the third time, is my favorite guitar solo in recorded music history. It is absolutely stunning. And uh, it's, it's incredible. None of these other songs do I like as much as the studio versions. Um, I, I don't like Roadhouse Blues. And I like some Doors stuff. But if they want to cover the Doors, give me Riders on the Storm. Give me an actually great Doors song. Uh, or give me The End or Peace Frog. Like, I like some doors, but like Roadhouse Blues, I do not want to hear. I believe Robbie Krieger's on this. I believe when I saw them with John K. John K. Steppenwolf, Robbie Krieger came on the stage. This was like 1990 in Florida, and I think he joined them. And I was like, uh oh, means they're going to play Roadhouse Blues. <laughs> but I, I don't like, like, I, like, he, Dr. Me, like, all of the kind of shouting. I mean, like, basically, this thing has, this album has two things for me. It's got the incredible veterans of the psychic wars and Eric Bloom saying, well, Kipsy sold out to the maximum. That's kind of it. Like I, like I, I listen to this version of veterans of the psychic wars all the time. because It's my favorite guitar solo, but like to hear these versions of this song, these songs, like they're just shoutier. Um, and, uh, and I don't enjoy them. I like, I don't enjoy any of them as much. Joan, like admit it, like Joan Crawford, Burning for you, don't fear the reaper. Those are all in the ballpark. Like, but when 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 it's when it's Bloom shouting through Albert Bouchard stuff, you know, I'm just I, I just don't enjoy it. Yeah. 
All right, so so I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. I actually love this record. Of the three live records we've, we've talked about then with this one, this is probably my favorite. Um, I just think it's the best track list, and I really enjoy the performances. And uh, I could talk about the individuals, but a lot of it would be this retreading to the same ground. Um, oh, fuck it. I don't want to go down for another tangent. I'll just go. All right. <laughs> what you got? We got Revolution by Night. Revolution by night. Um, so we're here into the darkness. Um, where did I, I, I remember where I was? So I got this one in, uh, I'm gonna say it was 96. Uh, so it wasn't the first wave of albums. This was one I was just like in the what is it, JP Richards or whatever that thing was that or like the mute some someplace like that, or like some like it was. And I walked in and I saw this thing. I'm like, I don't know what this is. And it was probably in one of those like cheap deal or whatever. I'm like, I've never heard of this album. And this one took me a while to really just like kind of get behind or understand. Like the elephant in the room uh, is, well, there are several elephants. Let's say the biggest one that I'm sure like, you know, Marty is uh, like I w winced when he heard it are all the electronic toms and the ultra 80s production choices. And uh, like I'm not going to defend those; those aren't things that I that I like. Uh, but I, I I really like this album. I, I rate it. Uh, I I think that there's fantastic stuff on this. Uh, you know, when I when I like if someone said, "Show me what a good singer uh, Eric Bloom is," maybe the first thing I would pick is "Take Me Away." And I remember the first time I heard that song, which was they were playing with Uriah Heep and Nazareth in Long Island in 1992. And I, I didn't have this album then. And I was like, I've got to get whatever album has that take me away. And I didn't find it for years. And then when I got this, I'm like, oh, it's that song I've been looking for for four years or whatever. But like the take me away, like that is great. Like that is like, like Bloom, Bloom's performance on this album. This album isn't as good as Fire of Unknown Origin. But like this was, I think, the last time he leveled up. And I mean, he leveled up from like being a great vocalist to an excellent vocalist. Uh, but I, I think I think this is this is a real peak for him. I mean, I've seen record like, man, he's unbelievable and and held that for a while. Like seeing them live throughout the 90s, he could regularly out sing anything on the albums of, of his own performances. It wasn't until like 2001 that I heard him start to strain. Uh, so take me away. I think that song is incredible. Aldo Nova was involved. Um, I liked them dealing with like you know space alien abduction. It's a cool. It's a cool spot. It's a little less obscure, but good subject matter for them. Eyes of Fire, which I think some random other dude wrote, and I don't know the some maybe someone named Winter or, or, or something, but not like Edgar Winter, who wrote this. Yeah, thing. Greg. Uh, Greg Winter. Okay, so Eyes of Fire, beautiful singing from Bloom. So that was the turning point when I was like not really liking this album other than uh, well, initially I got I'm like, I like Take Me Away and I like Dragon Lady and most of the rest of it I didn't care for when I heard it like in 96. Uh, Eyes, of Fi Eyes on Fire, at some point I realized like how good the singing is in this. Like, holy shit, like this is like peak Dio. This is fantastic singing. Um, and uh, Shooting Shark. So this is another one. Like I heard a different version and then realized how good this song was. Like I saw them do it live and they're doing some like monster 10 minute version. Uh, it's extra guitar solos instead of a sax. So that, that for me is an upgrade usually. Uh, and in this case is an upgrade. Uh, and that, you know, that song is really like, like that's very, so like you can say fire of unknown origin is eighties and it's, but it's a metal album. Like it has a metal sound. It's their most metal album. Let's say half of the tracks are metal, half are hard rock. They're somewhere in there. This album is not. This is a different side of the 80s. They're taking in lots more overt, like synthesizer stuff and like shooting shark. Like this is like, like you've got some like pluck bass. I don't know who's playing it. I don't think it's Joe. Um, but like it, it, like this is some like giant song where they're, it's starting to feel more like a studio project. Uh, and as a fan of Alan Parsons' project, I'm not going to say that's a bad thing. It's a different thing for them because I think prior to this album, they always felt like a band. Shooting Shark does not, to me, feel like a band. It feels like something composed in the studio by awesome people. And um, so I enjoy Shooting Sharks. 
that shooting shark that's one that also there are live versions of it that are completely another level veins for me is the dud i just can't stand that chorus um that's just it's just forced shadow of california is the only is the other one that i'm like sort of okay on but that one i think also has the symbol remains uh line which would be the you know the their, their newest their newest album um but like shadows of california like this is still along the lines of shooting shark. Like they're like kind of like, you know, like just sort of moving around and at this tempo, if it was a little bit quicker, this would just be a dance song. And um, like, you know, I enjoy some dance music. It's not what you're expecting from them. The producers, Bruce Fairbane. What is, is this like a, is this like a Van Halen guy? What's Fairbane about? He's a big name. I'm just, no. I'm blanking on what he's done, but he is a, he is a major producer. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Van Halen, uh, but but a ton of other things like maybe White Snake, a, a bunch of different things, and so this this production is pretty puzzling, and uh, but you're also getting the strangeness of BOC with the the, the like the night makes right, ah the symbol remains like this is the band that did Golden Age of Leather right now it sounds like a studio project, and uh, but it's a different thing so. Shadow California, I like. I like less. Oh, here we go. Randy Jackson played bass on Shooting Star Shark. Okay, there you go. Someone else played like a yeah. completely different style. So here, so the, the the song that I find kind of most interesting, other than "Take Me Away," which I I, I think is, uh, I'm, I'm I'm it's a toss up for the highlight because "Feel the Thunder" written entirely by Bloom. I feel like this was for whatever reason Bloom on his own decided he's going to do some sort of sequel to Golden Age of Leather. And not just because it's the motorcycle thing, but the arrangement on this thing, it's sort of like, it's a little hint at where they're going to go in Imaginos. But this is like, I think the chorus is pretty good. I think the rest of the song is excellent. Um, this is really like, it really feels larger than a band. And it's starting to feel like Studio Project, Symphonic, Alan Parsons Project, like a different a different thing. And this Feel the Thunder feels really big. And, uh, you know, and then some of the high notes, like the feel the thunder, like when he's pushing up really at the high at the end, it's, um, it's great. Oh, these are these, the Fairbane, those are the Fairbane people. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, he's a huge name. Uh, and it doesn't sound like any of the other things he produced. It's, it's like this really eighties kind of embracing synth and space and studio projects and all that kind of stuff. But feel the thunder, I think. I don't, the main chorus I think is pretty good, but I think the rest of that, um, like there's gothic, there's like a bit of like, like Nos, like Nosferatu is happening in there. Like that one is just a gem. If the chorus is great, that this would be easily my favorite song on the album. And I think a great song, as is, I think it's a very good song that has like an okay chorus. But at the end, they chop the chorus in half. He sings higher notes and it's a better chorus. Uh, Let Go is a party song. They actually, I think there's like dollar, dollar, dollar. Like this is, this, like, I enjoy it. Like, I can understand why Marty, why Marty is gonna like um, defecate on this song. It's a straight up party. It's a straight up party song. As party is the most partying kiss or Van Halen tune. <laughs> um, then you get Dragon Lady, which is like, like, for lack of a better term, like a steering heavy blues tune. Like it's doing through, like going through all these scales. The runs are really nice. The na -na 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 -na. And uh, the uh, buck singing is really nice. Um, the, like, particularly just his phrasing. And I'd say this is another one where I'm thinking of Thin Lizzy and like the expert phrasing of Phil Lynn. It was like, out of the, like for man's desire. And he's just like, he's just kind of like, there's so much momentum going with this thing. He's so comfortable just giving you this kind of soulful, as Marty said, like blue collar, like working class Vogel doesn't need to do any oversell with this. And then yeah. you get that. Dragon ladies by the heart, and, you know, and those like the punch in the punches for that are really, really strong. You get incendiary lead guitars, uh, and then you get the, the, the last song you get Joe Bouchard flying in for um, Light Years of Love, which is uh, a really pretty song. I, I don't know, I can't think of another song offhand where a wind sound effect adds quite as much as, as it does in this. I've never known if the guitar, if, the, if it's acoustic guitar or mandolin in there, it sounds like someone is playing in the mandolin style if it is not an actual mandolin. But yeah. super. 
Uh, so a really lovely conclusion um, uh, of, you know, a, a, of an album I, I enjoy quite a bit. Again, I, I rate it as, a, as an eight, uh, and that one has gone up over, over the years. I mean, for me, it's just like Veins I don't like, and Shadow California uh, and Let uh, let Go, I could, you know, take or leave. It's you're, you're sort of in and out on that quickly. But Feel the Thunder, Dragon Lady, Light Years of Love, Take Me Away, Eyes on Fire. So this is a lot of shooting shark. This is a lot of really good stuff here. And partly because this has this 80s sound, so many of the songs, maybe all of the songs I've seen them uh, do off of, uh, of this album, which not, not a ton now that I think about it. Right? Like, it's a lot of Take Me Away. Um, maybe I've seen Dragon Lady. Not sure on that. But, like, it's going to set, like, there's a Take Me Away version that they recorded on in 89 with the... With the um, uh, I think it's Rick Downey is the drummer here, but the 89, they had a different drummer, a, a, a fantastic drummer, uh, Chuck Berge. And uh, yeah, like it's, it's great. Like these, these songs were songs that they could improve live, partly because the sound isn't, uh, isn't, isn't great because uh, of the sort of the 80s synth aspect and the guitars are a bit cloudy and the, the, all the, you know, the electronic toms. And I mean, like, Shooting charts, man. I'm not positive that's a drummer going on there. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know that that's the case. So, anyways, that's my thought on Revolution by Night. Revolution by Night! <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, so this record... I, I'm really kind of fascinated by this record. Like, I really am because um, I absolutely love it. Like, this, this is really high up there for me, this record. And... Um, it would probably be easier for me to go through and tell you what I hate about this record. And like, there's so many things about this record that are like designed to piss me off. And somehow the whole just comes together in a way that I just completely buy into. So I feel like when I listen to this record, like I'm learning something about myself in the process. You know what I mean? Like this record has chipped away decades of built up hostility and uh, just venom towards anything like 80s synth, 80s production, and all the shit that this thing, that this record is just dripping with. And like, it's chipped down into like a little core. And like, not only is what I'm finding in that core, like actually kind of soft, but it's warm too. And this fucking record. So like, take me away. Uh, take me away is just fucking great. Just a great opening riff right out of the gate. Just a fucking banger. I'd never heard this before. This was like, not only was this like one of the bad Blue Oyster Cult records like Mirrors, but like this wasn't even the original band anymore by this point, right? Like I didn't know all the ins and outs, but you know, I knew that much. So it was like, this one's really going to be crap, you know? So they come out with that fucking riff and I was like, holy shit, you know what I mean? I mean, admittedly I was in the middle of a big kick, but blue, and then like that whole vocal line, the whole labor, like everything about it is great. Just like from start to finish, that song was just fucking brilliant. Yep. Eyes on Fire, total fucking AOR crap, dude. Oh my God. That fucking chorus, that could, it's not quite Asia. <laughs> but like, it def, like if you heard like James Rolfe's fucking band, Rex Viper, if they used that song in one of his little parody things, it wouldn't surprise you. You know what I mean? So the vocal performance doesn't doesn't sell. You just hate it. I, well, here's the thing: I have no business liking that song, but I actually love it. Yeah, no, I, I that was the turning point. Was that that was the song that I was like, what? Because it also because it comes off of like one of their best songs ever would take me away, and then yeah. you go straight to. It's not like track three where you got two rockers in a row. You got no, one no. incredible soaring rocker, and then you go straight to a ballad. Dude, see, here's the thing. Shooting Shark, like, like when I first, when I was listening to this record, I was like, I, I heard that second song, okay, fucking Eyes on Fire. Remember, this, 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 this is the perspective that you get when, like, you don't read anything about the band or do anything. You just listen to the record and just take it on its all by itself in a vacuum. Yeah. So, like, so all I'm working with at this point is fucking Eyes on Fire and Take Me Away. So we're out with a banger, right? 
the fucking Soldiers Under Command is a really good song. The whole rest of that Striper record sucks, right? So I was like, okay, I have to take me away. That second song was, you know, so where are we going? It goes into Shooting Shark. It has that slappy shit on the bass, the boom, boom. It has that boom, like that sort of like open chord, like 80s shit. It has those fucking vocals. It's striper albums. <laughs> I have like <laughs> three. But I, I didn't mean, know they had that many fucking albums. Holy crap! <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> just a brief, just a brief aside. Their their more recent album, No More Hell to Pay, career highlight. Like this is this is the like maybe the only one of these bands in the second coming where their best album is way late into their career. No more. Hell to I, I thought I thought Goddamn Evil blew away anything we did in the eighties easily. Ch okay, so you've listened to you've listened to some of the. That one you said me though, I really like. It's good. Yeah. Anyways, we shouldn't go on a striper tangent. When yeah, no, that's, that's, Ellen, that's, Ellen's about ready to die and get divorced at the same time. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Shooting Shark, though, if you like try to design a song, like all that shit, and then like that fucking sax in there too, is that like David Sanborn or some shit? But you know something? It's fucking great. It just, it just, it just works. It just hits me right. And then fucking um, Veins, to me, Veins is like the. Except maybe for Shadow of California, it's probably a tie. But like Veins might be the best song on here where they like sort of pull off that low key menace thing. In fact, because it's lower key than Shadows of California, I've got to give it to Veins. But that's the song that's like that's like um, that that's like the unknown tongue song on this record. This is like the bro the sibling to unknown tongue is Veins on this record. As far as how they sort of work for me. Shadow of California is epic and grandiose and huge, and it's loaded with all these weird, cheesy synths, like what Craig was talking about, and these fucking toms and shit, but just fucking great. There's a coldness to it. There's a coldness to this whole record, which really is another thing that sets it apart from the other records, right? Like, that warmth is gone. It sounds sort of like uh, clinical. It sounds metal. It doesn't sound wood. You know what I mean? I mean, like physical, not like heavy metal music. I mean, like actual, you know, it's a metaphor I'm going for with that. Yeah, Feel the Thunder almost feels throwaway in the middle there, but it's a really cool song. And, you know, I never, I never quite thought of this this way before, but I think that that song works for me because it kind of takes Golden Age of Leather and takes out the parts of Golden Age of Leather that I wasn't quite buying. Like that vocal part at the beginning. I respect the fact that they do that live. Right. But... I was never really buying that as like an intro for the song. And I still kind of don't, you know, it's like, uh, it doesn't make me mad, but you know, this jettisons that, and it kind of keeps that sort of bloom aspect of it, but it has the weirdness too, you know, let go. Uh, that, if there's a song even more than shooting shark that was designed for me to hate it, it's fucking let go because it's that kind of, it's, it's like a crowd pleaser type thing. And they say, go see in it. I mean, my God, dude, you can be whatever you want to be. That's like the worst fucking thing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, you know, it's not terrible. I, I I don't even skip past it, man. I'm like, you know, something I should hate this, but I, I'm totally fine with this. And then Dragon Lady is um, that's another one where I think Buck Dharma's vocal really works. I mean, like you were saying too, it's sort of that low key delivery too. It feels a little bit faster than what it actually is because it's performed in sort of a hectic way, as sort of a mid pace song. And then Light Years of Love is sort of like the, you know, the, the opener, sort of the resolution song. And uh, it feels like it's, pro it's way weaker than the other ones that I've talked about. But in a way, I feel like Light Years of Love resolves this album more completely than Redeemed does or Debbie Denise does or some of those other closing songs. So, yeah. So let me see where I put this. But um, I actually am pretty. Uh, yeah, I, I get to put this one at number three. <laughs> me too. <laughs> yep. All right, Alan. All right. Um, yeah, every time I listen to that record, I'm sorry. Every time I listen to that record, I go, why do I like this? I can't believe it. It challenges me in a way that almost no other record does. Like, just for that, I have to give it, like, a lot of credit. Right. And some, and some of that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Like, I have those biases, uh, you know, a lot of those biases, you, you, you know, that you speak of as well. Uh, but some of it is, like, it goes to the core strength of, like, you know, and at this point, it really is much more – it's Eric Bloom and, and, and Buck Dharma and Lanier is there adding yeah. his declarations, but in terms of song, it's song studio, writing, like you said, yeah. Yeah. And, and, but like, it goes to the core strength of their ideas and like, like, 
like although it was a much richer palette when they were painting with five brushes with the band like those two guys like like again like boom yeah. performance on this is incredible buck dharma greatest guitarist of all time like so they're doing that like they're continuing to be those people and they play and you can watch stuff like live things from this era and it is like every show and they're playing in front of a hundred people in a bowling like in a bowling alley or whatever and it doesn't matter it's like they're 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 that so like as musicians they're just continuing to push themselves you know push themselves forward and and, and keep doing it so like I, I think like a lot of it just speaks to the strength of the core ideas uh because a lot of that superficial stuff hey like you're talking to something like one of my favorite judas priest albums is ram it down that has everything wrong with it it's straight up drum machine stuff. <laughs> uh, but like you know there's like there, like i hear monsters of rock at the end of that thing and i want to like smash through walls it's so awesome you know like so like like it can if the core ideas are there um i kind of have your back on that one a little what I kind of have your back on Ram It Down a little. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Alan. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, folks have covered this one pretty well. Uh, this was the first one, yeah, with kind of a noticeable lineup change with Albert out of the band. Um, so, yeah, that core group not quite there. Uh, Martin Birch definitely not producing this one. So, uh, yeah, very different sound in terms of production. Um, I, I agree. It's actually, while there's a lot of things that could easily make this a bad album it's actually a pretty enjoyable one it is an 80s album no doubt but that shouldn't be too surprising it's recorded in 1983 by a you know, high profile band who was doing a pretty okay job of you know trying to adapt to a new musical landscape um you know they were you know quick to get on the mtv circuit and start making use of video early on there's a video for shooting shark um which, as some folks were talking about in the chat a couple of minutes ago, you know, it's you know got its you know '80s cheesiness about the video. It's also got kind of a dark theme to it. It's another Patti Smith uh, written song, which you know again is all these fucked up relationship kind of things. But yeah, I agree. The album starts really good. Take me away. The uh, the one co-written with Aldo Nova, really cool track. Um, kind of like a lot of Aldo Nova stuff that I've heard. Uh, Eyes of Fire, good track. Shooting Shark, good track. So yeah, the album gets you know up and running pretty good. I don't mind Veins. It's not the best one on the album, but uh, it's not <laughs> not terrible. You're all snoozing on Veins, man. Um, ah, so I'm saying it's okay. Yeah, I got yeah, it. I got it. I got it covered on here. <laughs> I'm saying it's okay. You know, side two isn't as strong for me as side a. So this is where, you know, it lost some points, not for anything egregious. Uh, you know, the songs just haven't clicked with me as much. You've got, you know, the two back-to-back -back biker tracks with shadow of California and feel the thunder. Let it go is definitely, as Craig said, you know, a slip into just, you know, eighties, you know, mom and dad are out of town and you know, you know, get you know, wheezy and you know, cluey and gizzy over here and buy a kegger. <laughs> and, uh, you got the power. We got the key. <laughs> you be any cornier, man. It, 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 it's yeah. really cool. What could you add to that to make it cornier? There's nothing. I, it, it's, it's a, you know, it's all this said, you know, I'm having some fun with it. It's not a bad song. It is a little strange to hear Blue Oyster Cult do that kind of song. Donald, this band, Donald. you know, that has you know all these different poets and stuff that you know, and, you know they you know, associate with literary figures and have all these obtuse lyrics, and now it's just like B O Z, and it's like yeah, but they always had one wild in their set list too. You know, there was always they always kind of had that side to them, or ME two sixty two. You know. Yeah, no, they do. It's just, but even that one, I mean, I mean, he's two sixty two. You know, has all these you know weird lyrics. You know about you know it's you know, oh, yeah. ger you know advanced German fighter jet from World War Two. This one is it's like born to be. You get the power, we get the key. Yeah. There's <laughs> it's kind of gone from like you know three levels of depth to you know the single right. entendre as such. The flatland, yeah. <laughs> it's not a it's not a bad song for what it is. It it is just strange to hear Blue Oyster Cult kind of dumb it down to that level but you're right Alan. i mean it's not the first time they've done it certainly not the last time they do it um they yeah light, it. light years if you love is kind of you know the pretty you know outro ballad track so it closes the album and wraps it up puts a nice pretty bow on it 
so yeah, it's a perfectly fine 80s album if you're wanting something that, you know, yeah, you know, harkens back to, you know, 70s hard rock ethos. No, that's not, you know, fully here. But there's still good musicianship. There's still good songwriting. It's just, yeah, it's 10 years later, and so it's going to sound different. Um, I've got the album kind of ranked in the middle. I've got it ranked at nine. Uh, and this is one, it could easily be a couple of spots higher over time. There's some other albums that might you know, creep ahead of it uh, as well over time. So, you know, nine may not sound like a particularly high ranking, but overall, you know, I'm pretty enthusiastic on the album. It definitely gets, you know, strong thumbs up. It's just, you know, they've got a good catalog. So it's kind of hard to, you know, push some of these albums up higher, even though they've got a lot of good things going for them. So that is my take on Revolution by Night. I can't um, wait to hear what Marty thinks. Marty, what is your take on this one? My number three, believe it or not. <laughs> and I, I don't know if it's they're coming off of a, a career reset with Fire of Unknown Origin, and it ranks really high in their catalog for me. Um, there's a lot of good songs on this, even though they started incorporating more of an 80s vibe to it kind of the sign of the times i get it they really kind of go full guns into that on the next album but um yeah i really like the good full production um with very cohesive energy there's a good cohesive energy on this record um songs take me away great playing and a very unique rocker veins i love the solo work on it amazing solo work on that like the song or not listen to the solos solo's great fantastic oh, uh, yes the solo's great rest of the album it all congeals into i think a very well considered album um you guys have covered it extensively i'm just going to move on to the next one club ninja 1985 i just i, I want to just mention one quick aside um because we we went past the time when during this period uh buck dharma put out this solo album i should have taken out the vinyl but uh, called flat out and uh, I have a whole, and we're not going to go through uh, like almost any of this stuff. I have a whole lot of uh, Blue Oyster Cult adjacent, solo Blue Oyster Cult, all of this sort of stuff. Um, certainly, if no one, if you haven't explored the stuff outside of just Blue Oyster Cult catalog, but you like them, this is the this is the best thing there is. This is this is at the time of Fire of Unknown Origin. He made a solo album. It's really good. It would rate around eight in this discography. Uh, this is this is the the highlight of all the other kind of solo experiences I've, I've heard from these guys. So now I'll get back on I'll get back on track. Uh, I actually don't have the vinyl for this one, uh, so we're on, we're on uh, we're going to Club Ninja. So for a very long time, uh, I was um, concerned about getting this album. I'd already become like a big big fan of this band. They're on on their way to being my favorite band of all time, but like. It's called Club Ninja. There's like a space station on the on, on the cover. It's like, I, what you know, what's what's going on here? A um, lot of questions, confusion. Um, I like the album. I have it as ten, uh, but again, like for me, like things have to go up and down, and a lot of why things are lower on this list just has to do with song consistency. That's like a huge determiner for me. That's the way my music taste has changed most over time. And why a bunch of Iron Maiden albums that I enjoyed when I was younger, I just don't enjoy now or rate lowers because consistency is so important to me. So like an album like Number of the Beast, I don't like half of that album. I never listened to that album. And there's great songs on that album. But man, I don't need to hear Gangland or Invaders ever again. I'm a big uh, Prisoner fan. Good song. Uh, but I, I digress. But it's to say like, Everything on this, I like every Blue Oyster Cult album with Mirrors being the only borderline. So although I give this a 10, there's a lot to like about it. First, let me point out Tommy Price, or perhaps as the spelling of his name might indicate. Oh, not here. Here it's Tommy Price, no H. I see its name spelled other places with an H, and 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 but I don't question that it is Tommy Price. Uh, but so this guy is sitting at the kit. Rick Downey was sitting at the kit. For whatever point anyone was any human being was sitting at a kit for revolution by night uh, and certainly lots you know like good chunks of that sound like um drum machine uh to me so this album has this guy tommy price and uh i i think worth pointing out the first three songs have no blue oyster cult members writing them at all 
Uh, and I, there's nothing like that in their history. So one might draw conclusions as to where they were in their career that all of this, like they have an album that has three songs in a row, including one by um, Bob Halligan, uh, not written by any members of the band. So in terms of creatively where they are, like, I, I don't know. I, I actually haven't heard that much talk about this because most of the candid talk I hear about this band comes from Albert Bouchard and he wasn't really involved with this stage. If I can cut in for just a minute, Craig. Yeah. A couple of things to point out here. Oh, this, is the, this is the, uh, this is Alan Lanier's left the band at this point because he was dissatisfied with kind of the direction the band was going on the last well, that's album. Like this is Dvojnik or something like that. Like, yeah. So Yep, and yeah. um, and the previous album you know, had definitely taken a big dip in sales compared to you know the previous uh, two albums. Uh, Fire and Unknown Origin, of course, had Burning for You. You know, sales had gone back up. They were on the uptick. Uh, as much as we all spoke very positively of Revolution by Night, it did not perform well as an album. You know, even sure. Shooting Shark was only kind of got into like you know the middle of the chart somewhere. So yeah, you know, there, there were definitely, I, I, I can imagine some people, you know, behind the scenes starting to get panicky a, after that album. And as such, maybe trying to bring in a lot of fresh faces or whatever to, to try yeah. to do something at this point. So yeah, sorry I, to I, cut in. Go ahead, please. No, 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 go, go for it. I, I, I mean, that's, that's all, that's all good to know. I just like, I just question this, but to get to the actual album. So white flags, I think is great. I, I love that opener. And I bring up the drummer straight away, Tommy Price, because so Bouchard is great. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of his. He's, he's certainly a hero of, of mine as a singer, drummer, songwriter kind of, kind of dude. Uh, the drumming on, on White Flags is incredible. Like this is some journeyman or like some, some like seasoned veteran stuff. Like, like this is like you got like some Vinnie Apice. And then a little bit Alan White on Yes, his best album, which is of course drama, and um, but you get all of the like the all this kind of like start, stop, start, and throughout the verse. And in a way, it sort of like parallels the Corporal's Burn, where you have these crazy fills throughout the duration of these verses, and then they all lock in, and then they kind of go to burn, and then it's hooked in the pocket. And so this has um, this has these. All these all kind of these great little moments of uh, just syncopation and just drums landing in space, and then they all go forward with uh, you know with the chorus. Uh, and I, I think the song is great, but like a particularly good drum performance by this guy who's also on the next album, uh, "Dancing in the Ruins." To me, surprising this is not a BOC song. This to me sounds straight up like a Buck Dharma song. That's always a surprise when I look and see it is written by L. Gottlieb and Jay Scanlon. Uh, whoever these people are, but it's it's not a great song, but it's a good it's a good like lesser lesser tier, uh, you know like uh, buck buck tune and very very enjoyable. And then we get to make rock not war by uh, Bob Halligan, and um, you know this is this is a dude who's funneling some stuff into Priest and I believe Rainbow maybe uh, is all night long his or since you've been gone since you've been gone Halligan as well. Rainbow, I think it is, but he's doing that sort of stuff. And Make Rock at War is one of those songs, and it's kind of it's a little bit like I mean, this is the closest they ever came to doing a song that could go on like uh, Ram It Down or uh, you know, like no, like no or point or, 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 take or you know, or what like take these chains. He wrote that, right? Yeah, that's how, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so on screaming for vengeance, then yeah, I'll just fill in that if you got it. Yeah, yeah. So so like that. So that sort of thing. Like, um, but I enjoy like I, like it has that weird like that weird mechanical sound that I enjoy in the production. The make rock that or I don't know what it is like a metal whip. I'm not sure with an industrial sieve being closed hmm. quickly. I can't tell you what that thing is supposed to be, but I I, I enjoy the tune. Um, and, and again, but, uh, Bloom's getting a little shoutier here, but I still enjoy him. Then Perfect Water, and this is a, this is a uh, this is a great this is a this is a Buck song that I was like I hadn't really paid much attention to it. And then in the live shows, where of course they're having their live organic sound as opposed to this kind of 
more 80s, 80s style sound. Though, though Sandy Perlman, I believe, is involved again to some extent um, with, with this one. Uh, maybe he put, did he produce it? Let's see that. He helped, he contributed yeah. at least on one song on site. Yeah, produced by Sandy Perlman. So I, I like sort of surprising that he's not contributing more in terms of the writing, uh, actually contributing to, I think, the worst song on the album. But uh, Perfect Water is one that uh, I always thought, like, I enjoyed it on the album. And I remember I saw this once live. I'm like, this song is incredible. My life has changed for the better. <laughs> and they really, like, this is the magic of this band that they find both look like Shooting Sharks and Perfect Water, kind of the two songs where, like, they didn't really stand out for me on the album. And then I see some mesmerizing live performance. And then I go back. I'm like, oh, the core ideas here were always great. I just didn't notice it. Workshop, the telescope is sort of, sort of similar. So that happens. And, um, you know, that's a really good song. And then A Spy in the House of the Night, like, those accents coming in really good. Like, that's it's a completely enjoyable song. You've got Meltzer is, is back in the house, like do, contributing, I'm assuming lyrics, but but maybe musical ideas as well. Um, then we go back to the Bob Halligan. Album. So we're going there twice on this album. So four of these songs have no Blue Oyster Cult personnel writing them, which there's nothing there's nothing else like that in their catalog. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you get Beat 'em Up, which is, uh, I, I mean, certainly pushing more towards a straight up like glam metal thing. I enjoy it. Uh, I could see why people would would hate this. Um, I believe Jeff Wagner hates this song quite passionately. Um, and uh, or maybe it was Make Rock Not War. In any case, uh, I like the twin guitar on it. And uh, like, you know, that little post chorus, the you gotta get it, whatever he's saying there. Um, like that certainly feels like something that he would have given to Priest. Uh, then when the war comes, unfortunately, Joe Bouchard not coming with the ace in a hole here, as I, I do not I do not care for that song. Other than, and let me point to Tommy Price again, the drumming in the outro, the drumming in that that end section is 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 also is 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 really good. Like this is a fantastic player, um, super heavy hitting, like the Vinnie Apice kind of heavy hitting. Shadow Warrior. I, every time I hear this, I think it's going to turn into that. It's a part of my rock and roll fantasy. Whatever that song is, sounds like rock and roll fantasy. I don't really care for this one. So you get Beat 'em Up, which is a step down from the from Perfect Water and Spy in the House of the Night. Uh, and then When the War Comes in Shadow Warrior 2, I don't really care for. And then Madness to the Method uh, is the redemption. Like uh, Buck, Buck comes up with another one. He seems to be like he's providing more of what's good on this album. Like he wrote Perfect Water. He wrote Spy in the House of the Night and he wrote Madness to the Method like the like he wrote the highlights other than white flags, which I would, which I would rank with those. And it's like, this album seems a little more a buck album. And again, I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of how they're coming up with stuff and who decides what, but like he's, he's saving this album. And, uh, and then, you know, the madness of the method, like some of the, like some of the piano stuff that's going on at the end. And again, more of that, those Tommy price, like really heavy hitting, like hard hitting uh, fills with all those open spaces. It's great. Uh, so I, I enjoyed this album um, and it, you know, like I certainly had fears going in in terms of what it looked like and when it was in their career, but there's, there's stuff to, there's stuff to enjoy. Uh, and I think it gets a bad rap just kind of like, because so many guys had jumped ship, but like Eric Bloom and, and Buck Dharma, those are good enough people to make good albums. In fact, just Buck Dharma is a good enough person to make a good album. Yeah. <laughs> what did yeah. you rank it? I, I may have missed that. Would you rank it? Uh, I uh, what did I have it at ten? I think ten. I said yeah, ten. <clears throat> okay, Aaron, Club Ninja. All right, well here it is, and I don't know. I don't have a whole ton to say about this one. The, the The biggest problem with this one is just that it kind of feels like you have to put up with the bad stuff, but the highs just aren't as high as they are on some of the other records. That's really the biggest shortcoming on this one. There are some songs that I really like. I mean, White Flags, I'm all in. I can hang with Dancing in the Ruins. It's kind of 80s pop for my taste. But Make Rock, Not War is kind of hard to listen to. And you know something? That fucking Bob Halligan guy, I was thinking, he's kind of like chlamydia. <laughs> he just, like, you just fucking buy a record, and, like, you're you're ready, and you look, and you see his name, and you're like, oh, fuck. You know, it's like you're not going to die, but you're like, fuck. You know? 
<laughs> except like, except some heads are gonna roll, and in that one case, you're like, well, I guess this one time it was worth it. Yeah, that 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 is that is the best of those for sure. <laughs> But every other fucking song, because Beat Em Up is pretty bad, too. I don't think it's as bad as Make Rock Not War. Make Rock Not War is just so... Uh... And, you know, the sound is okay. You know, I can kind of hang with it. It's still a band I really like, but, man, that, that's a shit's rough. Well here. Huh? I said the drums are pretty well produced here. Like, that is a step up. Like, the drums on the last album, a lot of them, I'm like, I'm not sure how much of that is even a human being. Um, but this is like a hard hitting guy who's deliberate. Like the drum set, like listen to the drums on White Flags and Madness of the Method, and and like they're punchy. They're they're good. Like not everything about the '80s was you know like in terms of '80s yeah. production is like it's like oh eight, '80s generally uses a pejorative when discussing yeah. things like this, particularly like vinyl. But uh, those drums sound good. Those drums they sound like Vinnie Appice huge drums. Yeah. No, totally. Oh, shit, there's a bug. Um, yeah. Oh, the only other thing I really kind of wanted to stand up for a little bit was uh, actually, uh, when the war comes, because I don't feel like they're really accomplished what they set out to, but I still like the atmosphere they create in that song. And I'll admit I'm, I'm amused by that spoken intro too. I'm surprised I'm the first one to bring that up. That's Howard Stern, right? Is it? Yes, it is. <laughs> That's what I, I heard. And, I and the thing and the thing about that is, like, when you hear it, you're surprised. But then when you think about it for a minute, it's, like, the least surprising thing ever. Like, in yeah. 85 or whatever, when he was some DJ in New York who was probably a bit of Blue Oyster Cult fan since he was a kid. And they heard him on the radio and liked him. And they are like, hey, man, you want to do this? And he was like, fuck, yeah, I want to do this, you know? Oh, well, hell, actually- the revolution, that thing? Yeah. I did not know that. Aaron, actually, uh, Stern, or Eric Bloom is married to Stern's cousin or something. Oh, no uh, shit. They're, they're, yeah, they're related through marriage. Huh. Little tidbits there. Nice. I think it's a small world, but there are a lot of people in New York, so, you know. <laughs> a couple. All right, Alan, are you available to go up? Um, oh, I didn't say where I put Club Ninja, actually. I forgot to rate it again, and I forgot, so give me one sec. Yeah, I put it at number 10 <laughs> out of 11. <clears throat> Sonic the Hedgehog. Hold on here while I do some tricks on my gnarly board, dude. Oh. A music video to Dancing in the Ruins here. Get the newspaper out of my hair. <laughs> that that music the- video is priceless. Nothing never should ever be changed. I didn't watch it, man. I didn't want to do that. I was like, I have enough problems. I, this, this I, I, I have sat and watched that video on repeat for hours without doing anything else with my life. And I regret none of it. <laughs> <laughs> all the uh, all the super chats tonight are going to pay for all of Alan's props. By the way, just so everybody knows, that's what that's happening. <laughs> this is my little boy's Halloween uh, costume. At least part of him. Just like, yeah, it's close enough to work. We're going to borrow that. <laughs> um, but yeah, Club Ninja has a terrible reputation. Reading about it online, I actually like the album quite a bit. I think it's got three outstanding tracks and they come pretty early on so you kind of you know get over you know the trepidations pretty early uh, and i think they've all been touched on white flags really great track uh, like it dancing in the ruins yes it's maybe a little odd as a blue oyster cult song but with buck dharma singing it uh the guitar work is really great yeah. it's a awesome 80s you know radio rock kind of song and i can appreciate those i understand if a lot of people watching this can't that may not be the style of music a lot of folks are into i'm usually one of them yeah that that stuff you know was always you know in the background growing up as a kid so you know it's there in my head whether i wanted it to be or not and as such i've got a pretty high tolerance for it and it's a fantastic song uh it's exactly the kind of song rosader is perfect for singing uh, I love the tune. The video is, yes, just, you know, absolute classic early MTV schlock, and I love it to death. And then also Perfect Water. Uh, you know, so, you know, three out of the first four songs right there are all just, for me, yeah, top shelf kind of material. Uh, beyond that, yeah, now, after that, it gets maybe a little thinner pickings. Not that a lot of the songs are bad. I could do without... Yeah, you know, 
Blue Oyster Cult doing some kind of rock protest anthem with, you know, make rock, not more. So again, it's not that the song is terrible. It just feels like an odd one to hear. It, these are the guys who've done songs like, you know, Astronomy and Workshop of the Telescopes and all this stuff. And now they're just, yeah, again, you know, hell no, we won't go. Hell no, we won't go. Eh, whatever. Right. Um, Spy in the House of Nights, you know, not bad. Uh, Shadow Warrior on side two is not bad for what it is. So uh, the, the, the beat em up song, that, that is the one, if I'm going to pick one to kind of hold my nose about. <sighs> because, again, I'm not sure who's, who are you singing this song to? It's kind of like, you know, you got to like, you know, party and live it up. And if you don't, we're going to hit you. It's kind of a weird message. It's like, yeah, go for it. Live life to the fullest. Otherwise, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> huh? Wait, how does this work in a pop song structure again? I'm, I'm confused, and I don't think I like the song. Uh, but so, yeah, other than you know, one or two very sort of oddball songs like that, the three strong tracks on here you know, are very, very good for me. And as such, I rank it pretty high. Uh, I've got... Uh, Club Ninja at sixth right now. And it's another one that could easily slide down a little bit over time if I get tired of those three songs. Or it could slide up another spot or two if I find more songs that I you know latch on to like I have the other three. But for now, Club Ninja will be at uh, sixth. All right. All right, Marty. You go <laughs> ahead and I want to take this thing off my head because it is squeezing my brain. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, Club Ninja ranked at 12. Something had to rank lower. And keep in mind, I've been listening to a lot of Rat, Dokken, some Motley Crue lately. This has been kind of kind of fun. Um, and I listened to this first time, having no preconceived notions about it. It sounds like BOC's attempt at Turbo. Has a very similar sound to me. Um, it's very 80s commercial sound, solid songs written for a wide 80s glam market. I love the reverb on the vocals and overall harmonies and layered vocals. They never lost that. In this production, it's just a little bit more pre prevalent to me. Um, the only song I really wrote down that really stood out for me was A Perfect Water. Very hooky and memorable. It's a standout for me. I mean, other good songs overall it's kind of, you know, the statement's pretty obvious what they're trying to do here. Um, 80s glam vibe, because that was super popular at the time. Again, they're looking to be modern. I mean, Kiss did it too with Carnival of Souls where they tried to be dark and grungy. You know, it's just, these bands are trying to be chameleons. They're trying to continue what they do within the, uh, the footprint of what's happening at the time. But that leads us to number, uh, I don't know, 1988's Imaginos. Dollar. Frankenstein! <laughs> so, amongst the greatest things created by human beings would be Joe Sarazano singing that. Uh, which occasionally I get a, I, 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 I yeah, the Hefe John then right away. Frankenstein! <laughs> occasionally I get a case of the Frankensteins. And I just can't stop doing that, so I'm going to apologize. Um, you know, my, my neighbors, my neighbors might not appreciate it. Um, I love this album. Um, this is the other one. Like I've never ranked this as number as number one, but it is. It has been a contender in kind of the two. I I currently have it at four, but really, like between this and the debut, uh, I go I go back and I go back and forth a lot. So this this album is this album is magnificent and. Um, it's a different thing. So the um, worth point worth pointing out is, and I cannot detail all the history with this. There is some version of this album with Albert Bouchard <laughs> the entire album and pretty much playing everything that's on YouTube, and it's great. Uh, a lot of the ideas are the same. There are some other ideas uh, that are different but comparably good. Like there's another version of this album. That's like an Albert Bouchard demo of him doing everything from this period. It was to be the first three albums, and it's great. So Albert Bouchard came back into the fold, or it was taken from. I've heard different stories, and I don't, and I'm not going to claim to know the truth. Um, you'll see when you look at the credits for this album, you've got a whole lot of Albert Bouchard and Pearlman. 
you're dealing with the Imaginos concept, obviously, and that comes from Pearlman. And uh, I, I think this album is one of the great kind of studio project albums. I think to some extent it, it will probably, uh, it, like, it, it sits in a weird place for Blue Oyster Cult because this doesn't, like, this doesn't really in any way feel like the Blue Oyster Cult bands. It feels like they're a part of this. Like, in a way, when, you know, we had our discussion about that Blind Guardian thing, and I'm there doing, like, you know, like a fake stab at a rock opera, and he's singing all the parts. Like, this is much closer. I mean, if I, like, mm -hmm. some comparison points, that first Alan Parsons Project uh, album, the Tells a Mystery and Imagination, comes to mind. Uh, that Jeff Wayne's uh, War of the Worlds comes to mind. Like, this is a giant project album that that generally feels much larger than a band. Uh, so like, I, like to me, I see this almost like as a continuum to something that would eventually lead to things like Emperor uh, and Anthems of the Welcome to Dusk when they're, when they like, they're just getting grand beyond the scope. You've got like six guitars here, 10 keyboards there, eight vocals there. And it doesn't matter. You're just making the best product. There's like kind of not really consideration of this is the band whose ego, and, and I can't speak to the, the, the production process, but like this person has to sing. It's like the best dude is going to sing this. The dude who can do Frankenstein <laughs> is going to sing Frankenstein. And um, he is, he's later going to go sing for the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And he will have sung a bunch of television commercials, but he will have his highlight in this song, the Siege and Investiture of uh, Baron on Frankenstein's castle at Viseria, he will have that highlight moment, a song good enough worth making a fan club for that one song. If I were ever forced at gunpoint to rip the skin off of my face, I would want to be listening to that guy screaming Frankenstein at that time. It is one of the highlight achievements of the human race. That moment in that song, that song is quite clearly the fifth masterpiece uh, to which I earlier alluded. Uh, let me get more specifically into this album, and I hope I don't get too bad a case of the Frankenstein. Dude, because dude I thought it was just me. Oh, that that, that was that's that into Frankenstein. That fucking vocal performance being like incredible. Imagine like, he was me and I was cold. It's just <laughs> so good, Frankenstein. <laughs> Frankenstein. That's, that's that thing is incredible. So uh, I love this album. Uh, I am the one you warned me of, uh, you know, right away you're getting that, um, like uh, the hi-hat is, this is probably electronic. This doesn't sound real to me, but they're just building out something so large. I mean, I know like I, I've, I've had this discussion both with Marty and Jeff Wagner about like the King Diamond stuff. And I like a lot more, like I, I love King Diamond. And I like a lot more of the recent stuff and both Marty and Wagner will point out, oh, it doesn't have as much reverb and stuff like this. It can't get a whole lot more reverb than the shit that's going on on this album. This thing sounds enormous. And um, so I am the one you warned me of is uh, that thing. That thing is great. And that's one where you also get John Rogers, who would go on and be he's the bassist. To, uh, there's so many people listed on this, so I might get some of this wrong. But I believe he's the bassist who is basically their live bassist at this point. I don't think Joe Bouchard is on this album. I don't think he plays bass. And this guy, John Rogers, is the voice. He sounds like I've seen someone in the chat mention Sticks. I'm a Sticks fan. A, a good comparison. I think it's a fine comparison with this band. Clearly, Bloom is the Dennis the Young, if you want to draw parallels. And Tommy Shaw is Buck. Like those hold. They yeah. didn't have an unhit. Like, and, and actually, like, I, I, I suppose um, Joe becomes James Young, that unhinged kind of thing. So, but this guy, John Rogers, who's doing the other, the other lead vocals in I Am The One You Warned Me Of, uh, he's great. Like, of the other people they've had come in in this band and, and sing, and he was a member for a long time. There, there's a recording on the Blue Oyster Cult YouTube station of them performing in 89, and it has Chuck Berge, who's yeah. like Phil Collins – Bill Collins' replacement in like in that Brand X fusion thing, and he played with Al Di Miola. So they have that drummer, and they have John Rogers with them. It's phenomenal. And they do some songs off of Imagine Us. And they do a Take Me Away, where Bloom is doing phenomenal stuff with Whammy Bars. But I digress. So I'm the one who warned me of is great. Like that is like that's it's 
the atmosphere is metal. I think in a lot of ways, there are a lot of moments in this album where it just has like, even if the, the, the pieces aren't quite heavy metal, even, even if, even if they're not quite heavy metal, the atmosphere is, is almost always heavy metal on this. Like this is so atmospheric and rich and grand and larger than life. And that's something I love about great heavy metal is it doesn't feel like a bunch of dudes on the stage. It feels like people are creating worlds and it's taking me someplace. Like in terms of world building, holy shit, Imaginos is incredible. Um, uh, Les Invisible, or if that's how you say it, I enjoy that one. Um, I like it. I like it less than most of the other ones. The synth sounds are great. Uh, let's talk about how good Eric Bloom singing is uh, in the presence of another world. Like, this is like, again, this is like top form Dio. This is this guy at his peak, uh, absolutely uh, gorgeous. And, um, and also they're doing something very nice on this that went away kind of in the Martin Birch era, which is a little bit more back and forth, like, like a bunch of the songs in the Birch era, whoever's doing lead vocals is also doing a lot of the harmony vocals, like uh, Vengeance the Pact. It seems like it's a lot of Joe Bouchards coming at you. Like, they're mi they're matching. And so, like, when you get the, um, the, the, uh, in, in the presence of, uh, of another world, when it's like, your master is a monster, you're really getting, like, a bunch of owls. And maybe Joe's in there, but you're getting the owl, you know, versus, like, versus a bloom. And so you're getting a little bit more of the different colors of the band. And although this doesn't feel like a band, this feels like a giant, um, like larger than life production and experience, I feel like you're getting more the, more different personalities in addition to all the other players they have. And the drum fill from Tommy Price at four minutes and seven seconds, when they're going back and forth, the yo mass is a and they have like the kind of the quiet down. It's ba -ba 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 -ba. Like and it just transitions to that whole like mantra where it's like your master is a monster. This shit is incredible. Like that that's that's an excellent excellent song. Uh, then we get to Del Rio. Uh, this is this like the the previous. Oh, so in the presence of another world is is Sandy Perlman and Joe Bouchard. Uh, the the previous are the I am the one you warn me of is is Buck. Perlman and Albert and uh, Del Rio song is this is Sandy Perlman and, and Bouchard. This one's this one's I enjoy it. Uh, I like it less than a lot of the other stuff on this album. Um, and it's weird. The bass drum seems like isolated in the right channel. And I, and I don't understand why that is. Uh, and then we get to, you know, the siege and investiture of Baron von Frankenstein's castle of Viseria and holy shit. Like, like that, like the, I mean the 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 riff is this like the main riff um, is is as sinister as the Nosferatu stuff. The um, and then I, I think I think this is Satriani. I think this is Joe Satriani doing that crazy that crazy shred throughout and all these like weird harmonic noises. The bing bong boing and it's and, and it is just absolutely ripping. And uh, as I said, like a. Uh, a, a, not a, not a, not just a great achievement for Blue Oyster Cult and 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 Joey Serrazano and and uh, and t and Tommy Price, but a great achievement for the human race. This song is fantastic. Um, uh, then we get Astronomy, which uh, is a complete reimagining, as as uh, the metal theologian had said earlier. This thing's great. It is. It's pretty much like they're taking some of the ideas, like the core ideas. And it is, um, uh, and they're basically giving it pretty much like a dance beat. And they're doing what they did on Revolution by Night, which is sort of like, you just have this, like the momentum and like, you know, all this kind of like, kind of a, a groove, like a danceable groove. And then it's like, you know, he's sing he's like Buck is singing it pretty casual and they'll throw in a riff or he'll throw in these gorgeous answer, these gorgeous answers to, to whatever question is coming out in the vocals so you'll get stuff like you know never never warm and then it's like these really long things and it's and and the dialogue that he is having um we'll get back to sarah's don't you worry because he's 
Frankenstein. <laughs> I, 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 such an unbelievable thing. But astronomy is beautiful. Uh, that version. This is one of my favorite songs by the band. It happens that the original version is my second favorite song by the band in a masterpiece. But this is a great song. It's completely reimagined. Uh, Buck, Buck singing is beautiful. The little Albert Bouchard punctuation at the end. Oh, star! Fun. Uh, great, great stuff. Uh, really, really enjoy it. And uh, But, like, yeah, that just the cascading guitars there. Like, And this is where it feels like you could say it's, like, assembled in the studio, but it's, like, and they're using the, the tools of a studio to make something larger than a band could possibly make. And I feel you're getting that throughout Imaginos. Um, Magna of Illusions is, is, is good. I don't, I don't, the chorus there is a little obvious. The storm at land, storm at sea, like it's fine. Um, I, I mean, I think it's pretty good. The rest of the song I like more. And then we get to Blue Oyster Cult, which uh, you get some, some Hammond, you get to like the intro, you get some, Hammond, you've got some uh, Moog, some electric piano. He's like, it's like we're just bringing in everything that we own and we're going to use it well. Uh, that's that's a really great song. Should have ended the album. I like the Imagino song, which really features John Rogers in his most unhinged uh, James Young style. Um, he's really like losing. It sounds like it sounds like a mental breakdown. He, like uh, uh, like all that stuff he's doing. Like Imagino's. And August in New Hampshire. It's like very schizophrenic. <laughs> he has such a good personality. I wish he had recorded uh, more lead vocals with them. Like I, I really, really like uh, what he adds to the band. But like, put that song earlier. Like sequencing is sequencing is is a. I have a ding on this album. Like clearly, you end with you end with Frankenstein or Blue Oyster Cult. You're ending with one of those. Uh, imagine us. I like it's a completely good song. A lot of good stuff. I really liked John Rogers' performance. Uh, it's just like coming after Frankenstein and there's so, like Blue Oyster Cult. Like in a way, this this could be the way you end the album. It could also be the way you end your career. Like this really feels like a sum of all things. And uh, so as I said, I, I obviously I adore this album. I, I rank it four. And uh, and I feel I, amongst POC fans, this gets a lot of love. Um, it, like the world outside, I think, didn't know what to make of it. And it took me a little bit time, like certainly it took me a little time to warm up to this other version of, uh, of, of astronomy, but it's superb. Like this is what this band can do. They can just take their material and, and reinvent it or add on to it and make it better. Or in this case, do another completely valid version that has all of this new great guitar stuff. It's great. The bass playing on that's great. Who, I have no idea who did it. Actually, maybe it's John Rogers, or maybe not. Maybe John Rogers, their future bassist singer, was only singing on this. Who knows? There are like 40 guys playing on this album. And 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 and, and I don't think in the metal rock context that, that has ever come out better. I'm like like Marty, I'm I'm a big fan of, of Kisses the Elder, and he's the one who got me into that. And uh but in some of when I got into that, some of the stuff I connected with reminded me of the vibe of this album. Like this is this is a reach. This is the elders feels a little still more like a band than this does, but I feel that there's some giant world building beyond like, it's like in a way, just like, ah, maybe we'll play it live. Maybe we're a band. That guy can do it better. He should play, bring him on. Like maybe it's sort of like, maybe this is how like early Chicago albums were recorded. They've got like 90 guys in the band and a hundred other people lying and they're all fantastic musicians. Yeah. I'm like, you play the flugelhorn or whatever. So anyway, <laughs> imagine those, Fantastic stuff. Um, people like, yeah, like if like if I'm dead, you're putting me in the coffin, and the coffin is going down. Frankenstein. <laughs> I'm happy like that. Like, <laughs> like this is one of the great achievements of the human race. Um, <laughs> it is so absolutely wonderful. So. Um, uh, yeah, and Marty, if you if you trash talk that that song, like I I am, I I've am, listened to this album once. I have very little to say about it. I'm I, getting I feel like I've missed out. And and there and, and it's like it's not just going to be Michigan. It's gonna, the Midwest is gone. <laughs> the Midwest is just gone. the blast radius just keeps getting larger and larger. Make sure any remnants of my seed do not go beyond the Midwest. <laughs> yes, no, it, it it does. Um, so, anyways. Uh, Fantastic stuff. Uh, please, on to the metal theologian before I get another case of the...
Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah. All right. So here we go. And you know, um, one thing about not listening to lyrics particularly. As you know, I sort of heard some of the story about this. The band had pretty much already fallen apart, and a lot of the stuff that Craig was just talking about as far as, you know, all the people around and that sort of thing. But that was still kind of all I knew. So I sort of knew it was a concept album, and I also knew that, like, from a sequencing standpoint, it had been completely fucked up and everything else, right? But given that I'm not inclined to pay any attention to the words, like, just going based on the sounds, I wouldn't change anything about this as a concept album. I actually think it totally coheres. It makes sense. Like it goes through. And I don't know if the words like sequence sensibly at all, but I don't care either. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, not, so, that's not the thing. Like I definitely see the point on that, on Blue Oyster Cult being that last song. But I sort of feel like Imaginos is almost the encore after that. I also think Imaginos is funny because they never really did like a disco song on like Mirrors when it seemed like it would have been appropriate. But then in 1988, they went ahead and did one like 10 years too late with Imaginos, you know, and that beat. Um, Astronomy, I definitely do like the original version more, but it's still really cool what they're doing. You know, something I've never liked about Astronomy is that don't forget my dog line. So I think it's kind of corny. And then they like sort of, they do the jokey thing and ham it up live. So they like make it worse. And I don't feel like Buck handles that much better than Eric ever did. But uh, that song, that, that line still always jumps out, but you know. And that's my biggest complaint. Wind. Huh? Is it, well, I said, don't forget my dog, and I have to answer you. Fixed in consequence. <laughs> exactly, man. Yeah, Del Rio's song, I think is fantastic. That's like one of my favorite hooks ever. That one like little thing. I just sit there and listen to that song. What's the hook or the riff? Really just the hook. But, but, the, but the riff I'm fine with, too. I'm fine with the whole fucking thing. I love okay. that song. Yeah, but that hook totally. And 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 Frankenstein, I mean, I didn't know what to make of that one right away, but you know that that is it's just it doesn't sound like Blue Oyster Cult, but it's fucking fantastic, you know. If 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 I if if that was a if it was like that's not Blue Oyster Cult, it's on this like obscure private pressing record that I got that cost me 100 bucks, I'd be like that's the fucking greatest thing and everyone's got to hear this, you know. Right. I so would I, say you know, charge me a thousand more. Please charge huh? me a thousand. I, 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 and I would say, please charge me a thousand more dollars for this song, for the privilege of hearing this song. <laughs> yeah, and that's pretty much it for me. I mean, I'm, I'll just bust these out real quick because I'm probably going to lay low, but these are the only other ones I have. This one, I actually think this record is really good. It's very different, though, and I really don't feel like I fully digested it. So I, I don't even want to go too far with it. And then this is kind of like a fun live set where that kind of scratched the itch when I was really fiending for something new, but wouldn't necessarily be the first thing I'd recommend to go out and get. So that's it. All right. Alan. Oh, and I, put, I didn't rate uh, Imaginos, actually. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, why would I remember now? Yeah, seven. It's kind of an anticlimactic number. But get, but you know, with this band, a seven is really high. So yeah. I thought about doing number one or something to be a contrarian. But that is a great record, though. Yep. Are you there? Oh yeah, I wasn't sure if Aaron was done. No. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Imagine is I don't have a lot to say about. It's the one I've heard the least, uh, and like Craig described, you. Know, well, it's you know a pretty heavy album and uh, acclaimed by lots of their fans. It's also a pretty dense album to get into. I figured that out pretty quickly. I've given it a few spins. I like what I've heard, but I really haven't processed it enough to have you know any you know in depth insights. The way the album's put together, you know, was a, it seems like you know a really almost i'm not sure if it was a labor of love or just a labor but yeah the band had fallen apart on tour with you know the club ninja stuff albert bouchard had come back in for a tour and he thought he was back in the band and the band only wanted him for a tour and that was awkward and people were coming going and everything had kind of fallen apart and then yeah there's all the different versions of you know albert was working on this as a solo album and then uh, the label didn't want to release it under his name. They wanted it out as a Blue Oyster Cult product, and so Perlman had to get other members of the band involved. And Albert was felt like you know this had been kind of you know 
ripped out of him because he had done all the work on it. And so, yeah, just the backstory is a disaster. You know, the, the, the band is dead in the water. They've already broken up. They've already gone their separate ways. And somehow they kind of get everything back together at least long enough to put together this very complicated album. And based on preliminary listens, and again, I've only overheard it two or three times, which is not enough to process this no, album. This is it sounds like a pretty interesting album. Um, in terms of a ranking, it's not fair for me to try to put it anywhere. I ended up putting it at 11th, and a lot of that is simply that I know I like it more than the three albums below it. I don't know how high it can climb. The albums above it, I know better. And so it got kind of got sandwiched between the albums I know and the th three albums that I know it's, this is already better than these three. So uh, it's 11th, which yeah, if some people seem aghast again, you know, don't just look at the number, look at the explanation. There's a reason it ended up there when I'm in the mood for it. I will circle back to this album and give it some time and see where it falls. But, um, yeah, it's an album that's going to require more attention than I've been able to give it with all the other Blue Oyster cults you know, that I've caught up on and other stuff that I've had going on, too. So seems like an interesting project, uh, but that's all I can really say about it at this point. Marty, uh, from what you mentioned earlier, you might have heard it even less than I have. So yeah, I'm in the same boat. I mean, I've listened to it once and it landed at 11 for me because I had to place it somewhere. I was surprised how good it sounded um i i basically wrote solid has old feel the band intact <laughs> that's all i wrote um yeah this is one of all the albums that you're not that familiar with this is one partially because your love of music of the elder that i'm positive will go way up on your list it's just and you know, knowing your enthusiasm for it i will i will reinvestigate it for sure yeah you, you will you this i i i'm pretty good with my recommendations to you i'm gonna say i'm yeah. sort of like 80 90 percent and this is like of everything that you have 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 like not not sparked to and stuff like that. It's like don't spend the time with the ages of fortune. Spend it with this album. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I got to say too. By the way, I am the one you warned me of. That's one of the greatest song titles ever. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Absolutely. We're up to ninety eight. Heaven forbid. So two quick drive bys. Don't want to make this any longer. This thing came out, which is a soundtrack for, for Bad Channels. It has two songs on here uh, by Blue Oyster Cult, a bunch of songs by other bands. The uh, Demon's Kiss by Blue Oyster Cult I don't really care for. Uh, the Horsemen Arrive I like. That, that's, qu that's quite a good song. Uh, and then the original score by Blue Oyster Cult is a lot of kind of like one and a half minute, two minute um, uh, filler things. I, I don't think it's special. I this is something I can say, like that Blind Guardian uh, classical thing I have because I'm a completist. Uh, uh, and, and, and unlike the, the Buck Dharma flat out album, uh, I'm, I'm not really going to push people to get it. Um, I think around this time we also got Joe Bouchard. And um, uh, what, I think Albert is on one song in here. This is like sort of a glam metal band called Dead Ringer. Uh, this album, like the Joe songs are for the most part enjoyable. Um, this thing will not be easy for people to find, uh, but uh, <laughs> this is this is this is this is enjoyable. Um, uh, so we are on to the next one. Heaven forbid, uh, which I reviewed actually in my uh, my zine that uh, the Ultimate Steel Dissector, where I reviewed uh, Blind Guardian as well as you know Twisted Sister and Mayhem and Nile and a whole bunch of different things. And this was a new album at that time. So this came out in 98. And a lot of these songs I heard for years that with them playing live. And it was like, this is from our upcoming album. I remember, I remember I see you in black hearing this one in concert. And I was like, in it, like I was in Ohio. And it was like 93. So I was waiting for this album for a long time. I was like, it's from our upcoming album. Uh, I enjoy this album. Uh, I, I won't go in as, in as, as great a detail, but like, uh, this album has uh, Chuck Berge uh, on, on on drums on everything except maybe still burning. I think has has Rondinelli on it and uh, Adios Efe. And uh, I enjoy this album. I uh, I have it ranked 13. Uh, as I said, Mirrors is the only album there that's, that's at the borderline for me. See You in Black is definitely them pushing more metal, 
And if you watch that 89 performance with uh, John Rogers on bass and uh, Chuck Berge playing the drums, I mean, this dude is hitting hard. And uh, and it was the first drummer that I, that I saw them with. So see you in black. That's definitely that's a that's a that's a metal song. I don't think we need to call it hard rock. That's a metal song. Uh, Harvest Moon is beautiful, and this is why when people kind of dismiss all the post Columbia stuff, I'm like Har Harvest Moon. I would rank almost right. Fear the Reaper. The prop like Harvest Moon. I think the verses are gorgeous. The uh, his phrasing like. I feel the nights grow cold. Young people feeling restless. Old people feeling old. It's like the bet. This is fantastic singing. And then the bridge, the ah, 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 that stuff is great. My one chop on this song, the only reason I wouldn't actually rate that song above above Don't Fear the Reaper and, and, and you know, like equal with I Love the Night is I think that the bridge in the middle, when they go to the double bass thing, I feel it just feels thrown in. Like uh, Judas Priest did this with the song Death on Nostradamus, which to me is their only post painkiller album that I really adore. And it's like, okay, it's a departure, but it's a departure at an energy level that to me doesn't fit the song. I understand, like, you want to have it. Um, the solo's good, but not like, I think this is a very good song that could have been um, even better had that departure made a little bit more sense to me. Uh, Power Underneath Despair, I find forced. I, I just don't like it. Uh, they, they are rocking the 7-8 in that chorus, for what it's worth. Uh, they're, they're, they're dropping a beat. They're rocking the 7-8. Uh, X-Ray Eyes is like, I mean, I saw I'm like, oh, is this going to be a Kiss cover? Um, and uh, you're getting some kind of weird skittering prog blues for whatever description that means. The boom, 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 like, that, like it's it's a it's a puzzling little song with some cool little details at the edges. A uh, hammerback is another like this is a metal song, and the, the hammerback solo. And I, maybe the metal theologian doesn't know this enough to speak. Uh, that solo is that backwards? Like I don't know what that like what's going on with that solo. It's incredible. It's incendiary. It's fire. But is it like it, is it backwards? It always sounds like not. Like something, something strange is happening to that solo. It's cool. Like it, like I think it's an intentional backwards. Not yeah. like that thing solo from Gangland, where there's just like an open four, and why isn't there a solo in Gangland? Song sucks, anyways. Um, so damage. Uh, we here we're getting into the into the into the Buck Dharma blues, which like Dragon Lady, he's making more interesting with all these little embellishments and solos are a ton of fun. A uh, cold gray light of dawn happens, and I feel that song should have ended the album. Uh, seven songs certainly isn't flying in the CD age, but that's a lovely Eric Bloom song thing that has that vibe of stuff on Spectres. It's gothic, it's spacious. He like, and and it's the song where even though the parts aren't so metal, the 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 feel is that gothic metal other world, and it's really good. Real world, I I really can't stand. Um, uh, Live for me is pretty nice. Uh, that one was always better live, uh, and still burning. I find forced. Uh, just never really dug that chorus. And in the uh, here we got a live version of something that I thought was kind of decent, and and this live version is kind of decent. So um, you know, I, I, to rehabilitate that song, isn't it? What's up? That's a weird choice of a song to try and rehabilitate, isn't it? Yeah, I they played it a lot, and I don't know if some of the reason they played it I, again, just guessing, is like um, they're playing. They're not playing a ton of the Alan Lanier written stuff, and he wrote that one, I believe. And so that might have been some of the reason why this was because it was really a part of their set. For I'm going to say there was like a ten year period where maybe it, maybe it was every time. I've heard it on a lot of shows that I've listened to on YouTube. I, I've actually never seen them live, but for when I was on my big kick, I would always like look for different shows on YouTube to listen to in the car while I was driving. So I sampled through like some of these different eras and that. And it almost felt like this again, this is just based on listening to these concerts, but it almost felt like Buck really liked that song and he wanted to do it. Yeah, so maybe it kind of, that was because of that. I, this is coming out of my ass, but that was my vibe that I got off it. Right. Uh, that and and, and that, I, I'm sure he like. There's no version of it. Buck, if Buck and Bloom didn't like it, they wouldn't do it. But it's yeah. fine. So that so this is 13. And the main, you know, I talk about album consistency. The main reason it's 13 is I don't like Power Underneath Despair, um, uh, which is the third song. And then the last four songs, like, uh, I mean, I think 
Lyft for me is the exception. Like that touches a little bit of that perfect water vibe, which to me always reminds me of, of, of Rush's Grace Under Pressure. Like there's a brightness to it. There's an optimism to it. And, uh, but like, yeah, this is, this is four songs I don't particularly want to hear. And like, and, and like three of them are, are at the end. So a, a top heavy album for me is tough because you guys talk about skipping tracks. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I have a lot of rules that govern my life, but I like I listen to albums from beginning to end, including the songs I don't like, and just albums that have less songs I like. I listen to infrequently, and such is the reason I listen to a whole lot less Iron Maiden than I did because I never need to listen to Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner or Invaders or Alec like or, or like Heaven Can Wait Again. Um, so, so this is something that like I feel like if this album stopped on seven, I would I would like it more, but I still enjoy. it. And for the doubters of this era, and I and I can understand that. I say, like, check out Harvest Moon, man. That like that, but for a small choice or two, is it like is as good as you know uh, is as good as Don't Fear the Reaper. That thing is actually like the core ideas I like more than Don't Fear the Reaper. I just the departure I don't think quite works. All so right, anyone here as well. But I would say I'm curious if you agree that if you don't like Buck. To stay away from this record, this really feels like a Buck record to me, maybe more than any other. And it's not necessarily because he does all the songs, but just advise the just the way it feels, sort of the pace of it, the um, the color of it, the attitude of it. It just sort of feels like a Buck record to me. It it, it I am really yeah. central too in a way that it didn't necessarily in the past, even though they were always a guitar heavy band, obviously. But his guitar feels really front and center. Yeah, and also you're saying like like. Like live for me, eight ninth song, Buck lead vocals, still burning, Buck in the Buck. So you're ending with a triple shot of him doing it. Yes, I mean I think it, it, like there's a there's a bit of a shift in the band um, from like maybe Club Ninja was the last time it really felt like fifty fifty. Uh, I, I shouldn't say that was the last time, but that one felt closer to fifty fifty than this. I, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah, if you if you don't like if you don't like Buck, you should probably you you could. You should probably go to sleep. Like, like these. That it's like he is. Like, if he's not even the dominant person, I think he's he's generating the lion's share of the best material um, for these the post post Columbia stuff. Yeah. All right, Alan. Uh, let's see. For me, my take on this album uh, it follows a pretty easy pattern for me. I like the way the album begins with the first few songs. Uh, yeah, Harvest Moon is easily the standout here. Uh, yeah, classic sort of Buck song, really well done. Um, I don't mind uh, Pressure Underneath Despair. No, that one, or sorry, Power Underneath Despair. That one's okay. Uh, don't mind See You in Black. When you get to X Ray Eyes, is where it starts to get kind of bumpy for me. Uh, a lot of those songs through the middle of the album are. Yeah, you know, either average, only slightly above, slightly below, or yeah, ones like Real World that just don't come together at all. And then you get towards the end of the album, and it kind of starts to get back on track. I like Live for Me. Um, Still Burning is all right. Yeah, I can see where you would describe it as a little bit forced. It, it still works, but it's you know it's not going to be you know one of the classics in their repertoire. And yeah, I was kind of also surprised, Aaron, that In The would be the song they would pick to try to breathe some new life into. It's okay. It's not a bad song, and they you know, do it justice here. So, yeah, some good stuff at the start and some good stuff at the end. A lot of the middle of the album didn't really impress me that much, though. Not that it's awful. At times, it really feels like they, again, it had been 10 years since they'd written an album, You've gone from 88 to 98. They've basically missed the entire decade of the 90s, which is a weird time for music. And it kind of feels like they were trying to get some 90s-isms worked in here and there, and whether they just didn't have the experience or if it just didn't work within the frameworks they were building, I don't know. But yeah, a lot of these songs I could do without. I ended up ranking this one uh, at 14, at the bottom of the stack. It does have, and even the album I'm putting here at the bottom, does have one real gem of a song with Harvest Moon. So it's not like the entire album is a throwaway or anything. I'm glad I've played it through a few times and spotted a couple of songs I like. But something's got to come in last, and it, there's too much in the core of this album that it hasn't really 
uh, worked for me at all. So I'll put it last, but yes, Harvest Moon is the one song folks should check out if nothing else from it. I, I'll add a little footnote to your '90s thing. Yeah, sure. like I think I think even even like I don't know that it would be a stretch to say, and I don't remember if I heard if I like saw an interview where they mentioned it, but something like "See You in Black," like oh, they heard Machine Head, uh, the band, not the great album. Uh, and there's a little bit of that, but like when I listen to the real man, I was like, oh yeah, there's that whole unplugged movement that happened that I had no no I took no part in. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was one Alice in Chains album that came out in that that I thought was like decent enough, but that was sort of it for my participation in an entire era of unplugged. And I'm listening like real like real world, and I'm thinking like that. And I'm also thinking a little like that one song. I'm thinking a little bit Dave Matthews Band. So when you say when you say '90s. Both of those, like, like these thoughts just leapt to mind because, because yeah, that was that was kind of it. Other than that, it's it's BOC, and uh, but those elements, those elements, I think are there, and I think you're right. All right, this one I listened to a couple times. I liked it pretty much straight up, straight away. It ended up six again. Oh, wow. it, if I spend more time with it, it might go higher, it might go lower. Uh, but from the straight up metal punch of see you in black to the melodious and familiar smooth swagger of harvest moon heaven forbid is varied and expertly crafted great guitar work on harvest moon um power under despair that seven eight feel is very triumphant uh damaged uh didn't care for the boogie woogie vibe but it's great playing regardless um i need to get a little more familiar with the record but yeah it landed at six for me Cool. And we got two more to go. Can we do it in 10 minutes? <laughs> so we'll see. Um, heaven forbid, we've got uh, 2001's Curse of the Hidden Mirror, which I realized I didn't listen to until 40 minutes before the stream. So, um, so. <laughs> Zoller. Curse of the Hidden Mirror. So, um, Is that a I've face got warning cover, by the way? <laughs> it looks like a face warning cover. Uh, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. It, it has. It, this, this is a prog rock album cover. That, yeah. that, that's what this looks like. Um, uh, you know, someone with an English accent conceived that. Yep. So, um, <laughs> Curse of the Hidden Mirror. Uh, I ranked this 12. Uh, so one above. Uh, heaven forbid. Uh, I, you know, I have a, a lot of a lot of good memories in terms of in terms of these songs. Insofar as. Uh, I just heard a lot of them like years and years and years before they came out. Saw some of them morph over time. Um, this one's a little, let me, I'm bringing a light closer because these, this is this smaller. My eyes are no longer what they were. Dance on stilts. This is a better, like in terms of the percentages, this is a little bit of um, before the kiss of red cap and, and certainly far better than, than um, the vigil. In terms of like, I don't really care for this riff, the -na 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 -na, or the singing, but then when it leaps into that whole instrumental section, uh, it's 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 pretty spellbinding. Like that stuff is really good. So sort of a weird uh, weird way into it. And then we've got uh, Showtime, a lot of personality, kind of like a here we're you know we've got a wink from Bloom with his like you know this is like um, it's 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 pretty playful, and I like I like the chorus. Um, you're hearing it. This this is the first time I, I think I've ever heard like, like because he's doing the shouting stuff, but a little bit of the strain is coming into his voice. Which when they did the live album uh, and live recording that was right around here. He still sounds great, but I think it's it's maybe one of the first times I didn't think he could absolutely out sing everything he did. Like I'm gonna say like 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 late '80s through like 2000 2000. This dude could outsing everything he did before, and then here, um, there's a little bit of a, a, a dampener, um, but he still sounds good. Old God's Return is a ton of fun. Like, there's a lot of character, a lot of swagger to that that riff, um, and uh, Bobby Rondinelli is having a ton of fun with the fills. We've got Pocket. It's kind of fine. This is a bit of a throwaway for me. Um, what's the next guy? One step ahead of the devil. Do not like this song. This, this, the strange. The, I mean, it's stranger. So I'll give this like this that song more than most songs on any of the three post Columbia era albums has like a callback to some some of the uh, '70s stuff in terms of its feel. It's definitely weirder. I just don't like it. I don't like that harmony, uh, and I just don't like those core ideas. Uh, uh, 
Um, I just like to be bad. Eric Bloom is a naughty boy, and um, <laughs> it's it's fun. Like it's it's exactly like I mean it, it has a twist like it's a stone that has a twist ending like I just like to be bad. First, they well, like first names only in one night stand. But then you get that you get the monster Rondinelli, but only for you. And so that's the that's the twist, uh, which is which is enjoyable uh, that they've got that little twist ending. Uh, here comes that feeling. This is this is like kind of like this is like this unfulfilled climax sort of song. It's really nice. It's a really pretty buck song and very much like. Um, uh, like live for me, but 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 a bit better than that. And I just feel like there's a yearning uh, to that song, and uh, you know, gorgeous, gorgeous solo. But really, we can say that like 80 times in this conversation. Uh, out of the darkness. So here, the parallels to the previous albums are coming out because this is very much like a cold gray light at dawn. You have another thing that's this gothic tapestry that feels like it's touching Spectre space. And that, but that whole thing when it's when it's like out of the darkness, and then and then they start building all these harmony vocals, and it's just really really rich. It's like you know, it's it it feels like to me this album feels more like Blue Oyster Cult because it has some of those colors than Heaven Forbid. Heaven Forbid has a punchiness, it has a great harvest moon, but like out of the darkness, like this to me is taking me to that that Spectre's place. And that the only one other, only one other, only one other, like that stuff is like, that is like Spectre stuff and just, just absolutely lovely. And then you get the other, I think they basically have three incredible songs uh, in the post Columbia years. There's Harvest Moon, uh, and then there's this next song, Stone of Love. This is just an absolutely fucked arm, a gem. Uh, like, uh, like I remember seeing them play this in li like live forever before, before, like, I, I feel like I saw them play this live in like 92 or something before that, you know, like, like, a, like 10 years before this. And I always wanted to get a recording of this song. And uh, it's just, it's just great. Like, this is, this is what Buck does. Like the, the, the phrasing of like the phrasing and like when he starts throwing in those those jazz scores, the but like all of that syncopation, the, it's just an absolutely beautiful solo. Like that to me is like his. I don't think there's a solo on the new album I like as much as that one. Like that's probably my last like ten out of ten buck solo. But there's great stuff on the new album. Um, I and the Hurricane. This is the shouty Eric Bloom that I don't particularly care for. And then Good to Feel Hungry is certainly weird. Like I, I enjoy that tune. That's the closest to them tapping the weirdness of the the uh, the of, of the Bouchards, uh, particularly Albert, when they're like, "Good to feel, good to feel." Da, da, da. Like I don't know what's happening. It's a total like 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 schizophrenic break. But I enjoy the I enjoy the tune. Um, so as I said, I you know I, I I rank this twelve. I feel more than heaven forbid, and more than uh, the symbol remains. This album. That this album feels it just has the blue oyster cult feel throughout. Uh, this doesn't feel like it feels like a little bit more. They're comfortable with what they do during that period. They started bringing back in their live set things like you know, like I saw like Teen Archer um, and you know, Quicklime Girl, Golden Age. Like they just start like I just started seeing them play those things more, and I feel that that's reflected in this. But you know that that may not be the case. It just felt that way that they were touching more. Uh, more on that stuff. A brief aside on that. I had a friend uh, who talked with uh, Rudy, Randy Sarzo. This is like a Quiet Riot, White Snake bassist who played with them for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he spoke with him and, and, and Sarzo is like, oh my God, you don't know how hard it is to be in this band. And he said something like, you need to learn. And I think it was at least 40 but it might have been 50 different songs to be the basis for that band because they just all shit out. I remember one time seeing them in like, I saw, and this was a show I saw with Wagner in the, in the village and, um, uh, and like Bloom said something like Ronda Nelly had a weird reaction and like Bloom comes up. He's like, he's like, I just told the Dre, he's like, we know that the, the band has a lot of songs in its repertoire. I just told Ronda Nelly, we're going to play See You in Black. And he looked at me and said, are you shitting me? So like, that's 
that's the thing. They're like, they're really aware of their catalog. And I felt that got more so over the years. Like I feel like the early nineties through mid, maybe up to 96, 97, it was pretty set. But then all of a sudden there's like quick lime girl or, or, or teen archer uh, or she's as beautiful as a foot. You were starting to get really different, deep, deep, deep cuts. So um, uh, that, that, those are my thoughts on, on that album. All right, Alan. Oh, Aaron, did you have anything you want to add on that? Yeah, he doesn't own it. I have it, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Didn't want to skip you. Uh, This one, yeah, I think it's uh, a little better than its predecessor, Heaven Forbid. Uh, It's just got, you know, a few more songs that are clicking. Uh, For me, uh, Old God's Return, yeah, is a fun song. Like Craig mentioned, that one works well. Pocket is kind of meant to be, to be like the single on the album in as much as there was going to be a single from the album. It reminds me of a little bit of some of the stuff from revolution by night. So not a bad tune, not an amazing one, but certainly not bad. One step ahead of the devil. The first time I heard the album, I kind of liked it. It seemed like a little heavier, forceful number. The second time it didn't sit well with me. So eh, Jerry's, I seem to go back and forth on that song a little bit. We'll leave it at that. I just like to be bad. Um, just doesn't work for me. It seems to be a little too goofy, maybe. Uh, but here comes that feeling. Yep, you know, there you're getting back into the sort of you know the pretty buck territory. Um, and yes, Stone of Love absolutely is you know the second post Columbia song that you have to hear, even if you're just not going to check out all the albums. That's fine. But Harvest Moon is the first track. Stone of Love is the second track. That that again. Even this album, I'm ranking it 13, so one step ahead of Heaven Forbid, but not very high up the list. But even this album has that one track that is certainly worth hearing on it. Um, yeah, the two that close out the album have, haven't really made a strong impression one way or the other. So I think it's, yeah, it feels a little you know tightened up compared to its predecessor. They've, they've gotten some of the kinks worked back out of the system with getting new material out there. And uh, yeah, you still have a few songs that are certainly worth hearing, even uh, at 13th uh, ranking in their catalog. That's all I'll say on Curse of the... Uh... Oops, sorry, getting the title. Mirror. Up. Yeah, Curse, Curse yep. Mirror. Uh, Marty, what do you think on this one? Listen to it once. Um, I ended up putting it at eight. It just kind of how it fell. Um, I basically wrote 2000s BOC benefits from more of a warm spot uh modern production songs are largely focused and heavy they seem unified in the band good songs so i wrote again i need to spend some more time with this one as well um which brings us to the final the final strike of this behemoth behemoth streak. the fact that 43 people are still here thank you and they actually did. started picking up people who have just woken up in the UK. It's, so a miracle. it's not it's that a they miracle. all stayed. It's that some of them are just hopping on. <laughs> yep. I told my girlfriend this was going to be six hours. So it looks like, looks like I'm, I'm sp- I just, I, I did the math of less comments from, from, uh, from, from, <laughs> from about adding the theologian. Um, that was, that was my prediction. So um, the symbol remains. My, my voice isn't getting better after all this. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I like the new album. It is, uh, I rank it as 11. I think it is, I think it is the best of the three post uh, Columbia albums. But as I said, like, I think Curse of the Hidden Mirror feels the most like a BOC, but some of it is like, there's some things on that album I don't like, but it sounds like seventies BOC. So with this album, there's some stuff that sounds not so much like BOC to me. So this is the first album where, it, so they, the band, a, a lot of when I saw them, it's, it was Danny Miranda on bass and, and Rondinelli on drums. So there, at some point earlier, it was Bergie and maybe John Rogers. I wouldn't have known uh, the other guys in the band at that time. And at somewhere, Rondinelli left, uh, and I really, really enjoy his playing. And a guy, uh, uh, Jules came in, Jules Redino, I think, uh, came in and he's a hard hitter. Uh, he plays the parts very faithfully. So it's like, I feel Rondinelli added more of his own personality. I did as did Chuck Berge, but uh, like they've got this young guy who looks a little bit like what's his name? Jack white from the white stripes. And he hits hard and he, he plays, he plays the stuff. Well, 
I wish he added a little bit more of his own personality, though I don't know if that's his decision or the guys are just like, hey, play it, you know, play it, play it this way. I can like offhand, I'm like, oh, he added a fill into Golden Age of Leather at this transition part. But outside of that, like where it's like Ron and Ellie, I felt was all over the place with Aaron splashes and, and, and hi-hat things and catches and all this kind of stuff. So I like the album. The, the experience for me, this is a lot. I got this during lockdown. And this is certainly the best regarded, like across the boards of, of the of the post-Columbia albums. And, and in general, the, the, like people were, were going back to either Revolution by Night or Fire of Unknown Orange. This is really well liked. And I'm happy, I'm happy for the guys that that's the case. Uh, and, I, and again, I think it's the best of the three. Um, so that was me. It's a, it's, it's heavier, a little bit more overtly metal, kind of, I want to see you in black, uh, a little on the shouty side, uh, box in my head is a, is a buck cut, uh, where it's completely made by all these surprising, like harmony vocals coming in box, box in my, like you just, all these really surprising spots that make it more interested. So tainted blood is the first time that Richie Castellano who, um, you know, uh, uh, Alan Lanier passed away after, you know, in the space between these albums and, um, you know, moment of silence for Alan Lanier. Uh, and uh, Richie Castellano came in and uh, this guy can do everything. He can play, he can shred guitar, he can play, he can sing all of the songs like, like, like no perfect. He's a phenomenal all around musician. His voice is a bit like, like say, a Glenn Hughes. It's very smooth. He doesn't have the high range nor the Stevie Wonder fascination that Glenn Hughes has. But he sounds like he's like a Glenn Hughes kind of guy. Um, so a bit like kind of alpha, very forward. And it's kind of a, to me, it's a little bit of a strange fit in the band. Where I feel like Bloom was always kind of like the lead singer guy. And here you have a guy who sounds really polished. And it's not to fault him for that, but just where he sits. And so he's writing some of this, and Tainted Blood, I think, is one of the ones that he wrote, and it's cool. Uh, that one took a little bit to grow on me. And the first time I heard it, I was like, this is, wow, it's hard adjusting to this being Blue Oyster Cult. But at this point, Bloom is straining a little bit more for some of the high notes. And I think they need to involve another singer. I've, I've heard that this guy does a performance of, like, Morning Final. Uh, I've seen him do some of the Joe Bouchard stuff. And, uh, you know, he's a really, he's a really talented all around mu musician and, um, uh, like in a little bit, he's, he's picking up some slack, like, you know, Buck 10 years ago to 20 years ago was, was better at shredding than he is now. So this guy's getting a little bit more of the traditional shredder role and he's getting a little bit more of the tasty player role. So that's it's like it's like this guy's like the John Sykes and then the other guy is the Gorham. If you need to use like a thin Lizzie comparison. Um, so uh, that thing's enjoyable. Nightmare Epiphany. Uh, it's a really playful tune. Uh, you've got a lot of really great Buck singing and and playing on it. And then uh, Edge of the World uh, is another one with 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 Richie Richie Castellano singing this kind of the chorus. And maybe he wrote the tune. Um, and it feels really kind of modern and not particularly Blue Oyster Cult. But again, like because it's obviously taken so long for new Blue Oyster Cult albums to come out, I've spun the, I haven't spun this one that often because I want to keep it fresh. And lessons I learned as a kid who's listened to Iron Maiden Killers and and um, the first one, the Dianos, which are clearly totally superior to everything they would ever do with Bruce Dickinson. I listen to those things to death, and I've never quite recovered. Like they're just not fresh. So when a favorite band of mine puts out a new album, I pick and choose my spots when I want to listen to it. Um, um, this, uh, then you get the Machine, which kind of sounds a little bit like like a glam like a glam metal band that's grown up. And then Return to Saint Cecilia, you get a lot of like really strange like additive meter stuff in that. So they're playing around with that uh, at the end. Uh, Stand and Fight is kind of a metal song, as the title might lead you to believe, and it's it's. It, it's it's super unspectacular, but serves nicely in this band, and it's it's a shouting Eric Bloom that sounds that sounds pretty good. Um, then you get Florida Man. So at the point, the first time I heard this album, and I'm listening to like my favorite band of all time and their first album in like almost two decades. I was getting a little sad at this point because I was like, oh, this this is going to be it, and I heard some stuff that doesn't quite sound like uh, BOC and, and and stuff that I didn't like that much. And then I heard Florida Man 
which to me is the third with, with, with Stone of Love and Harvest Moon in terms of absolutely superb songs. I think it's actually the best of the three. I think it's huh. totally gorgeous. The Florida man, Florida man. It's just absolutely beautiful. The guitar is great. Not to interject, but that opening riff is a re, uh, rearranged riff from Don't Fear the Reaper. <laughs> it's a bit, yeah. I mean, it, it, abso it absolutely is that. And you get the way the piano comes in. It's a, it's, it's called back, but like that, like that core is like I, like this is the one I heard and got chills and tears in my eye. And I was just so glad that I was getting something from this band that has been on the road forever. You know, like now we're in their fiftieth anniversary. That that they could come up with something this magical at this point in their career. And that's like if the re if the rest of the album was trash. Yeah. Uh, like this, in the, this album costs five hundred dollars, and all you got was Florida Man. Here you go, Blue Oyster Cult. I love this song, um, <laughs> and it's, it's like it's, it's my favorite. It's my favorite song that they that they've done since Take Me Away. I think it's absolutely a gem. Uh, Alchemist. We're going. Here's a heavy metal song. We're getting a whole. We're getting sinister riffs. We're getting a completely heavy like metal opening. Um, enjoyable. Uh, then uh, Secret Road is is a nice, pretty, pretty buck tune. Um, uh, uh, There's a crime is is fine. I think I think the drummer co-wrote that one. A lot of good drumming on that actually. So he gave himself uh, some room. And then this album, um, uh, I feel unlike unlike the last two, ends with an with, ends with one of its best cuts, which is Fight. And this this also I brought up Rush earlier. This sound like this is a little bit um, what is it? Spirit of the radio. It's a little bit spirit of the radio, um, and the drum fill into the solo is, is probably my favorite uh, moment from from Jules. And it's just a gorgeous little gem. Like that's the second best song on the album. It's the closer. It's a Buck song. So, like the best stuff on this album is is the, is the Buck stuff uh, with the alchemist with alchemist really. Uh, as as the other as the as the best of the, uh, the blue material, but but I enjoy it. Like and and I, I think like for me, it, there's some adjusting, and and I'll probably continue to adjust. But getting used to like this dude who has like a clean, ultra crisp, alpha Glenn Hughes kind of voice as one of the bless you, Marty, as one, as one of the singers for Blue Oyster Cult because it's an adjustment, like. That guy John Rogers, you sounded like like Neil Young or, or, or James Young with like better pitch, but someone is hitting him over the head with a stick. Like that guy was so quirky. I think he fit in. And Richie Castellano, like probably could like he could probably just go in a room and play a song and play every single part and every musician's part and sing every like this is just a phenomenal like studio hand turned live musician. Or, and actually he's both. Uh and uh, like I, I, I want to adjust to him in the band. His stuff is straighter. And obviously, uh, when Albert was in the band, you're getting the other the stuff that's not Bloom and Buck is weirder. So you're getting someone who's adding more more straightforward stuff as opposed to more weird quirk. So that would be Richie Castellano. If you're watching this, get weirder. You're super talented. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's that's where we, that's where we land, and it, it's nice. Like it's nice for like I, I don't know, you know. Like I, I hope they will make more albums, but if this is their last, certainly they redeem themselves in the eyes of tons and tons and tons of their fans and critics. Like regularly, people are going back to the '80s to saying the last time they made an album this good. It's really it's really well received, and 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 for that alone, like I'm I'm just so happy that it's there for them because this band has enriched my life so much. That they get to have that experience as they're what getting like got to be in their seventies, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's like I'm happy that they, they landed there, and uh, a, a step up in terms of album covers than you know from from the last two as well. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, that that is that is the symbol remains. Alan, oh you didn't? Did you rank it, Craig? I missed it. Uh, eleven. Okay. Yeah, Craig had it eleven. I've got it eight. And it's another one. It could easily move Close up two number. slots. It could easily move down two slots with time. Um, yeah, I kind of gravitated towards most of the same tracks that Craig just mentioned. This album, start to finish, feels much more consistent than the previous two albums. Um, not not as many, you know, sort of detours along the way. So, so yeah, this you know that was me with yeah, as Craig mentioned, the heavier riff, 
Uh, nice way to open it. Tainted Blood is a song I did uh, like quite a bit. I think it's one of the stronger ones on there. It clicked with me maybe a little faster than it did with Craig. Yeah. What else have we got here? Edge of the World is kind of an interesting one. It's got this kind of you know, very smooth delivery, but it's, you know, again, it's another one when you start paying attention to the lyrics, you know, it's got a little darker vibe and theme to it. It's one that kind of, you know, is playing around with, you know, all the conspiracy theory stuff that, you know, way too many people go down that rabbit hole, which is referenced in the lyrics there a little bit. Um, Craig tactfully did not mention Train True, which is just a mess of a yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I had a, I had a hard time. <laughs> I had a hard time with with that one. I don't under like it. Just seems like a novelty B side. It just shouldn't be on here. It, it really does. That's a that's that's the nice way to put it. Uh, that, that I, I was going to say that you know, got you know drunk and you know fell into the back of the hee haw trailer and woke up in the middle of Nebraska and wrote a song or something. But uh, yeah, yeah, that 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 song makes no sense and has no business being on this album. Uh, but yeah, after that, you still have Florida Man is pretty good. Um, I think I actually like The Alchemist a bit better, though, if I want to pick like one standout from the album. The Alchemist would be the one for me. It feels like if it's a very good song, if there's a knock up against it, it feels like the one song where they sat down and felt, let's really try hard to do something like astronomy or like you know, one of those old classic songs. Let's try to capture that vibe on yep. a track. And they kind of poured the effort into that one in particular. So it's good. But it feels like, yeah, they tried very hard maybe to make it good. Uh, Secret Road, yep, pretty buck tune. Like those always quite a bit. And I would agree that, yes, it also closes on one of its best songs, Fight. Just has a different you know structure to it, but it yeah. works quite well. It's kind of, a, kind of a quiet song to add on. You know, it's got a little sadness to it, but uh, a little brightness to it at the same time. So it, it works well as the album closer, one of the better ones on it. Consistent album. Uh, yeah, it's definitely stronger than the two that came before it. Time will tell where it kind of settles in the rankings. It'll be interesting, too. I'm glad, like you said, Craig, glad to see that, you know, it got you know a positive reception overall. I wonder how much the it, coming out as a pandemic album was shut down helped bolster that. You know, we saw because there was a big boom in interest in music at that time because it was something that everybody could do from home. And all yep. of a sudden there was a lot more people rediscovering their album collections, rediscovering yep. vinyl, digging into bands and things that they had lost track of long ago. We all probably all of us here did very much the same thing. And it's not a knock against the album whatsoever. I just wonder, you know, the bands of that perfect age for, folks in our age bracket to have the nostalgia vibes going pretty heavy for them. And then you put on top of that, we're all stuck at home with nowhere you know, to go anyway. And the album comes out. It feels like, you know, the stage was, there were some factors, you know, uh, setting the stage that would make it, as long as you did a pretty good album, it almost would have to get a good reception because everybody's hungry for something good to listen to for the first time. In years, everyone's not distracted running around like a you know chicken with its head cut off, not paying attention to such things. So something, so just a, a comment on that, and I, I don't have an sure. answer. It's, I guess it's, I, you know, it's kind of it's an open ended question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a lot of those bands, you know, a lot of classic bands like that have done albums in the past couple of years, and they all seem to be well, not all, but many, many of them seem to get a very warm reception. And I just I do wonder how much of it is. The music is good, but how much of it is people are just in the right frame of mind to Receive. welcome those bands back <laughs> into their lives. Right. Right. And, and some of it is these bands that like, like, so bands that I've seen live that I enjoy, like Journey or the, or, or the, the Doobie Brothers, uh, BOC, uh, some of these bands are like that, if, that are like their thing is much more at this point in their career as a legacy band, occasionally putting out something new but playing live and then they're trapped at home. And so I think that they're like, you know, like I, I think that there's more effort going, going in there. And like, and I'm, I'm not going to recommend, recommend the most recent Yngwie Malmsteen nor much of anything past the first two Yngwie Malmsteen albums. But that one Odyssey is, is also good. Uh, but like, 
that was a more focused album than that dude had made, you know, like because he was at home thinking about this stuff. Yeah. And so I think, I think what you're saying is true that people are they're, they're primed to receive it and they are and they're receiving it in a more patient and grateful manner. And I think at the same time, some of these bands that tour relentlessly or their main um, source of income and way of connecting with the, with fans at this point in time is through live shows are having to refocus that energy and come up with and come up with an album. No, so that's I, a very good I, point. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think it's all of these things and you will never quite know, like that Doobie Brothers album that they put out, the Liberté that mm -hmm. they put out. And it's like, man, that is like, that is like significantly better than like, like probably any Doobie Brothers album I heard to, outside of like something in the seventies. You know, like they, yeah. they really, they really stepped, they really stepped it up. And um, so like, you know, I, I don't know the, I don't know, you know, what caused what, but, but certainly mm -hmm. they, they were, they were primed for it. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy to see them get it and, and get that kind of appreciation because yeah. uh, they are such a relentless touring live band, like really like 150 shows. Like sometimes I saw them one, one of the two of the 26 shows were two shows. I saw them play right in a row the same day at BB King's house of blues. I just, mm -hmm. I'm like, what's going to, you know, like I saw it again. I'm like, well, I know I'm going to get Godzilla burning for you. Don't fear the Reaper. City's on flame. And Buck's boogie. I'm, I know I'm going to get all those, but I don't know what else is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, so that like it's let's just like that's like Beatles kind of stuff. Like you're play, like you're playing like four hours in a night or whatever. Like that's that's a grind or, yeah. or, or three and a half or however long it wound up being. But um, but your your point is valid. I just also wanted to say like. I think like a plus of the pandemic is some of these people who are all about the live performance or whatever, like thinking about creating new music in the case of Blue Oyster Cult, I'm certainly happy that they did. Oh yeah, definitely. I guess one last factor that could also play into all of that, as you mentioned, they're in their seventies. A lot of these bands are everyone themselves included is very much aware that there's not going to be a lot more new material from these bands you're just going to start losing too many key members within the next five to 10 year time frame. where unless they're just going to carry on, you know, do the Leonard Skinner thing where, you know, you're on your, you know, 137th member and you're five generations removed from anybody who started the band more or less, unless they're just going to carry on that way. The, the main movers and shakers are, you know, advanced enough in age that they're not going to be able to keep doing it much anymore. And I wonder if for a lot of these bands that has also kind of uh, pushed them to be like, let's get at least one more really good set of songs out there. Yeah. If we've, if we've got anything left that we've, you know, like you've said, some of these BOC songs have knocked around for years. If we've got things in our pocket that we haven't put down on wax yet, it's time to record them. It's time to go ahead and get that in as part of your legacy if you're going to, because you're, the number of trips you're going to make to the studio is getting limited. Not trying to be morbid about it whatsoever, but sure. age is catching up with all these bands very quickly. Within the next 10 years, a lot of these bands that our generation grew up with are not going to be touring or recording and we're going to be seeing a lot more sad headlines about folks starting to pass away and these bands having to close up shop or continue with just, you know, completely different lineups and, you know, just go out and replay the hits when it's not quite, you know, the, the same guys anymore. Right. But uh, anyway, Marty, we haven't got your thoughts on this last one to wrap it up with. Um, I was quite surprised by this record. Actually, when I started this, I think this was the first album. I'm like, well, I'm going to start with their most recent and, very surprised. I mean, they kind of achieved what Kiss couldn't. You know, Kiss has been flogging Destroyer for decades now, live, and um, BOC has has kept it going. They 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 treat it like a real band instead of the big spectacle, putting all their money into the spectacle of live. They're putting out the music, putting their money where their mouth is, and I was really surprised by the warm and heavy production. I really like the upbeat nature of the record. Um, the symbol remains. Uh, that was me. Very metal beginning for the album. Yeah. Uh, Box in my head and tainted blood were the ballad tinged rock. A lot of heart and strong melodies in these songs. My least favorite song was train true. 
Yeah. Uh, Southern yeah. Rock with silly lyrics didn't sit well with me. Stand and Fight, Heavy Metal Returns. Uh, yep. Florida Man, I put rearranged main riff from Don't Fear the Reaper with even more of an atmospheric vibe. The Alchemist, I liked it. Heavy with atypical twists. Uh, there's a crime, upbeat rocker. And that's all I, I wrote down. But I, I listened to this album, I think, three times. I liked it. It's, yeah. a, it, it's really amazing a band that's been around this long could curate tunes that had piss and vinegar in them and you know, kind of focused on all the really good things that this band has offered over the decades. And um, if it's their last album, hey, man, why not go out on top? But if not, they get some more years and they continue, you know, good for them, too. Yep. And, um, we made it, folks. This is the first and last six-hour stream that you will ever see on this heavy metallurgy. Um, apologies to Mel and Dean and... Um, yeah, this ain't happening again. But we didn't <laughs> think we could reschedule. We couldn't reschedule the, this, and it wouldn't have made sense. So we just plowed through. I'll say this is the one I warned you of. <laughs> <laughs> he told me that he's like, oh, the, the metal theologian wants to come on. I like, I like, I like you add him to the mix. That's great. He's gonna have a lot to say. I'm gonna learn things. I'm curious to hear his opinion. But unless you and you and Alan have like. Duct tape over your mouth. This shit is going to go forever. <laughs> my my kid is of the age where I can sleep. He can get up and do his own thing. Dean is of the age. That is not true. That is not the case. So One, what, two, two quick epilogues, just obviously like related to the band. So there's this album, two things to mention. There's this Brain Surgeons NYC. This is the album that Albert Bouchard recorded with Ross the Boss uh, all over this thing. And there's good stuff. The consistency isn't there. Like 1864, Tomb of the Unknown Monster, as you might imagine by that. Like, there's good stuff on here. Um, I've, I've heard, I think, all the Brain Surgeons albums. This is where I would tell people to start. And again, Ross the Boss. We've got, like, my favorite band with the guitars from my, like, fifth favorite band. Um, uh, and then someone 30 years ago asked uh, asked what I thought about the Albert Bouchard Reimagine Us albums. I think I, uh, they're interesting to listen to. I think the second one is quite good and actually has a song called Bombs Over Berlin, which is Albert Bouchard making ME262 good for me for the first time. Because it, it lands on a melody, the, the bombs over Germany. Like he adds melodies and all of a sudden I like the song. So there's a version of, of, of uh, Quick Lime Girl, or as it's spelled on the back, Quick Time Girl. Um, the different different meaning, but but I think it's just an error that has a guest appearance by none other than Frankenstein. <laughs> he, he makes an appearance on that song, so Joey Serrano returns. His voice is pretty torch. Uh, it sounds good, but man, they got like you feel like he did that one performance, and he's like, uh, like, and it's like it's the it's the difference between Chris Cornell's first. Um, Soundgarden album and Audio Slave, and you could see it just all happened just like Frankenstein. Uh, but this album has a bunch of interesting reworkings of the Albert Bouchard solo stuff. This is my favorite of the Blue Coop albums, which are Albert Bouchard and Joe. Um, I like the second one more, but I would start uh, Reimaginos and uh, Brain Surgeons NYC are, are, are probably the places to start. Uh, though again, Dharma Flat Out is the uh, is, is the best of uh, like adjacent adjacent stuff. So that is uh, that is that, and you probably want to cut me off before I get another case of the Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you to Zoller and Aaron for joining us again. We'll be getting both of these gentlemen back again for future episodes as well. And Alan, you have anything to add in closing before we jump? Holy I crap. I don't think so, but uh, thanks to uh, Beer and Pizza Metal Guy. <laughs> First time he's managed to catch one in live. Yes, we've wrapped around uh, so that some folks were able to catch a little bit of the show early. And thanks to all the folks who have stayed up late and hung in there. Thanks to everybody who checked it out when they woke up. Uh, very cool. It's been a fun and interesting stream. Aaron, Craig, thank you all very much for working through a very long but very interesting catalog with us. Oh, it's been a lot of fun. I'm pretty burnt, though, i got to be honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got to take a little boy to a holiday parade in about five and a half hours, so that's oh, going to be a yeah, thing. Two more hours of Frankenstein's in me, so I'll take care of those off the air. <laughs> Your neighbors are calling the cops. Oh, anyway. Yeah, 
cops. Like someone is getting murdered, and I think the killer is named Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> Frank's okay, dying every- next door. He keeps yelling, Frank's dying, Frank's dying. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. And we will see you Wednesday. Fay Tooth, Remnants of the Vessel, will be the album club discussion. Take care. Good night or awesome. good morning. Thank you.